You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. Suspense! Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present transcribed Mr. Dick Powell in Slow Burn, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Filler up, sir? Please do, my personable peddler of petroleum. How about your battery? Why, lad, I've got an Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. An Autolite Stay Full battery? Say! Say no more, my good fellow, for when you've said Autolite Stay Full battery, you've said the ultimate. This demon deliverer of starting stamina has over three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. You sound like Harlow Wilcox. I sound like every motorist in modern memory who's been moved to murderous fury by one of the major causes of battery failure, namely a thirsty battery, but who has discovered the delight of the Autolite Stay Full battery, a battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Sure, but you still sound like Harlow Wilcox to me. Well, by a curious coincidence, that couldn't happen again in a thousand years. I am Harlow Wilcox. Well, why didn't you say so? Because right now I'm too busy saying you're always right. With Autolite. And now, with slow burn, and with the performance of Dick Powell, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense! I'm standing here staring at a clock on a dresser in a crummy hotel room. I've been watching the minute hand drag itself up the face of the clock, and I'm not going to pull my eyes away from that minute hand until it touches 12. Because at 12, the slow burn that started in my insides way back three months ago, the slow burn that built till my whole body was on fire, is going to be soothed. Yeah, in another few seconds, it's going to be 12 midnight, and I'll be able to breathe again. Then they can come get me. I won't care. There it is. I can make that call now. Let me speak to Todd Sloan. Sports Department, Todd Sloan speaking. This is Johnny Wilson. Johnny! Don't what? interrupt. This call is a sense to be traced. I got a lot to say. The cops have a tight circle around this town, and I know I got no exit. But before they get me, I want to clear a few things up. Now listen to me. I did it. I'm not denying it. I'm telling you why I did it, and you're going to print it because you're a right guy. Oh, Johnny, I... Shut up. I don't have much time. It all started the day I fought in Duvel, Pennsylvania. Daniel, my wife, didn't want to fight, but to me it was the fastest way to make a buck. I was just beginning then, right after the war, and the coal town was the best I could do. I was fighting Tony Tadro, a good boxer and a puncher. In the second round, we just squared off, and the crowd pulled his feet, roaring the guy's name. Not mine, not Tony. Me, it didn't throw, but Tony, it did. He dropped his guard just long enough. Tony was flat on his back, out cold. I let the referee raise my mitt. Then I walked to Lefty Wilkins, my manager. <laughs> nice work, Johnny. Oh, uh, thanks, thanks, Lefty. What was you shouting about? Ain't you heard? The hometown kid who won that Medal of Honor blew into town today. Not only that, he blew into the arena just before you tagged Tony. Well, how to glad hand the kid myself then. He made it easy for me. Ah, uh, you don't have time. We're to meet Courtney Barr at the club tree and on in 30 minutes. Okay, okay. And uh, just this once, let your tongue lay flat inside your face. I'll do the talking. Okay, I said, okay. I had not got him the second round. Johnny Wilson, victorious over Tony. You saw Johnny fight tonight, Mr. Barr. He's good. It takes more than good these days. We know that, Mr. Barr. That's why I ask you when. 
All we need for them is the right build-up and the connection. Now, look, when I engine a Shaw or a nightclub or a fighter, I want a reasonable chance to get my money back. Lester, you never brought a fighter up to the top yet. But this time it's different. Johnny Wilson is the next camp. Oh, don't beg him, Lefty. If he's too blind to recognize a good thing when it shoves in front of him, let him get a seeing-eye dog. Oh, I'd take a chance on Johnny if he had an exploitation angle. The way it is now, there's too many good boys bouncing around. Don't need the build-up. We'll have to go into him. No. I'm returning to New York tonight. Goodbye, gentlemen. Yeah, he's got nothing. Nothing but money. Someday I'm going to walk into a bank and look at the stuff. You know, they keep the trap behind little cages. Uh-oh, there's that kid again. The metal boy. Name's Chuck Masters. They say he got 30 Japs. 30 Japs? Ah, oh, I'd like to meet the hero. Well, it looks like maybe you will. He's coming right at it. Yeah, pardon me, but aren't you Johnny Wilson? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I got to the stadium just in time for the knockout. I'd like to congratulate you. Oh, thanks, thanks. 30 Japs, huh? You've been pretty busy. Me, I was in the medical corps, Walter Reed Hospital. Have a drink, Chuck? Oh, no, thanks. I can't stop. My family's waiting. I, uh... I really have a favor to ask, Mr. Wilson. I'm chairman of the Juvenile Delinquency Committee. Oh, let me offer my congratulations. Oh, thanks. Now, if you'll offer just one more thing, your services in an exhibition bout. You mean a benefit? Yeah. Uh, look, Sonny, you're a nice, clean-cut American boy, and I like your style, but the only benefits I fight are for the Johnny Wilson fight. Uh, now, now, wait a minute, Johnny, wait a minute. After all, we don't want to see no kids go wrong, do we? Hmm? Uh, who are you figuring on Johnny fighting? Well, nobody yet. I just got the idea. Do, uh, do you box, Chuck? Me? Well, I did a little boxing in the 39th Infantry, strictly amateur. Then it's a natural. You box, Johnny. Oh, now, wait a minute. I couldn't. Sure, box. sure you could. And you look like a welker, too. If you get into the ring with Johnny, it's a deal. A uh, good idea, good publicity. You don't understand. You I... can't ask a guy to fight unless you're willing yourself. Well, especially for nothing. You do, we do. You don't, we don't. Well, okay, it's a deal. Thursday night at the stadium. Yeah, yeah. All right, Lefty, what's the setup? In the ring, says he, I want you to make him look good. I want the kid to think he's a wonder boy. I want to sign him. And then? <laughs> then I take him to Barr as my new fighter. Medal of honor and all. Oh, Barr, I like that. Endorsed by Congress. Keep talking. We've got some of the exploitation angle he's talking about. And with the dough we make on Chucky Boy, we'll finance you to the title. Get a load of the crowd. Any more people come in, or they have to ration the oxygen. That's what Bar means by exploitation. That Medal of Honor drags them in. There it is. Remember, Johnny, don't win. You don't have to lose, but don't win. It was a fair enough fight. Like Lefty wanted, I didn't lose it, I didn't win it. The kid was a cinch to sign, and Lefty wired Barr to find out if he was interested. He was, and now we were in New York in the Copa Club, signing the contract. There's one thing, Lefty. Now that Chuck is signed, where does Johnny here fit in? Oh, Johnny's going to stop boxing for a while. He's going to groom Chuck. Me? I wasn't having any conversation just then. I was watching Chuck watch a long-haired, slinky dame come towards our table. She had on a gown that had no straps and didn't need any. There was sweet rhythm in her walk, and she wore a hands-off look that beat blood into a guy's head. She stopped at our table, and Chuck's mouth flopped open. I said, well, gentlemen, this is my wife. Hello. Daniel, this is Chuck Masters. Sit down, baby. So you're the new fighter? Yeah. I hate fighters. Oh, you're frightened, the boy. And I hate the parasites who live off. Oh, have a drink, baby. Why do you take that, Johnny? Shut up. Hey, new fighter. Why don't you duck out before they knock that gentle look out of your eyes? I don't want to fight, Mrs. Wilson, but I need money. Johnny looked like you when he first started. And after only 4,000 push-ups a day, look at me now. Childhood sweetheart. Sweetness and light. Now he's not happy unless I wear gowns like this. There's nothing wrong with that dress. Hey, uh, hey baby, have you heard? I'm going to stay out of the ring for a bit. I'm going to teach Chuck here a thing or two. Who can tell? With me behind him, he may get to be our next champ. You've given it up, Johnny. What happened? He's just taking a rest, Daniel. That make you sore? Not me. It just sounds like Johnny's using his head. <laughs> and that sounds so strange, it makes me suspicious. Ah, oh, great little kidder, ain't you, Chuck? Hey, Mr. Barr. Come on, baby, let's dance. <laughs> 
Now the publicity buildup started. Chuck was a hero. The story of the signing hit the papers coast to coast, border to border. The fighting Marines, they traced his medals to every beachhead. I even came in for some publicity as Chuck's best friend, the guy who was sidetracking his own career to train him. And on the day Chuck signed for his first fight, with Whitey Carnes in the Bronx Coliseum it was, who should come in to give him his medical but my old CO from the Med Corps, Doc Peterson. Hey, Corporal Johnny Wilson. Well, don't make me say, what are you doing here? Well, tell me. I'm a fighter, Captain. Well, well. That's a far cry from Walter Reed Hospital, huh, Johnny? Uh, how you doing? Uh, so far, the Army paid off better. No, uh, Doc, this is Chuck Masters. Oh, hiya, Chuck. Say, hey, oh. according to all the publicity I hear, you're going to be the next welder champ. Yeah. As far as money, we opened a training camp in the Berkshires. I taught Chuck to box, and he learned fast. His left wasn't too good, but his right was okay, and he was shifty. Three days before his fight with Carnes, Chuck and me were in the ring, sparring. Hold it, Johnny. There's Anya. Hold it, Anya. Hiya, chump. Well, well, baby, I don't expect... All right, all right, what are we waiting for? Oh, it's you, huh? Hello, Lefty. Training camps are no places for dames, you know that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You never watched me train before. What's the magnet? I got the day off, and I wanted to watch the process whereby they turn a guy like him into a guy like you. I looked at her lips while she was talking, and the thought that she might be hoping for somebody else's lips on hers, Chuck's maybe, tore at my inside. The gong sounded, and I went for him. Take it easy! Take it easy! Cut it out! Cut it out, Johnny! Cut it out! What's the matter with you? You nut! Why are you plugging like that? Well, I figured Chuck is about ready for anything. Come on, Chucky boy, put him up. Let's see if you can take it. Johnny, take it easy. Oh, he really cut loose then. I've been storing it for a long time. I belted him good. Uh, he went down and stayed there. Uh, when they carried him out, he opened his eyes. But he didn't look at me, he looked at Danya. And she looked back at him with tears in her eyes. I should have killed them both then. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Dick Powell in Slow Burn, tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, you can't thank it full now, Mr. Wilcox. Let's see, six-tenths of a gallon, that'll be 14 cents. Ah, now there's a car for economy. Like that Autolite stay full battery, it really gives you a long run for your money. Well, did you know that in tests conducted according to SAE life cycle standards, Autolite stay full batteries gave 70% longer average life than batteries without stay full features? Sure did. Oh. Well, did you know that Autolite stay full batteries have fiberglass retaining mats at every positive plate to hold the power producing material in place? Oh, I sure did, Mr. Wilcox. Oh. Well, did you know that this powerful pusher offer of pulsating pistons has more than three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without stay full features? Sure. That's why it needs water only three times a year in normal car use. That does it. Give me that gas pump. From now on, you can sell Autolite stay-full batteries, and I'll sell gas. Oh, but Mr. Wilcox, don't you see? I couldn't give you a wrong answer. Why not? Because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood town stage our star, Dick Powell, in Slow Burn, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Still on the phone, Todd? Yeah. No, hold it a second. I want to gander out the window. The cops in large numbers, Todd. But they won't find me for a while, and I only need a little more time to finish. Well, Chuck won his first fight, naturally. He was getting the slow, careful build-up. He won a second fight over in Jersey. So then Lefty began to book him. He said Courtney Barr wanted Chuck to go out and make a tour, get a list of knockouts so he'd have a record. So I sat on my mitt. The day Chuck got back from his tour, he called, and Daniel invited him to dinner. How was the tour, Chuck? Oh, fine. I had a couple of fights that were terrific. In Denver, I fought Willie Myers. What a boxer. But I found his weakness. 
See, when he was getting to throw his right, he always flipped his elbow just a bit. From then on, he was my meat. You're beginning to enjoy fighting, Chuck. Oh, well, why shouldn't he enjoy it? There's money in it. Sure. 50% of the purse and a bonus. Don't forget the bonus. Scrambled brains, cauliflower ears, and a nose smattered all over your face. A good fighter keeps his nose straight. Johnny was just like Chuck when he first started. Fighting kills a man's better instinct. I'll get the dessert. Yeah, I'll help you. So I got no instincts. I'm just a bum, huh? Cut the pie, Johnny. Well, give me the knife. I'm not worth anything, huh? I stay with you because I'm trying to salvage what I think is still there. And that crack that I used to be like Chucky is Johnny, now. Johnny, we can still save it. I want it to be the way it was. You but... stay away from him. What's the use? Come in and finish your dinner. You heard me. Stay away from Chuck or I'll finish him. Every sports rider was wondering who was going to fight Mike Gruen. Nobody got a crack at the champ unless he fought Gruen first. I knew who it was going to be. Me. And with the money left, he got out of Chuck's fight. That was a deal we'd made. But, well, I was getting itchy about it. All this time, I wasn't getting any particular buildup. We were on the lake cruising around, relaxing after two weeks of hard training. Bar and Chuck were watching a kid horsing around doing handstands in a canoe. I took Lefty to the other end of the launch. Yeah? Now, look, Lefty. I know, Johnny, I know. Now, don't worry about the Gruen bout. Maybe it would be smarter, Lefty, if you gave up my contract on the surface. Then you could hold off Chuck while my new manager signed me for the match. I... I can't, Johnny. Oh, why not? Now, now, don't get mad. But I had to give Barr 50% of your contract or he wouldn't back Chuck originally. But I got it fixed. Well, you so dumb. Get back there. Get back there. I spun around and saw a canoe floating bottoms up. Chuck was ripping off his clothes, but I got out of mine fast, too. Me and Chuck hit the water together. You see him, Johnny? Huh? No. I saw the kid, but I wasn't telling Chuck. He'd come up about 20 yards away, and he went down in the same spot. Hey, this Johnny? was going to be publicity hey, for me. I dove for the kid, grabbed his hair, and pulled him up. When the boat came up alongside, Lefty hauled him in. Hey, hey, on, when they pulled me into the boat, I saw Lefty point to the landing. Oh, look at that car of reporters that just drove up. Chuck. You and Johnny get all of those wet clothes. I'll take care of the reporters. Reporters? Well, send them along, boys. Photographers, bring them on. That evening, I was sparring with Chuck, sharpening his footwork, when Dania came up with a New York paper. Don't you two ever get out of that ring? Oh, and by the way, congratulations. Huh? Oh, you hear all about the hero stuff on the lake? Yeah, congratulations. But she wasn't looking at me. She was looking at Chuck. I hopped out of the ring, grabbed the newspapers out of her hand. The story was there, all right, in big block headlines. Chuck Masters saves boy from drowning. Medal of Honor winner does it again. Me? I wasn't even in the comic section. Oh, this is all wrong, Daniel. Johnny saved that kid. Yeah, Johnny saved that kid. Now Johnny's going to save himself. Where's that lefty Wilkins? Oh, that's a dirty trick, Johnny. Chuck, you're trying to tell me you knew nothing of this. Your picture and life history on the front page. I swear. Now I... your eyes open, Johnny. Look what they've done to Chuck. How they made him lie just for the sake of publicity. I didn't lie. And, and what publicity? Your fight with Mike Gruen on the sports page. The whole double cross opened up like a filthy sunflower. I was the patsy, the fall guy, the jerk, the dummy. I was going to be the next champ. Yeah, the next champ under the dunce cap. I wanted to pound someone, something, anything. My eyes focused on Daniel. I'm glad this has happened. Maybe, Johnny, now you'll give up. We'll have a chance to live decent, normal lives. I'm glad this has happened. I spark plugged this whole thing so I could get that growing bot. I fixed it. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Shut up! You hit me. You miserable scum. Come back here. Let her alone. Oh, I've been waiting for this, Chucky boy. Uh, Johnny, uh, take it easy. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, Chuck, Johnny. 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 Take it, boy. Chuck, what's uh, going on here? Uh, Come on. Take it easy. All right, now. Uh, throw Wilson off the ground. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, throw the bum out. Throw him out. Get out of here. They threw me out all right, and while they were doing it, I was thinking I was going to kill Lefty Wilson. That was definite. And I remember that all Daniel worried about was Chuck. Chuck's character. Chuck's gentle look. Yeah. I was going to kill Lefty. And for Chucky boy, I was going to think up something special. 
very special. Day after day, I'd wake up with a new idea, but none good enough. Then one night, I walked into a bar and saw someone. Someone who was going to give me the answer. It was my old CO, Doc Peterson. Corporal Johnny Wilson. Come on over. Bring your drink with you. Well, oh, thanks, Captain. Still medicking for the boxing commission? Yeah, 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 yeah. Still fighting? Yeah, off and on, off and on. <laughs> Glad to see you, Johnny. Hey, you're the second guy I've seen from our old outfit recently. Yeah? You remember that lieutenant in the chemical corps who nearly lost his eyes? I saw him. <laughs> I met his new wife. A real mess. <laughs> I guess we didn't do such a good job on his eyes. Eyes? What do you mean, Captain? You remember the fool got by a chloride of mercury in him. Severe corneal lacerations. Uh-huh. Lucky thing we caught him when we did it, he'd have gone permanently blind. <laughs> oh, it's a terrible thing when a man loses his eyesight. Yep. <laughs> Suppose it was a man in your profession, huh, Johnny? Huh? Yeah, yeah. A uh, good thing a guy can tell when that stuff gets in his eyes. And a guy can always tell. Burns like mad. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess it would. Well, I gotta be on my way, Johnny. A uh, captain. How long would that stuff have to be in a guy's eyes to blind him permanently? Oh, 26 hours about, if he's in top condition. The captain left, and me, I walked the streets all night, most of the next morning until the 42nd Street Library opened. I went through five medical books before I found what I wanted. Eye anesthesia. Pontiki. Causes loss of sensation in the eye without affecting the eyesight. I went up to the training camp. The Gruen bout was in three days. I had to get back in favor, and I piled it on good. I played it with hearts and flowers. Everything. Poor Johnny Boy. Well, I'm, I'm sincerely sorry. That's, that's the way it is, Chuck. I, I'm sorry for the hassle I caused. I, I'd sure like to be with you the night of the fight. Well, okay, Johnny. It'd be funny fighting a local match without you in my corner. Sounds fishy to me. You ain't the kind to forgive. Well, it ain't fishy, Lefty. Since Dan, you left, things have been lousy with me. I, I'm out of dough. I gotta eat. I, I need the job. He gets the job, Lefty. He rates it. He taught me everything I know. I want him in my corner. When we walked down the aisle in the garden for the ring, I had three things in my bag. A long, sharp knife for Lefty Wilkins and the pontacane and bichloride of mercury for Chucky Boy. At the end of the first round, Chuck was way out in front and Lefty was beaming all over. Nice going, Chuck. Uh, hey, the cinch. Then I reached for the Vaseline that every fighter has smeared over his eyebrows to keep his eyes from getting cut. And I had the Vaseline loaded with Pontecane. I smeared it all around those eyes of his. Now all I had to do was wait until the Pontecane took effect. The next three rounds were a nightmare. Chuck seemed as good as ever, and Gruen was weakening fast. Suppose he got knocked out before I got the bichloride and Chuck's eyes. Well, everything's still okay, Chuck? Uh, hey, sure must be pooped, Johnny. He hit me in the eye three times that round. I didn't even feel it. Yeah, that's all. Uh, oh, come on, Johnny. Swap my face. A little old cold water, boy. That round, I'll kill him. He leaned back. I picked up a stopping sponge from the outer bucket, the one with the bichloride, and I swabbed his face and kept swabbing it while the liquid ran over his forehead and down in his eyes. That is it. Good. He didn't even wince as the poison drained under his lids, into his eyes, and over his eyeballs. He started the eighth round strong and cocky. He pushed Gruen all over that ring. And then all of a sudden it happened. He stopped and put his gloves to his eyes, trying to rub away the creeping blindness. Gruen played the cage. He thought it was a trick. But as Chuck desperately hunted for him, Gruen caught wise and he piled into Chuck. Gruen tore his head off. He hit Chuck with everything but the ring post. Chuck kept going down and coming up for more. Oh, it was beautiful. I picked up my bag and left the corner. On the way out, I stopped for a moment where Lefty Wilkins bent forward, agonizing in his seat as he watched the championship go out the window. He didn't even move when I shoved a knife into his back. The crowd was screaming for the kill as I walked out. Thank you.
Still there, Todd? Yeah. The law's going to be in in a second. The reason I couldn't call you in time for your bulldog additions, I had to be sure the 26 hours is up. Otherwise, you could have warned Chuck and his eyesight could have been saved. I want him to stay blind. All right, grab him. Oh, take it easy. Take it easy. You can have me. I got what I wanted. Oh, you admit you killed Lefty Wilkins. Sure, and it was a pleasure. And Chuck the champ, how does he like it? Got any jobs for fighters who can't see? Why don't you ask him? What? Hello, Johnny. Chuck. Well, I... What are you... Yes, Johnny, he can see. He's not blind. But you can't see. I don't believe it. You can't. Your old CO was at the ringside, Johnny. Doc Peterson. He knew what it was the minute it happened. He fixed up my eyes. You can't see. You can't see. You can't see. You're the one who's blind, Johnny. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Dick Powell. Thanks, Mr. Wilcox. Come back again. I'll do that, son. I'll be back not only for gasoline, but any time I need ignition engineer at Autolite spark plugs or any one of the more than 400 other products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars and trucks. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye seal beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, Loretta Young will be our star. The play is called Lady Killer, and it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's transcribed Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Slow Burn is an original play for radio by Fred Freiberger. Dick Powell may currently be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike, and may be heard each week in his own radio show, Richard Diamond, Private Detective. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as James Mason, Ronald Reagan, and Ginger Rogers. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Loretta Young. Buy Autolite Safe Batteries, Autolite Resistor, or Regular Spark Plugs, Autolite Electrical Parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Would you intentionally weaken your country? No. So don't do it unintentionally. Don't listen to or spread rumors against any race or religion. Speak up against prejudice for unity and understanding. Strengthen America at home and abroad. Accept or reject people on their individual worth. Let's make Brotherhood Week last throughout the year. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. 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 Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Miss Loretta Young in Lady Killer, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Say, Wilcox, did I ever tell you about the time I plugged a buffalo? No, Reming Chester Shotgun, but have I told you about the sensational Wide Gap Autolite Resistor Spark Plugs? You mean there's something special about Autolite Resistor Spark Plugs? Why, Wide Gap Autolite Resistor Spark Plugs are the newest addition to the complete line of regular, transport, aviation, marine, resistor, and model spark plugs. 
Ignition engineered by Autolite. You're sure plugging tonight, Wilcox. Oh, built right into every wide gap Autolite resistor spark plug is an exclusive 10,000 ohm Autolite resistor that makes practical a wider initial gap setting with advantages that have long been recognized by automotive engineers. For example, you get smoother performance on leaner gas mixtures, greater gas savings, quicker starts in cold temperatures, even double life as compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow and replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Lady Killer and the performance of Loretta Young, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Flight 175 to Morningside and Capital City, now loading at gate 3. Will passengers please board the plane? Is this the right plane for Capital City, Stewardess? Yes, sir. Name, please? Benton. Grant Benton. Take any seat, Mr. Benton. I have a horror of getting in the wrong plane someday and winding up in Tibet. Things like that happen to me. <laughs> well, it's not very likely this time. Your name is on the passenger list. So it is. That won't keep you from worrying, though. Name, please? Uh, Nordlinger. Miss Nordlinger. You can leave your coat with me if you like, Miss Nordlinger. I guess that would be better. Here you are. Take any seat, Miss Nordlinger. Thank you, Stewardess. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Is this seat taken? As a matter of fact, Miss Nordlinger, I was saving it for you. You know me? We've never met, but we travel in the same circle. Don't I look at all familiar? No. But how do you do? <laughs> Sit down, fasten your safety belt, have a pillow. Stick of gum, fetch a blanket. Well, I'll settle for the gum. Here you are. Thank you. If you chew gum when you're up in the air, it relieves pressure on the ears. Oh. Mm-hmm. Why it relieves pressure in the ears, I haven't the vaguest notion. <laughs> do, you, do you always babble on like this? Pretty near always, though uh, sometimes... Miss Nordlinger. Oh, yes? Yes, Th- Stewardess. This telegram just arrived for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be taking off in a few minutes, so if you want to send an answer... Oh, no. I'm sure an answer won't be necessary, Stewardess. I'll tell the boy not to wait. Uh, thank you. Aren't you going to open the telegram, Miss Nordlinger? I promise not to peek, or at most only a little bit. I can't open it. You see, I... I'm not Miss Nordlinger. I'm sort of on the dull-witted side. Well, the flight was booked solid, but I came out to the airport hoping there'd be a cancellation. And and just before the passengers started to get on board, a woman came up to me and offered me to, offered to sell me a ticket. How'd she know you wanted one? Well, she overheard me talking to the clerk at the reservation desk. So? Well, it, it would have taken extra time to have the ticket validated in my own name, so I decided to use hers. This uh, telegram complicates things. What's your real name, this people woman? <laughs> Lincoln. Peg Lincoln. Miss Peg Lincoln. And I didn't deceive you. I deceived the stewardess. You just happened to have your ears flapping when I told her my name was Nordlinger. Now then, Miss Lincoln, would you mind telling me why you let me go on with all that bilge about traveling in the same circle? Well, you were trying to pick me up, and I thought I'd better help out a little. That's what I like about the modern woman. So shy and retiring, is like Matahari. <laughs> well, after all, it's a two-hour trip to Capital City. Dear, I wish I knew what to do about this telegram. Didn't the Nordlinger woman give you an address? No, she didn't. I gave her mine, but she was in such a hurry uh, to get away. Too late to do anything anyway. We're taking off. Oh, that's, that's funny. I, I feel dizzy all at once. Nonsense. We're still on the ground. Oh. Just your imagination. Miss Lincoln. Oh, it's... There's something in here. I... I'm awfully sick. Stewardess! Stewardess, don't let the plane oh. take off. There's someone sick here. Feels like poison. Sick? Oh, brother, was I sick. When I came to in the hospital after a nightmare in which stomach pumps seemed to be reoccurring, I was told that I could thank my handsome seatmate for the fact that I was still alive. He stopped the flight, carried me off the plane, and raced me into the hospital. Furthermore, he had engaged a private nurse and had telephoned every hour until assured that the danger was over. I bounced back fast. Next morning found me weak as a kitten, but sufficiently recovered to leave the hospital. The bubbling Mr. Benton was waiting to drive me home. So we bid a reluctant farewell to Rosemont Hospital, to its unsmiling nurses with their picturesque thermometers, to the pungent, unforgettable aroma of chloroform that lingers in its halls. Miss Lincoln... Miss Lincoln. Oh, yes? Are you sure you didn't die? I'm sorry. My mind was on something else. Miss Lincoln, 
Or may I call you Peg? Uh, let's keep it at Miss Lincoln for a while, Mr. Benton. I wish we read the same book. Meaning? The books I read, a fellow saves a girl's life, she falls all over him. Yes? The ones you read, it's let's keep it at Miss Lincoln for a while. Maybe I should explain. I am an insurance investigator. And insurance investigators get to be pretty good at spotting phonies. I think you're a phony. Well, aren't you sweet? Not very. You know what I'd do if you were drowning right now? I'd throw rocks at you. I don't doubt it. A cryptic remark. I love cryptic remarks. Did Dr. Shifflin happen to mention what I nearly died of? He said it had some of the symptoms of food poisoning. Suppose I told you I never eat for 12 hours before traveling. I'd say you must have had something. Contaminated water, maybe. Or maybe a stick of poison chewing gum to relieve the pressure on my ears. If you're getting at what I think you're getting I at... I am. Do you know I canceled an important business trip just to make sure you were okay? Why, you'd be at the embalmers right now if I hadn't... Sure, run... sure I would. You did some expert diagnosing, all right. A little too expert for a man who hadn't had any medical training. Don't look now, but you're losing your mind. Now, look, why would I want to poison a girl I'd never seen before, never had anything to do with? That's what Dr. Schiffen asked. You mean you ran off of the mouth to him? I pointed out that the poison may have been meant for the woman whose ticket I bought too late to make any poison tests, but to be on the safe side, Dr. Schiffen decided to check on you. He called Chief of Police Longman. Oh, that must have been good. Ray Longman and I used to trade tricycles. Oh, the Chief rates you high, all right. Above suspicion was the phrase he used. But you're still not sold. I was for a while, but just after I got into your car, I found this unopened telegram in my pocket. Isn't that the one that was delivered to you aboard the plane? The one addressed to that Nordlinger woman? Yes. Well, what about it? Well, it wasn't in my pocket when I left the hospital ten minutes ago. You just didn't notice, that's all. Want to look at a copy of the hospital receipt I signed for the personal articles returned to me? You'll find everything else on it. No telegram, no. An oversight. Oh, hospitals don't make oversight. Would you mind running through the whole plot for me? I'm a little hazy as to my motives. All right. You poisoned me, thinking I was the Nordlinger woman. Fortunately for me, you discovered the mistake in time to correct it. Well, for a murderer, I certainly am careful. However, you wanted to look at the telegram, so you stole it. Probably as you carried me out of the plane. You read it, and then you resealed the envelope, and then met me at the hospital, hoping to slip it back into my pocket before I missed it. You've got the telegram right there. Open it up. Maybe we can put an end to this fairy tale. Thank you, no. I'd rather wait until I find the Nordlinger woman. Still alive. Well, then I'll open it for you. Here, give that back to me, please. Ah. Got... Have a nice trip, love. It's signed Aunt Ellen. <laughs> well, that's in my gang's secret code. That means boatload of stolen jewels ready to sail at dawn for what cheer, Iowa. Thoughtful of you to rip the envelope so I couldn't check the resealing. How can you be suspicious of somebody so charming? Oh. Chief of Police knows what's on my mind. If anything happens to me, it'll take more than that charm of yours to keep the badge boys off your neck. But I do have charm. That we're agreed on. Oh, yes. But you're wasting it on me. Next one is my apartment building. Oh, look out! Look out for that girl! Oh, the get out! Of the Oh. What happened? Who? It's me, Jack, the elevator oh. operator. Oh, gee, you had me scared. Oh, Jack, how did I... I get... carried you into the apartment lobby. Oh? I guess you're still weak from the hospital because you fainted after the accident. Oh. Where's Mr. Benton? The man, the man who was driving the car. Where is Police he? Police headquarters. They want you to report in, too, whenever you're feeling better. And the girl was killed? Yeah. She was awful. Oh. Dead? Yes, Miss Lincoln. It was... It was so awful. A friend of yours, too, huh? No. No, I'd, I'd well, never... Gee, she was just leaving here when the car hit her. She was asking for you. Well, who was she? Well, I wrote her name down. It's in my pocket somewhere. Yeah, here it is. Patricia Smythe. I don't know any Patricia Smythe. Well, she said it was important to get in touch with you. Oh. Jack... Jack, did it strike you that Mr. Benton, the, the, the driver, could have avoided that accident by yanking the wheel the other way, perhaps? Well, I was reading the com uh, the financial page when it happened. I didn't see nothing. Oh. But anything you want me to swear to, though, Miss Lincoln, oh, I... No, no, never mind, Jack. 
Call me a cab, will you? Oh, Miss Lincoln, you're sick. You ought to be in now, bed. Now, look here. Something tells me if I, I'll stay a lot healthier if I get to the telegraph office right away. I'm sorry. Now, what was that message again, Miss? Uh, it was addressed to Kate Nordlinger at the municipal airport. And the message? Have a nice trip. Love, Aunt Ellen. Uh-huh. Well, not sent from this office. Uh, might I see the telegram? Certainly. Here it is. Why, this thing is fake, miss. Are you sure? It's a regulation form, all right, and the message is pasted on in strips, but, well, look look how different the type is from one of ours. Yes, yes, I see. Well, was any telegram sent to Kate Nordlinger at the airport? You're Miss Nordlinger? Uh, yes, I am. Well, I can look it up in a minute. Thank you. That'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Just a minute here. I think I can find it right away. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Here's one. Let's see. It reads, um, on your return, we'll contact you at Hotel Ludwig. It's signed Patricia Smythe. Patricia Smythe. S-M-Y-T-H-E. Oh, uh, what was the name of that hotel? The Ludwig. Hotel Ludwig. Right there, right across the street. Oh, oh, oh yes. Well, thank you very much. You've been very helpful. You're quite welcome. You, miss? Uh, yes, if you would. Ring Miss Kate Nordlinger's room and tell her that Miss Lincoln would like to see her for a moment. It's important. Uh, whose room did you say? Miss Nordlinger's. Oh, I'm sorry, but uh, we have no Miss Nordlinger registered at the Ludwig. Well, I was sure she was staying here. A friend of yours, miss? Why do you ask that? Well, it seemed a natural sort of question. Well, not to me, it didn't. Why do you want to know she's a friend of mine? No reason. No reason at all. I'm just making conversation. Well, make a little more conversation, will you? Did you ever have a Kate Nordlinger registered here? Well, yes, but she's not with us any longer. When did she leave? Last night. Well, why didn't you tell me that before? I didn't think it important. Yes, you did, or you'd have mentioned it. Where'd she go? I don't know. I really... Why are you so scared? I'm not scared. It's the manager's orders. We're not supposed to talk to reporters. Oh, now what makes you think I'm a reporter? Well, who else would ask questions the way you do? An insurance investigator. Oh. Here are my credentials. Now, what's this all about? Well, you'll have to promise to keep it confidential, of Miss. Thanks to the cooperation of the police, there's been nothing about it in the papers, and we'd like to keep it that way. Uh, such things are bad publicity for the hotel. What do you mean, such things? Well, suicides. Oh. Last night, Kate Nordlinger threw herself out the window on the 14th floor. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Loretta Young in Lady Killer. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. About that buffalo, Wilcox, I bagged him with a set of wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Reming Chester, that's a spark plug story, all right. But motorists everywhere can tell you stories about the money-saving advantages of wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. The newest addition to the complete line of spark plugs, ignition engineered by Autolite. You should have seen the difference, Difference, Wilcox. difference. Why, there's an exclusive 10,000-ohm Autolite resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug that permits a wider initial gap setting. With advantages like smoother performance, greater gas savings, quicker starts in cold weather... Even double life as compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. I always say... So, friends, ask your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer to replace worn-out spark plugs with a set of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Loretta Young, as Peg Lincoln, with Larry Dobkin as Grant Fenton in Lady Killer. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Come in. Hello, Miss Lincoln. Taking over Kate Nordlinger's room as well as her name? How about a stick of chewing gum? No, thanks, Mr. Benton. I thought you were at police headquarters. The police didn't keep me long. It was obviously an accident, so... Obviously? Look here, Miss Lincoln. 
My car hit a girl and killed her. It was her own fault, but that doesn't make me feel any better about it. I could do without the cracks. Oh. What are you doing here? I just happened to be leaving my room as you walked into this one. Oh, that was convenient. I thought I recognized you, and you, so... Uh, you live at this hotel? Certainly, when I'm in oh, town. I see. Or did you think I just dropped by to push Kate Nordlinger out the window? So you know about that? The chief of police is a friend of mine, remember? Oh, yes, that's right. Me living on the same floor as the woman who committed suicide, he thought maybe I could help with some background information. But you couldn't, of course. No, I couldn't. Uh-huh. Believe it or not, I never once laid eyes on the woman. Oh. And it wasn't until I saw you walk in here that I connected her name with the name on the telegram. Well, I had better be going now. You think I'm lying, don't you? No, no, not necessarily. I... Please don't come one step closer, Mr. Benton. Miss Lincoln. One step closer and I start screaming. Take it easy. I'm not coming any closer. I won't try to kid you. I'm scared of you. Really scared. I'm going out of that door now. And don't you move. This is absurd. So much as lift a finger and I'll yell my head off. I'm scared, I tell you. And I kept running until I was out of sight of the hotel. At police headquarters, I, I suppose I looked just like any other psychopath with the persecution complex. But I was stubborn about it. Finally, I got in to see the chief of police himself. Ray Longman, his name was. Surprisingly young for his job, middle 30s, I should say. Good-looking, patient, and reasonable. But when I told him of my experiences with the charming Mr. Benton, he laughed out loud. Why, Grant Benton was his best friend. The whole thing was impossible. In the first place, there was no connection between the deaths of the two women. Patricia Smythe, the girl in the automobile accident, had been a clerk at the police department. The chief had known her well. Kate Nordlinger had held a private detective's license for five years prior to her suicide as he kept calling it. So far as anyone knew, the two women had never even seen each other. It wasn't until then that I mentioned the fake telegram. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what I'll do, Miss Lincoln. I'll check with the telegraph company, and if anything develops, I'll get in touch with you later. Get in touch with me later? I know, I know. You're taking all this very seriously. Well, what am I supposed to do? Sit around like a duck in a shooting gallery until you decide You tell to... me you're an insurance investigator. That's you right. know court procedure. Would you under oath swear that Grant Benton deliberately drove into Patricia Smythe and killed her? Well, under I... Under oath. Well, no, I, I, I couldn't, but... Well, I know he did it deliberately. But I couldn't swear to it. it if, if that makes any sense, it I... It does. In order to swear to it, you'd have to know exactly what went on in his mind at that moment. Well, that's all very well and good, I but don't you see you that... there's nothing to link Grant Benton with the Nordlinger woman's suicide. And that brings us to the so-called attempts on your life. Would you care to press charges? Well, I... I, I can't prove anything. Hmm. So, where does that leave us? It leaves you thinking that your best friend is the victim of a few embarrassing coincidences. And it leaves me thinking that... <laughs> that the chief of police is just a big, dumb, flat foot being taken in by a path? <laughs> Which is exactly what I did think. But I felt pretty sick when I left his office. I went back to my apartment and locked the door and uh, moved a dresser behind it, but well, even that didn't give me any feeling of security. I couldn't find anything else to do but pace the living room floor, so I, I paced and I paced and I paced. And... Finally, late in the afternoon... Hello? Miss Lincoln? Yes? This is the chief of police, Ray Longman. Oh, yes, yes. I checked with the telegraph company. Your yes. story's on the level. I already knew that. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, there are a couple of other developments I'd like to tell you about. Could you come out to my home tonight after dinner? Why, yes, I guess so. Grant Benton will be there. Oh. Well, now look here. Please. I... It's important. <laughs> I wrote down the street directions, and there were a lot of them, because the chief's home was in the secluded hill section on the outskirts of town. When I arrived there, my insides were doing push-ups. But I was calm enough on the inside, I hoped. Ah, Miss Link. Oh, good evening, Chief. I was half expecting you to be late. Most people have trouble finding my house. Oh, well, I, I started early. Uh, don't you sit down? Thank you. Well, take the easy chair. Oh, thank you. Grant should be arriving any moment. 
I, uh... I want you to understand that... Well, I'm not out to trick him into a confession or anything. It's, uh... Well, I'm hoping that the three of us can talk things out. The situation's become uncomfortable all around. Well, with Benton being your best friend, I can see where this is rather awkward for you. But... Awkward? <laughs> you know what happened this afternoon? No, what? Grant walked in on me just as I was testing this typewriter to see if the print checked with the print on the fake telegraph. Oh? I felt like Benedict Arnold. I'm sorry. Did the print check? No. <laughs> now I know what they mean by one-track mind. Well, there are other typewriters. The... Well, that must be Grant now. Well, you can take my word for it, Miss Lincoln. There's no need to be frightened. All right. Good girl. Ah, come in, Grant. Thank you, Ray. Well, what a handsome couple you two make. Our forthright young chief of police. And the lovely lady who was only recently voted Miss Unbridled Imagination of 1950. All right, that's enough, Grant. Sit over there and behave yourself. Oh, uh, now then, Miss Lincoln, to business. What can I do for you? Chief Longland thinks you can convince me you're innocent. I have reservations. On what plane? <laughs> Where would you like me to begin? Let's start with a fake telegram. Explain that away. You're starting with a butte. The one thing I can't explain, I haven't the faintest idea of why it was done or who did it. But you didn't. No. Won't you even try to believe me? Uh, yes, yes, I'll try. I'll even concede it was an accident when your car killed Patricia Smythe. Are you willing to believe that that blonde Miss, uh, whatever her name was, committed suicide? Kate Nordling? Mm-hmm. How did you know she was a blonde? I read it in the paper with my big blue eyes. The whole thing was kept out of the newspapers, and you told me that you'd never laid eyes on well, it. Well, pardon me for interrupting, Miss Lincoln, but I questioned Grant right after the suicide at the time I probably mentioned that the Nordinger woman was blonde. You did, Chief. I distinctly remember. Don't let him talk you into it, Chief. For heaven's sake, open your eyes. He's it. The explanation fits. What explanation? Well, can't you see? Patricia Smythe worked as a clerk in your office and happened on some information that incriminated our friend here. There was no sense her telling you about it. You were too fond of Benton to believe it anyhow. So she went to Kate Nordlinger, a private detective. And they worked together on the case. Benton found out what was going on. When he learned that Miss Nordlinger was taking a plane to Capital City in order to talk to the state's attorney, he decided to act. He'd seen Patricia Smythe around police headquarters plenty of times. But the Nordlinger woman he only knew by name. Which is how he came to give me the poison by mistake, don't you see? I apologize, Grant. I thought Miss Lincoln understood this was to be a friendly meeting. The girls will be girls. But listen, Chief. That's all I ask. Just listen. Very well. Go ahead. Well, through the telegram, Benton learned that Kate Nordlinger was staying at the Hotel Ludwig. That night while I was at the hospital, he killed her. He pushed her out of that window. And later, he, he recognized Patricia Smythe coming out of my apartment building. She'd come to warn me of what I was getting mixed up in. And he murdered her. He ran her down with his automobile. Now, really, Miss Lincoln, your logic... Never but... mind, Ray, she's right. I've made a couple of slips and the entire Supreme Court couldn't shake her loose now. Very well, Miss Lincoln, if it makes you any happier, I killed both women. You have the dubious honor of having proved your point. You'll still be trying for laughs when they strap you in, won't you? They're not strapping me. If you get a glance at our forthright chief of police, you'll notice a rather large gun in his hand. You'll further notice that it's pointed not at me, but at you. Sorry, Miss Lincoln... We did our best to talk you out of this. Now you've given me no Let choice. Let me tell you what our forthright chief of police means. He means that he and I run the gambling activities of this town. And people who interfere are apt to get hurt. Very hurt. Dead, you might say. I, I don't think the chief is going to shoot. <laughs> there are two schools of thought on that. I, I think I should mention that the, the bushes outside are thick with men from the state's attorney's office. What? Easy, chief, easy. When you telephone to invite me here, Chief. You told me that you had checked with a telegraph company about that fake telegram, but later I talked to them again and it turned out that you hadn't checked, which meant that you'd known about it all along. It was then that I decided to long distance the state's attorney. You better leave the comedy to me, Miss Lincoln. That's not even a good stall. The men outside are under orders to demand entry at the slightest disturbance. Fire that gun, Chief, and they'll be here like a swarm of gnats. And if I don't fire... You'll take your chances in court. After all, it was Benton who actually killed those two women. If you have any qualms about this, Chief, just hand the gun over to me. Wait a minute, Grant. Stay right where you are for the moment, both of you. 
What are you going to do with that ashtray? Leave it through the window. There's your slight disturbance, Miss Lincoln. They'll be here. We'll wait. That bluff went over like a lead balloon. Now, if you let me have the gun, Chief... Don't give it to him, Chief, please! Don't give it to him! Why, Miss Lincoln, Wait a minute. Right, right. Quiet, Grant. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Loretta Young, and featuring Larry Dobkin. Reming Chester, I've weighed your story about the buffalo. Thank you, Wilcox, but I could have told you his weight nearly two tons, to be exact. Ah, you can never be sure of Reming Chester, but you can always be sure of any Autolite product. For Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Mr. James Mason. This will be a broadcast you won't want to miss. For next Thursday, Mr. Mason will appear in The Pit and the Pendulum by Edgar Allan Poe, one of the all-time masterpieces of Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Lady Killer is an original play for radio by William Bruckner. Congratulations to Loretta Young, who has again been nominated for an Academy Award. Ms. Young may currently be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Key to the City. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Ronald Reagan, Alan Ladd, and Ginger Rogers. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring James Mason. You can buy Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite safe batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. James Mason in Banquo's Chair, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Harlow Wilcox, you happy huckster. Welcome me home. Why, Hap, you old... What's the greatest spark plug engineering miracle in years, Harlow? Well, the wide gap Autolite resistor spark plug, of course. Why? Because this newest addition to the complete line of regular, transport, aviation, resistor, marine, and model spark plugs, ignition engineered by Autolite, offers special money-saving advantages, like double life under equal conditions compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. Right, Wilcox. Why, these sensational wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs give greater gas savings, smoother performance, faster starts in cold weather, and it's all due to the 10,000-ohm exclusive Autolite resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug, which makes practical a wider initial gap setting. Now tell them, Hollow. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with a set of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. 
And now, with Banquo's chair and the performance of James Mason, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I will begin by reading to you a recent newspaper cutting about myself. It has a bearing upon the story I'm about to tell you. Please listen. The recent retirement of Sir William Brent from the English criminal investigation has given great joy to all the lawbreakers in our land. For more than two decades, Sir William has terrorized the underworld. The ex-head of the English uh, criminal investigation has been the scourge of thieves and murderers. In but one single solitary instance has he been known to confess defeat or to express dissatisfaction with the outcome of his prosecution. This was the now-famous Bedford murder case. That news item was written by Arthur Grange, a reporter who had been covering crime trials for years and whom I knew very well indeed. I had not, of course, given up the Bedford case. That, too, is now over. But that the case should be resolved as it was, no one on earth could have foreseen. I'd already made my arrangements with May Wakefield and, of course, with Bedford. Arthur Granger's call came on Wednesday. I just received your wire. I hope you're coming. Well, I am scheduled to go up to Woodsbury on Friday and dine with my sister. Uh, How important is this dinner? I don't think you will ever forget it as long as you live. Isn't Turret House the place where Bedford murdered his aunt? You have a good memory. What's it all about? Will you be here, Arthur? You you make it sound so mysterious. It will be. Shall I bring my revolver? Yes, I think you should, Arthur. Good night. But so will you... All day Friday, and by evening, a gusty November wind began to drive the rain hard against the exposed wall of Turret House. This mansion is a huge red brick, ugly product of Queen Victoria's time. It did not stand gracefully, but squatted at the back of a private road, almost hidden from view by several dripping pine trees. The neighborhood was in decline, its best days were over. Perhaps mine were too, I thought as I came down the stairs. But uh, after tonight, it won't matter. Oh, good evening, Mr. Green. Hello, Lane. Nasty night, isn't it, sir? It's miserable. There's not much warmer in here. There's a fire in the library. Oh, how are you, Sir William? Quite well, Arthur. What made you move into this drafty old dungeon? I don't live here. It's my temporary quarters. I still live over there in the West End. And here is Miss Stone. Miss Roberta Stone, this is Mr. Arthur Grange. Pleased to meet you. How do you do? Roberta is the famous mystery story writer. Oh, oh yes, I've read your books and enjoyed them. Well, thank you, Mr. Grange. Perhaps you can tell me, Miss Stone, what mysterious event is going to take place here this evening. I was told to come armed. He told me the same thing. Here's my gun. I've never fired this monstrous ugly thing in all my life. You're pointing it at me, Roberta. It's not at all polite. I'm sorry, Sir William. This house, Roberta, was the scene of a particularly unpleasant crime, as Mr. Grange can tell you. Oh, yes. In this very house, John Bedford murdered his aunt, Miss Martha Ferguson. Oh, how nice. Mr. Bedford couldn't have picked a more ideal place. Sir William, you must tell us what you're up to. We'll have a drink first, and then I'll tell you both all about it. Lane, will you serve the drinks? Oh, yes, Mm. Sir William. Good. Now I can tell you that tonight I am going to close the Bedford case. Mr. Green? Oh, thank you, Lane. You're going to close the Bedford case tonight? I'll give you the facts in an orderly fashion. I never arrested John Bedford for the murder of his aunt, Miss Ferguson, for two reasons. First, he had an absolute and perfect alibi. Arresting him would only be a waste of time and money. And secondly, according to English law, a man discharged can never be arrested again on the same murder charge. Well, what's going to happen tonight? In a short while... John Bedford will be here to dine with us. And, uh, oh, yes, his victim, Miss Ferguson. Well, you you mean Miss Ferguson wasn't actually murdered? Miss Ferguson is most thoroughly dead and has been dead for years. You, you're you going to have the body of old Miss Ferguson here while we... Please don't anticipate me. As you both know, I've never lost a case except the Bedford murder. I'm an egotist. 
I've resigned from the criminal investigation for the sole reason of trapping John Bedford. Well, I must say you have a great amount of patience, Sir William. Yes, I am infinitely patient. For three years I've been planning for this night. This is a moment of considerable triumph for me. I wanted to have some witnesses. A writer who will record this event and an admirer who will appreciate the skill with which I will bring a notorious murderer to his proper end. I have an uncanny feeling that this is going to be gruesome. Come. You'd be ashamed to run away, wouldn't you? Well, I'll stay, of well, course. So will I, as long as I have my weapon. Splendid. But before I tell you about my diabolical scheme, let me first acquaint Roberta with the details of the murder. I think I can recreate the circumstances for you quite accurately. Very well, then. Exactly three years ago tonight, old Miss Hilda? Hilda, where are you? Oh, where is that foolish maid never around? Yes, Ferguson. Why don't you answer when I call? I was in the kitchen, ma'am. It's after ten o'clock. You should be on your way home. I was just about to leave. Has my nephew called? No, ma'am. Mr. Bedford hasn't called since yesterday. I told him he couldn't come here anymore, just like you told me. I don't ever want to see him again. He's no good, an evil man who will come to an evil end. You're never to let him in here, Hilda. He won't ever come in this house. Not if I can help it. Now you'd better run along and make sure all the doors are bolted before you leave. Yes, ma'am. Good night, Miss Ferguson. Good night, Hilda. A oh, pity about my nephew, John. Such a pity about him. He's such... Who's there? Who is it? It's John, Aunt Martha. Your own affectionate nephew. What are you doing in my house? Oh, you're not at all pleased to see me. Your only living relative, too. I'd like you to leave at once or I'll call the police. Well, I'd rather not, Auntie. I want to have a talk with you. You don't want to talk to me. All you want is my money. You're putting the whole subject on a very vulgar level. You've had all the money you will ever get out of me. You won't get tuppence after I die. And it may interest you to know that I'm changing my will tomorrow. So I hear, Auntie. You're wearing gloves that... Yes, Auntie. Keep away from me. Oh, no, you're an old woman, Auntie. All that money is no good for you. You can't ever use it. But to me, money is life. And you're going to die soon anyway. No, no, you're not going to do that. Oh, yes, Auntie, I am, and I'd be doing you a favor. You're old and ill and lonely. Help! Please, no screaming, Auntie. No. And don't you worry, Auntie. We'll have a fine funeral for you. That's pretty much the way old Miss Ferguson was murdered. Her maid, Hilda, found the body the next morning. I immediately went to work on the case. All the evidence pointed to John Bedford. He almost admitted it himself. I had him brought to my office for questioning. What do you do, sir, William? Oh, hello. Please come in. Oh, thank you. Cigarette? Oh, thank you. Well, how does it feel to kill your aunt? May I have a light, please? Yes, of course. I wouldn't know, sir, William. You see, I never killed anyone. Have you? Yes, I've shot and killed lawbreakers who tried to get away. And I've sent many of them to the gallows. Yes, so I understand. What was your relationship to your aunt? I was her nephew. Very amusing. She didn't like you, did she? I'm a truthful man. She didn't. She thought I was a spendthrift and a parasite. She was quite right. Where were you on the night of the murder? 
in jail. I drunk a little too much and got into a bit of a tiff with the police. Mm-hmm. Quite an alibi. Oh, quite a fact. Now, it was hardly possible for me to be in jail and kill my aunt at the same time. Unless, of course, my aunt came into my cell and allowed me to murder her, after which she walked back to Turret House as a ghost, dragging her body <laughs> behind her. <laughs> That's hardly possible. Well, don't you think you ought to check my story? I already have. You're a skillful fellow. Well, why don't you arrest me then, sir? No, William? no, Mr. Bedford. I have time and patience. Oh, you'd better work fast. By the time you get round to me, I'll have spent all of my aunt's beautiful money. It's not her money I'm after. It's your life. Your beautiful life, Mr. Bedford. Good day. Yes. And tonight I shall have him. Tonight, in your presence, he will commit that murder again. And this time I shall arrest him for it. Autolite is bringing you James Mason in Banquo's Chair. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, Harlow, while I was on vacation, I used nothing but those miraculous new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs in my car. <laughs> and what a performance. That's the wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plug for you. They're the newest addition to the complete line of regular transport aviation resistor marine and model spark plugs. Ignition engineered by Autolite. Hello, let me tell you how those wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs worked like a charm. Why, of course they did, Hap, just as any Autolite spark plug. But with Autolite resistor spark plugs, you do get special advantages, such as smoother performance on leaner gas mixtures, greater gas savings, even double life under equal conditions as compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. And it's all due to the 10,000-ohm exclusive Autolite resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug. So, friends, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow and have worn-out spark plugs replaced with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, James Mason, in Banquo's Chair, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. That's how matters stood. I refused to let my man arrest him. But how in the world could he have murdered his aunt while he was in jail? Well, he might have bribed the prison guard to let him out for an hour. You're right, Roberta. I believe that's exactly what he did. Unfortunately, the guard in question died of pneumonia soon afterwards and left us no further source of evidence. Well, as far as I can see, Sir William, you haven't a leg to stand on. You can't touch Bedford. Every man, particularly a criminal, has an Achilles heel. I sat down at my desk and trotted him out on paper. I decided I didn't know enough about him, his personal habits, his real character. So a month ago, I went to prison. So, William, what a surprise. Want to invite me in? Oh, of course, sir. Please come in. Thank you, Mr. Bedford. Well, I'm really honored to have the great man pay me a visit. <laughs> You're not after any more clues, I hope. It does get rather tedious. So <laughs> oh, no. No, not at all. I know when I'm beaten. Well, uh, I did want to appear smug, sir, but everyone has his Waterloo. Oh, would you have a drink, sir? Will you? Thank you. I don't know whether you've heard that I have resigned from the criminal investigation. I'm a private citizen now. Oh, yes, I heard something about that. I couldn't believe it. No, oh, it wasn't my love for justice that made me pursue my profession with such tenacity and uh, success. With the sole exception of the obvious, of course. <laughs> it was a game of skill with me, my wits against all comers. I lost in your case. But then we all have to lose sometimes, don't we? I don't believe you, Sir William. You're still out to get me. There isn't much chance, is there? I'm afraid not, Sir William. I've kept out of trouble so far, knock on wood. No idea you were superstitious, Mr. Bedford. A sophisticated like you? Oh, I think you 
watched the habit since I was a child. I see. Uh, before I go, there's just one thing. I noticed in the paper that you're looking for a tenant for Terry's house. Oh, yes, I am. I'd like to rent it. The, <laughs> the scene of the crime? Uh-huh. <laughs> of course, why not? There's no harm in it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's perfect. And what's more, I'll let you have it very cheaply. For old time's sake. <laughs> <laughs> saw Bedford frequently. Our acquaintance developed into friendship. An armed friendship, of course. He knew I was out to get him. And I wanted him to know that. But he was so pleased, so vain that he bested me that it, it, it gave him delight to see me. And that's how I got to know him pretty well. Fundamentally, he's superstitious and afraid. He's uncomfortable in the dark. He's an insomniac. He finds himself utterly unable to read horror novels. His sneering self-assurance is a mask for a nature that's subject to deathly fears. Well, tonight is the anniversary of the murder, and tonight Mr. Bedford dines with us at 8 o'clock. I asked you two to be here early so that we could have a talk. Well, it's nearly 8 now. Now, this is the plan. You both know May Wakefield? The Shakespearean May Wakefield? Oh, yes. Of course. Yes, yes. Wonderful. The greatest Lady Macbeth I ever that's saw. That's right. Now, during dinner, she will enter the room in the precise likeness of Miss Ferguson, the murdered woman. We, of course, will pretend not to see her. We'll remain outwardly unconscious of her. Only Bedford will be aware of her presence. Hamlet, the play is the thing. Exactly. Now, during dinner, the electric light will be switched off at the main, and candles will be lit. We must have the correct atmosphere. You understand now, you are not to see Miss Wakefield. She doesn't exist for us. Is that clear? I'll look right through her. That will be Bedford. Ah, my dear Mr. Bedford. Good of you to come in this weather. But I never miss a meeting with you, Sir William. <laughs> oh, Lane, will you take Mr. Bedford's things? Yes, Sir William. Uh, Miserable weather. Oh, indeed. This way to the dining room. Thank you. <laughs> I almost forgot my way around in this ugly old place. Perhaps you have unpleasant memories associated with Turret House. Oh, perhaps I have. <laughs> John Bedford looked us over with his characteristic arrogance and superiority. I made the proper introductions, and then we all sat down to dinner. Is it uh, still... Is it still nasty outside, Mr. Oh, it's Edward? getting worse. Looks as if we're in for a few days of this weather. Not too bad. I'm thinking of doing some riding tomorrow. Uh, the soup. Uh, it's... Uh, it, it's excellent. Oh, yes, Sir William. Your cook is to be congratulated. The soup is a masterpiece. Poor Alice. She's been my cook for over 20 years, but she's given me notice. Absolutely refuses to stay here any longer. Why? She says this house is haunted. Roberta, this might make an interesting story for you. You should speak to her. She can give you a detailed description of the ghost. Alice swears that she's seen the figure of an elderly woman with finger marks on her throat, walking about the house. Hmm? Oh, no, come now, Sir William. This is just too good. Such, such an obvious attempt to frighten me. Sir William is convinced that I murdered my aunt. <laughs> no, please, Sir William, a little more subtlety. Surely I deserve it. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps the cook did see the figure. It might interest you to know, Mr. Bedford, that I don't believe in ghosts. Ah. And I'm sure my cook never saw this elderly figure, except in her frightened imagination. Well, I am afraid, sir, that your little attempt did not work. But I must admire your graceful acknowledgement of its failure. <laughs> I suppose I should give up plaguing you, shouldn't I? Mr. Oh, no, no, Sir William, never give up. I may have a weak spot somewhere, you never can tell. If at first you don't succeed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> do you... Uh, do you live far from here, Mr. Bedford? Oh. Thank you, Miss Stone. There's really no need to change the subject. I hope you find this game as amusing as I do. I, um, 
I saw a very exciting play last night. The Haymarket. Excuse me a moment. It's really fearfully hot in here. Uh, do you mind, Sir William, if we get a little fresh air? I'm sorry. It is stuffy in here. Elaine, open one of the windows, please. Uh, yes. Yes, it's just awful weather. Simply awful. Yeah. Yes, I don't know how we will ever get home. Yes, I can't stand this weather myself. I think I'll go to the Riviera next week. I'm always... So... Oh. 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 Lane, what on earth's wrong with the lights? I don't know, sir. Well, don't stand around. Fetch some candles. We can't sit here in the darkness. And get the chauffeur. He knows something about electric lights. I'll call the chauffeur right away. I'm sir. terribly sorry about this. We've had trouble with the wiring before. We'll have it fixed up in a few minutes. Now, let's get on with our dinner. Have some more wine, Mr. Bedford. I've had enough, thank you. It was a tense moment. I looked at Roberta and Arthur. They were both pale and uneasy, and so was Bedford for all his poise. I believe that the only calm person in the room was myself. Oh, Mr. Bedford, you were saying something about visiting the Riviera. It must be lovely at this time of year. It is. I've been there before, you know. I... I... Oh. What's the matter, Mr. Bedford? Nothing. Nothing at all. I I wish we could have some more light. It's rather difficult to see. I'm really terribly sorry this had to happen just at dinner. Please have a little more wine, Mr. Bedford. No, no, no I, I don't drink much. And... The figure of a woman had entered the room. She'd come in silently like a ghost. It was done so softly, so skillfully, that her presence seemed completely unreal. It was a superb entrance. We all saw her, but we made no sign of recognition. In the dim candlelight, she looked ghastly. It was an incredible piece of makeup. Bedford looked at all of us to see if we'd seen the figure standing a few feet away from him. But we ate our dinner calmly. He looked again, shook his head, and then gulped the wine in front of him. Don't any of you see anything? See what, Mr. Bedford? You know perfectly well what... There she is, just as plain as... What's got into you, Bradford? It's my aunt. My aunt! Perhaps you've had too much wine. Your aunt is dead. You're not seeing ghosts, I hope. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, that's it. I drank too much. I'm not used to drinking. Yes, 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 of course. I... No, she... She's coming towards me. Calm yourself, Bradford. I've never seen you like this. There's no one else here. Do you see anyone, Roberta? No. No, I, I don't see anyone. No, uh, neither do, do I. I can't stand this. I'm getting out of here. You're not wearing gloves today, John. But she's real. God, did you see her? I can't, can't you hear her? Don't come over you. She, she starts... She started. Sit down, Bedford. She's gone to the door. She won't let me out. I'm an old woman. Money is no good for me. I'm lonely, John. Let me buy on, Martha. Out of my way. Out of my way. Get away from that door. I'll murder you again. Do you hear that, Martha? I'll kill you again, you old witch. Please let me go. All right. Switch on the lights. No. Don't Officer Graham, come out. Arrest him. You heard his confession? No. Sir, I did. Put the handcuffs on him. I've got him, sir. Well, Bedford, it seems that I've finally caught up. I'll I, I kill her again. I'll kill her again. I'll kill her again. That you wasn't know. your aunt. That was May Wakefield. The I'll kill her again. I'll kill her again. Take him away, Graham. He's in a state of shock. <sighs> Well, let's continue our dinner. I'm sorry for this interruption. I don't think I want to eat any more. Now, don't be squeamish, Roberta. We must celebrate my final case. It's been a long job, but it ended just as I knew it must. I'm most grateful to the both of you for your help. It was a little grim for me. That was the finest piece of acting I've ever seen. May Wakefield certainly knew her part. We must congratulate her. She almost convinced me. She must have removed her makeup by now. Oh, Lane. Oh, yes, sir. Tell Miss Wakefield to come down and join us. We have a fine dinner waiting for her. Excuse me, sir, but this telegram came a little while ago. I didn't want to disturb you during dinner. Let me have it. Why, Sir William, is anything wrong? I'll read it to you. Extremely sorry. Severe influenza makes it impossible for me to leave my bed tonight. 
will tomorrow night do? Signed, May Wakefield. Lord, help us. If it wasn't May Wakefield, who was it? I did not answer. I looked at the staring faces of Roberta and Arthur, and then I turned away. A vein in my temple began to throb. I put my hand to it, and it stopped. I... uh, I think I'll have some wine. Now, Lane. Yes, sir? Fetch a bottle of brandy and pour three stiff drinks. Better make it four. I think you need one, too. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, James Mason. Well, Hap, it's great to have you back. <laughs> Me and those 400 Autolite products. Yes, you and over 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, and bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Alan Land. The play is called Motive for Murder, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Rene Garagank and Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Banquo's chair was adapted for radio by Sigmund Miller from a short story by Rupert Croft Cook. James Mason can soon be seen in the Universal International picture, One Way Street. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Ronald Reagan and Ginger Rogers. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Alan Ladd. You can buy Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's 96,000 dealers present transcribed Mr. Alan Ladd in Motive for Murder, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Remingchester, you look like a badly battered battery. A sorry sight indeed for an Autolite stay full battery man like me. Will Cox, I've just returned from a safari. Been hunting camels in Kilkenny. Camels in Kilkenny? Why, by St. Patty, didn't you know that the last camel in Kilkenny calmly curled up and died when the first Autolite Stayful battery landed in Ireland? He knew he couldn't compare with that teetotaling dispenser of pep and power. The Autolite Stayful battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal camel, I mean car use. Such shenanigans, Wilcox. <laughs> Remingchester, Autolite Stayful batteries give 70% longer average life than batteries without Stayful features. And that's proven by tests conducted according to SAE life cycle standards. By the Blarney Stone. And furthermore, Autolite Stay Full batteries have three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. 
That's why they need water only three times a year in normal car use. Say no more, Wilcox. One thing more. You're always right with Autolite. And now, with motive for murder and the performance of Alan Ladd, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Iris, you'd ask me, how is a guy a cop? You make with magnifying glass and bloodhounds. You make with facts, I'd tell her. You start with something you know for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you make with facts. But when you're a cop and you've got all the facts, what do you do when they're going to arrest? Arrest your own wife for murder. Even the reporters were nice. They didn't try to steal a picture of Mary, though there were plenty of them around. But I knew what they were thinking about. The little guy with the mustache sitting in my chair wearing a knife between his ribs. And about Mary, my wife, lying over on the Davenport with a bourbon breath could use for a cutting torch. Jock Deuce was handling it. My pal for eight years. He was doing what he could for a brother officer and a friend. But I knew what would have to go into his report. You see, I've made out too many of them myself. All right, all right. Boys, wait out in the hall till the basket gets here. Go on, go on. Yeah, but, Lieutenant, I ain't finished dusting the place go yet, man. Get out of the hall, please. Yeah, all right, sure, sure. Um, smoke, Dave? No, thanks, Chuck. Well, she doesn't feel good. I'm going to ask you, Dave. Do you know who he is? Uh, no, I never saw him before in my life. His name's Hamilton. Victor Hamilton. How'd you find that out? Well, you sat there and watched me frisk him. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I guess I got some sawdust in my head. I've seen a lot of dead guys, but not in my own place. Well, I just thought you might have known him, Dave. That's all. Funny you don't know the guy. Go. Oh. Dave, I'm sorry about... I'm sorry it's your wife. Yeah, everybody's sorry. I can follow up the routine for an hour or two, maybe, but those guys from the DA. I office... know, I know. You're thinking of Second Avenue stuff. Spilled whiskey, broken glass, mere lipstick on dead man's cheek. She didn't kill him, Jock. Irish, oh. Irish. I feel funny. She's awake now. Oh. Hello, Angel. Oh, hi, Irish. You're home early. Give me a kiss. Hello, Mary. Jock. Irish. She's drunk. Or drugged. Uh, we'll find out later. All right, Jock. I'm sorry. It's all right. Uh, Look, Angel. I want to ask you something. Uh, Why was Hamilton here? Hamilton? We don't know anybody named Hamilton Irish. A little guy with a gray mustache. Uh, oh. Oh, you mean the salesman. I ordered a vacuum cleaner. He had to give me a demonstration. He cleaned the whole place. He was a funny old man. <laughs> I gave him a drink for doing all my work. <laughs> then what, honey? And then I... I felt this hurt in my head. And I, I saw you and Jack. I don't feel right, Irish. Baby. Uh, that set of knives in the kitchen. Um, Did you use a chef's knife for anything? No, no. You know those knives scare me. Yeah. Uh, that's all you can remember, Mary? That's uh, everything? Yes. What are you two doing, practicing cops on me? Well, look, honey, the landlady came over to borrow a book. She heard the radio, but you didn't answer the bell. She got worried and used the passkey. Irish, what is it? We got trouble. Somebody used that knife on Hamilton. Oh, Irish. Jack, what is this? Why, Mr. Hamilton's sitting right over there, right? Irish. Oh, no! Well, Dave, medic says that bruise on Mary's head is something she could have done on a chair arm or a door. Skin isn't broken, the swelling doesn't amount to much. So she was drunk and she fell down. Jock, you know she never took more than one drink. Let's hear the rest. Lab ran tests. Not finished yet. No sign of narcotic on her so far. Plenty of whiskey. Prints on the knife for hers. Well, why not? It was her knife in her kitchen. You're a cop, Dave. You can't beat the system. Everyone's leaned backward on this all down the line. Everything's been checked a dozen times. The system says she's guilty, Irish. You think she's guilty? What I think doesn't count. It's facts. Hamilton sold vacuum cleaners. He had business cards in his pocket, but there was no order book at your house and no vacuum cleaner. Well, you can see what that does to her story about that demonstration. 
You, uh, you better send a lawyer down to Harbor Precinct. Not yet. I want to dig myself. I know what you're thinking. She was slugged or drugged or both. And there was a third party. That's right. There was a third party. He slugged Mary and shoved that knife in Hamilton. Then he poured whiskey down Mary's throat and painted lipstick on Hamilton's cheek. There has to be a third party. Dave, I know you're trying, but you can't disregard what we found. Look, I've been a cop a long time, Jock. I know a woman will shoot a man or stab him or poison him and then stand there and scream what a louse he is. But a man did this job, and I'm going to find him. We gave the neighborhood and the house the works, and we came up empty, Irish. Then you didn't look hard enough. I'm going to go take a look. Wait a minute, Dave. I can't put you on this. The newspapers are crucified. Because she's my wife? Because I might want to destroy evidence? Something like that. All right, here's the badge. I wouldn't want to get the department any bad publicity. Oh, now, Dave, please. David X. Murphy. Detective. Second grade. It says I'm a part of the system. A cop. Give it to the commissioner with my regards. Oh, no, wait. Here. Take this back, Irish. As far as I'm concerned, you're hunting the gunsel that knocked off those service stations. <laughs> How could you ask questions without a badge, huh? Thanks, Chuck. Thanks a lot. If there is a third party, find him, Dave. Find him. There is. And I'll find him. <laughs> make with facts, I told you. The start was something you know for sure. I knew Mary hadn't killed Hamilton. For sure. Fact. Strangers seldom kill each other. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, the killer knows the victim. Fact. Hamilton had been stabbed at my house where he came to demonstrate a vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner wasn't in my house. Hamilton had been killed for that vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner? Is that a motive for a murder? Yeah? Police, I want to talk to you. Ah, oh, the police have been here. Well, they're here again. Victor Hamlin had an apartment here, and you're his landlady. I want to know about him. You do, huh? What do you want to know? The work's good and bad. Did he drink, gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? Start talking and I'll listen. How would I know so much about a tenant? I got my work to do. Yeah, no maid to keep me. Almost breaks my back sometimes. Yeah, yeah, come on, now tell me. Oh, he lived like a monk. Paid his bills and kept to himself. I never saw no friends with him. Go on. I can't tell you any more about him. What do you think I am? I... I, Harriet. Harriet, come here. What is it? This is a policeman. He's asked me about Hamilton. I thought you could help him, maybe, huh? Oh, Bob Victor. You know him, miss? Yes. Yes, I knew him. I'm Harriet Blodgett. I live in this building, too. Do I get to go back to my house for you? Uh, yeah, thanks. Go on. Uh, well, miss? I wish I could tell you something, but I can't. I just felt sorry for Victor. Uh, Mr. Hamilton. He was small and he had no car. He used to carry those cleaners all over the North End. Now and then I'd fix him something to eat and take it up to him. That all? Nothing like you, man. I guess he wasn't interested. It's no compliment to me. What do you do for a living? Hostess, Elgin Restaurant, of Columbus Circle. Ever meet any of his friends? He was a lonely little man. No friends, no enemy. You're wrong. He had one enemy. <laughs> next morning, I was on the third floor of the Morgan building listening to a man named Richards, the sales manager of the vacuum cleaner company. Not house to house. Indeed, no. I'd like to have that absolutely clear. Our people work from lists supplied by us. We give them names of prospects, and they close the sale. And make a fortune. Uh, well, not exactly. Uh, take Hamilton. A bad bat. Got pretty tired. Didn't have the old bounce, the old steam. A lot of sales got away. Bad bat? War wound, maybe. I don't know. He didn't talk much. You got his demonstrator here every morning, huh? We assign cleaners to each salesman. Whenever they make a sale, they bring a deposit in and get another new machine. Do they make reports? Absolutely. Every call. Give me what Hamilton turned in yesterday. Hey, why, uh, oh, yes, God. God. Here you are. Hamilton's last report. 4502 Van Buren. 4510 Van Buren. 4515 Van Buren. No house to house, huh? Who are you kidding? No friends, only one enemy. On Van Buren Street. That's where my killer had to be. 
Somewhere on a street that had its feet in the bay and its head in the clouds. From pawn shops to snob apartments, the 4,500 block was middle ground. Somewhere in that block, Hamilton had put his thumb on one doorbell too many. I started to the top of the list. Police. Oh, no. My Herman's a good boy. He took that bicycle back. He is a good boy. <laughs> yes, Mr. Hamilton was here demonstrating a vacuum cleaner. He cleaned all my rugs. I, I promise to keep him in mind. No, no, never let no strangers sell nothing inside of my place. No, never listen to what they got to say at all. Never. I went through 25 like that. 26 was bigger than the others. A half block of lawn, stained windows, and brick. Built by one of yesterday's fortunes when Van Buren Street was young. There'll be money in it somewhere. Somehow, I said to myself. This was money. He was tall, slender, and pretty. The mustache moved first. Please. My aunt's desperately ill. Police. Pol- but why? What do you want? We're checking. A little guy named of Hamilton came by here yesterday selling vacuum cleaners. He rang your doorbell with a lot of others. But he got himself killed. We uh, look into things like that. Oh. Whose house is this? Uh, my aunt, Cecilia Breckenridge. That chap was here. Hamilton was not an impertinent little fellow. He rang the bell several times, woke my aunt... I sent him away. He didn't get inside? Oh, no, not past the door. That's funny. These salesmen make reports. They list every house where they make a demonstration. Your house is on that list. Oh, it's a mistake. I sent him away. Mm-hmm. He didn't make any mistakes about his other demonstrations. He didn't lie. A mistake? I... But right, if you want it that way, I'll check the neighborhood. People see things. I'll find someone who saw him in here. All you. right, all right. He, he was here inside. And why the run around? Well, my aunt, she's... Well, she's very old. It's my duty to spare her any unnecessary excitement. That's, that's why I lied. And anyway, there's nothing she could tell you. He was here, he made his little speech, he went away. Mm Mm-hmm. But I've got a report to make out. I know, but couldn't you make an exception? An imposition calling on people, bothering them. But it's better than having a murderer walk the streets. My aunt is really quite ill. I can be very gentle. Oh, it's embarrassing. Do you know what a persecution complex is? I read about them. Well, that's her trouble. She's old, well, you know, old Senna. She thinks she's being kept a prisoner here. Oh? (laughs) She's right, of course. If she weren't confined here, she'd be confined to an institution. She doesn't understand why. She's outlived all her close friends, and she wonders why no one comes to see her. And that's why you let Hamilton and his vacuum cleaner in. Well, I thought it would help. Instead, he made it worse. I see. Are you, uh, Breckenbridge? My name is Dolph. Harold Dolph, her sister's son. I'm her only relative. I keep the place going. You know how old people are about family homes. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Let's go and see her. All right. This way. Cecilia Breckenbridge was sitting in a rocking chair beside a window that looked out over the backyard. She was thin and small. And she looked up at me out of blue, tormented eyes. Don't tell her that he was killed. It'll upset her. Aunt Cecilia. Aunt Cecilia. It's a beautiful day, Harold. A lovely day. Aunt Cecilia, this man is here to ask a few questions about that vacuum cleaner salesman you saw the other day. Oh. Oh. Now, be a good girl and answer him. It's... It's a lovely day, Harold. Mrs. Breckenbridge, I'd like to know what time he came in to see you. Hmm. Sometimes she'll talk, and sometimes she won't. Mrs. Breckenbridge, do you remember how long he stayed? The way her mind is, it's hard to tell what to expect. Do you remember what he did while he was here? Oh, oh, it's a lovely day, Harold. A lovely day. <laughs> you, Dave? Yeah, I'm in a drugstore at Van Buren and Hope. How's the coming out and give me a hand? What do you mean? I spotted that third party. He's tall and pretty and he's scared to death. (laughs) 
Autolite is bringing you Alan Ladd in Motive for Murder. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Reming Chester, were you in Limerick when you were hunting the Irish camel? Was I in Limerick? (laughs) I invented the Limerick. Ah, but not this Limerick, old pal. Listen, a good name in Erin is Slattery. So's Autolite's stay-full battery. Its watery needs a teaspoon feeds. Only three times a year is no flattery. Alas, poor Limerick. I knew him well. Well, you know that the Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Why? Because it has three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. Is it the leprechaun in you, Wilcox? Why, every leprechaun in Ireland knows that the Autolite Stay Full battery has a fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate. That keeps the power producing material in place, you see. In recent tests based on SAE life cycle standards, the Autolite Stay Full batteries gave 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay Full features. And remember, Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. Get an Autolite Stay Full battery and be right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Alan Ladd, in Motive for Murder, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. start with something you know for sure. Like the fact that Mary couldn't kill anyone. Then you go to people and you ask questions. You look for somebody who'll talk too much or not enough. Somebody like Harold Goff in a big old-fashioned house in Van Buren Street. You meet his invalid aunt who only sits and dreams of 50 years ago. And you look at tall and pretty in his $30 shirt standing there. And you find out why he'd go out and kill a man named Hamilton and steal his vacuum cleaner. All right, Dave, you've told me what you walked into. Now, tell me why you think Harold Dolph's the one. Tried to cover up before I could ask anything accounted. He lied once. Oh, cut it, man. I've questioned people, too. All right, but there's something wrong in that house, something wrong about him. He looked like he knew she wouldn't talk before I asked her questions. He explained she was ill, a little crazy. Suppose she isn't crazy, Jock. Suppose she's afraid of him. All right, Irish, suppose. Maybe he's keeping a prisoner there. Well, you said he admitted that much. She'd be in an institution otherwise. But really keeping a prisoner in there. Why, though? Why? Money, money, of course. Her money. He explained it. Her family had money, not his. You looked into that part? No, oh, Jock, but I've seen this kind of a hundred times. And gabardines that cost two fifty, standing around living off what another man worked hard for. Oh, it's a reach, Irish. A long reach. He's our man. I know it. He can stick around that house and torture that old lady by keeping her scared he could kill Hamilton. Sure, but where does Hamilton fit? Uh, oh, I don't know, Jock. That old lady could tell me if I could talk to her. You could be awful wrong, Irish. I've been wrong before. All I want is a chance to talk to her without Dolph breathing down my neck. Yeah, yeah. If I'm wrong, okay. If I'm right, I want Dolph where we can make the pinch. He'll come out of there sometime. When he does, you trail a guy. I'll talk to the old lady. All right, Irish. Uh, hey, that him back in the roadster out of the carriage house? Hey, you're right. Check with the station anytime you get a chance. I'll do the same. Right, Irish. She couldn't answer the bell. I had to use my gun butt on the garden door. This time, she wasn't humming. Just breathing slow, uneven. I lifted an eyelid and felt her pulse. Doped. Then I noticed her hands. Fine, long, delicately formed hands. But no rings. Yet marks that showed she'd worn rings most of her life. The pictures of her all over the place showed her wearing rings. Rings with big stones and old-fashioned settings. Money. I went from top to bottom, then. Attic to basement, every room. No rings and no vacuum cleaner. Harbor Precinct. Eddie speaking. Jock Dusen checked in yet? Who's this? It's Dave. Oh, Irish. Yeah, Jock checked in. Well, give it to me. I followed your man downtown to the Morgan Building on 5th. Morgan Building? Yeah. Morgan Building? No house-to-house canvassing, only from lists. Hey, Irish, you all right? Yeah, thanks, Eddie. I'll call you back. Right. Oh, Eddie. Yeah, Dave? Send a car to 4698 Van Buren. There's an old lady down there, doped. Name Cecilia Breckenbridge. Take care of her. Nephew's name, Harold Dolph. Don't let him get close. Got it. Mr. Richards, 
such strict orders that he wasn't to be disturbed. All the salesmen were in for a big meeting today. Let's get the act. Now, you can't go in there. I don't care if you are the police. You you can't go... What is this, Elsie? I I told him, Mr. Richards, but he wouldn't listen. I left strict orders that... Oh. Oh, it's you. Mr. Richards... Made it, sister. Now, see here. Such high-handed methods of entering a man's office... I'm a citizen of the city. And you're violating city ordinance 116, paragraph 5, code 2. You haven't got a peddler's license, and your boys are doing house to house. I distinctly told you we work from clients. That's not why I'm here. Don't know what the tall and pretty and the brown gabardines who came to see you a little while ago. Huh? Within the last hour, an officer from my division followed him this far. A tall man, uh, brown gabardines? Uh, But I. What do you want? Well, he just wanted to ask me about his vacuum cleaner. What about his vacuum cleaner? Well, he, uh, I had to tell him the same thing I explained to you this morning about how we handle our sales. What thing? Come on. But about a sale. When they make one, they bring the deposit money in and get a new machine to deliver to the customer. They can't sell a demonstrator. It's, it's used and worn. Is that all? Well, you see, he ordered a cleaner yesterday, and he said the salesman promised to deliver it, but he never got it. What salesman? He, he didn't know the salesman's name. He described him as a small man. Yes, a small man. All the man wanted really was a vacuum clip. My goodness, but he... he... wanted something else. What? Uh, well, he asked me for the address of that salesman. He said he wanted to talk to him about his vacuum cleaner that wasn't delivered. You gave the address to him? But I told you I don't know what salesman it is. It was. Just a little man, he said. So, so I remembered poor Hamilton. And I thought it might be... You told be... him where Hamilton lived? Uh, well, yes. Yes, I did. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> Driving across town towards Hamilton's apartment, I kept thinking of Mary and her question about how a cop works. No miracles, no magnifying glass, no bloodhound honey. Just facts. Facts to find a killer. An old house built with one of yesterday's great fortunes, forcing the dwindle down to a handful of wedding rings. Diamonds. Twenty or thirty thousand dollars worth of motive. Facts. A tall and pretty who was money-hungry and liked expensive clothes and cars. Facts. A vacuum cleaner salesman apartment without a vacuum cleaner. Hey. You held out on me. What do you mean? What do you mean this is a respectable apartment? You know how to throw the book at you? When I was here before, I went through Hamilton's apartment and there wasn't a vacuum cleaner there. But I never... Hamilton kept at least two cleaners here all the time. You kept still, hoping to grab one for free. But I never saw any... He didn't keep them in his place. He didn't want to lug them up three flights. He kept them somewhere on this floor. I didn't think you'd care. Where was it? The hall closet in back. He had a key. You'll give me yours now. And that's where I found the old lady's wedding rings. The sack on that demonstrator Hamilton used in her house. Sacks. I had all of them now. And a minute later, I heard feet on the stairs. I left the cleaner sitting there in the hall and stepped back into the shadows and waited. Waited for my killer. Oh. Hello, sweetheart. I've been expecting you. We got business. Business? About your aunt's diamond rings. What are you talking about? Murder. Murder? It's an old lady waiting to die and you've been helping her with dope. Well, well, that's ridiculous. That's why you never let anybody in to see her. But you wanted some fun yesterday. Jokes. And you let out... Vacuum cleaner salesman named Hamilton come in and visit her. Now, see here, really... But as sick and as doped as she was, your aunt figured out a way so you'd never get those rings. She beat you, Dolph. All right, you've got... When you weren't looking, she took them off and threw them under the vacuum cleaner. Now, we can come to some understanding. She wouldn't talk. You remember the salesman? Trailed him all over town. And you found him at one place along the line. You stabbed him with a kitchen knife, sapped Mary, and did the covering up with a broken glass, lipstick, and liquor. Mary? My wife, brother, and it's my place. Oh, when I look... I can get you money. Ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Thanks. If That's what th- I've been waiting for. Please. He talked. Fact. Harold Dolph killed the salesman when he opened the cleaner and didn't find the rings. He didn't know that Hamilton had stopped off at his own place, where he left the demonstrator with the rings in the sack and picked up the new one he was delivering to Mary. Irish, how did you do it? With a magnifying glass and bloodhounds? You know, honey, you make with facts. You start with something you know for sure. The fact that my wife can't be a killer. 
You see, I love her too much. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Alan Ladd. Say, Wilcox, I've decided never to hunt Irish camels again, Bigori. Let me give you a tip, Reming Jester. You'll do better going for those Autolite Stay Full batteries and the more than 400 other products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday, for suspense, our star will be Ronald Regan. The play is called One and One's a Lonesome. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed and transcribed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Motive for Murder was written by John and Ward Hawkins and adapted for radio by Jack Newman. Alan Ladd will soon be seen in the Paramount picture Captain Carey, USA. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Ronald Regan. Batteries, Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This week marks the 38th birthday of the Girl Scouts. Autolite joins that celebration and sends its warmest greetings to more than a million Girl Scouts of the USA who today are learning to become the better citizens of tomorrow. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Six thousand dealers present Mr. Ronald Reagan in One and One's a Lonesome, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Extraordinary, extraordinary. Autolite spark plugs, I presume, Reming Chester? No, the Australian platypus, Wilcox. Simply extraordinary. Why? Why, it's not half as extraordinary as White Gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. The newest addition to the complete line of regular transport aviation resistor, marine, and model spark plugs, ignition engineered by Autolite. You should have been on my big Australian platypus hunt. Reming Chester, have you ever hunted for special money savings advantages? Well, you can find them in the wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. You see, because of the built in 10,000 ohm exclusive Autolite resistor, which makes a wider gap setting practical, you get double life under equal conditions compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. Greater gas saving, too, smoother performance, and faster starts in cold weather. Evidently, platypuses do not interest you. Oh, yes, they do. They do. But I'm fascinated with the wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plug. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, You'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with One and One's a Lonesome and the performance of Ronald Reagan, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. My name's George, George Bellock. 
Right now, I'm on a trip. Not alone. No, I've got company. She's a few days behind me, but we're getting off at the same stop. Her name's Marie, but don't let that tag fool you. She's as U.S. as the American League. I haven't seen her since yesterday, and I don't know what she's wearing. But five will get you ten. The outfit's silk and covers her body like a cellophane wrapper. I met her about two weeks ago, right after she married the guy I work for, Henry Grover. He owns a lumber yard just outside of town. He'd been working hard and figured he was ripe for a vacation. He hired me to manage the place while he was away. I put him on a train one night, didn't hear from him for two months. I was sorry to hear from him then. I'd put a few improvements in, and the take was making me forget I ever had any money troubles. I got a postcard saying he'd met a nice babe and married her. I tossed off a couple of drinks in honor of the occasion and relaxed. I figured she'd talk him into staying in the city and I could buy the shop. That was before I met her. I've never been so wrong. Uh, there he is, Marie, honey. Hello there, George. Welcome home, Henry. Uh, good to see you again, boy. Well, here she is. Marie, this is George Bellick. George has been managing the office for me. Hello, manager. Hi. Here, Henry, let me help you with those bags. Oh, thanks. <laughs> How's business? I told Marie all about the place, some of the things I got in mind. Pretty good. Guess you'll be building that new house now, huh, Henry? Oh, not this year. Thinking about painting the old one, though. I have a few ideas, too, you know. <laughs> and pretty good ones, too. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the place didn't pick up and make some money. I wouldn't be surprised. I uh, don't suppose you'll be staying on now Henry's back, will you, George? Oh, well, of course he'll be staying. I don't know. I haven't thought much about it. Lumberyard doesn't need three managers. Well, Marie... Does it need no. two? When two is one, that's different. That's right, George. One and one makes one, you know. <laughs> no. That's when three's a cloud. <laughs> Come on in. Want some coffee? Yeah. Thanks. Thought you were with Henry. He's over in the warehouse. Alone? Yeah. I don't think you're glad to see us, George. Why should I be? My name's on your check. Your husband's name. Listen, uh, tell me something, will you? Like what? Like how come you two got married? Love. It hits you fast. Sometimes. Planning to be with him long? No. It's a top-heavy contest, and he's outclassed. Well, that's nothing to me. That's good. How'd you happen to bring him back here? Why didn't you keep him at home? I felt like a change. he bail you out? Yeah. Out of a dance hall. I suppose you just sold the tickets. Not exactly. Okay. Okay, slave to queen. How's it feel? Let me ask you one. What are you going to do for a job now? Manage this lumber business? No, you're not. You don't own it. Don't believe everything you read on a piece of paper. I own it. And there's no room for you. You know, your new husband's in for a kind of a surprise. What kind of a surprise? I mean, when he hits the warehouse. What about it? There's a room over in the back part. One of the walls is holding up a row of slot machines. A couple of tables on the floor that weren't made for checkers. Gambling? That's right. Henry didn't mention that. That's the surprise. Well, I guess I don't have to worry any about getting rid of you. Henry will take care of that. You think so? How's business in the back room? Like a girly show on Iwo Jima. Where's the money? In the bank. Your bank? My bank. Uh, George, uh, can I see you a minute? Sure, Henry. Come on in here, why don't you? Well, uh... I'd rather handle this alone, honey, if you don't mind. Come on, George. Oh, you told me I could help you. Now something's come up and you're shutting me out of it. Well, this has nothing to do with that. This is uh, something new. You may as well let her in on it. She knows all about it anyway. You told her? Sure. I figured I was telling the manager. One and one makes one, remember? All right. George, I left you to run a lumber yard. I didn't want any improvements. Especially, I didn't want any improvements like I just saw over there. Dice tables, slot machines, I don't know what all. 
I don't see how you moved it all in two months. Two days. But you're right. It wasn't easy. George, when I came back, I thought we'd all work together. There's a place for you here. And I'll go on paying you the same salary. Huh. Huh. Wouldn't be much compared to what you've been making on the side, is that it? Business has been pretty good up till now. Well, then it's, it's all over. And this is goodbye. I'm sorry. No easy money for you, huh? Not when it's breaking the law. You can stay on here tonight, but in the morning, get those machines and dice tables together and get out. They're not going any place, and neither am I. But you're breaking the law. Tomorrow morning, I'm throwing out all that stuff. Where are you going to throw it? Out, anywhere. I, I don't know. I don't care where. If you throw it outside and leave it, somebody will see it and talk to the police. If you try and have it moved out, I'll call them myself. Any way you look at it, they're going to want the owner of this place for gambling. And you're the owner. George, you bought the stuff. I, I didn't know anything about it. I don't even know where you got it. I've been away. I can prove that. I, you don't scare me. In your name, I bought the stuff. And in your name, I ran the place. I'm just a hired man working here. They'll want the boss. And you're the boss, just like always, Henry. Well, then you're closing down tomorrow. If I can't run a decent shop, I won't run any. All right, close down. But if the police get a tip, they'll think all you do out here is gamble. Oh, what's got into you, son? Two months ago, I gave you a job, and you were glad to get it. Oh, what's got into you, anyway? He found a way to make some money. Yeah, a lot of money. The take is good here. When I got your postcard, I thought I'd seen the last of you. I was going to pay you for the place and let it go at that. How about it? What's the price? No price. I'm not selling it to you or anybody else. How about $15,000? In cash? Sure, cash. You haven't saved that much from this place in two months. I'll get the money. Got about 8000 now. A couple of months, I'll have the rest. I wouldn't trust you for a three-cent stamp. Never mind, Marie, honey. Now, look, I'm not selling, George, and that's the end of it. And we're partners. Not in anything like this, we're not. You'll like it fine when the money starts coming in. I don't want anything to do with it. Okay, you won't have anything to do with it. You take care of the lumber business. I'll handle the rest. I told you now, for the last time. Hey, listen, listen. We don't want any trouble with the police. There isn't going to be any trouble with the police. The way he tells it, there is. He's got us over a barrel. I've been clearing pretty near a thousand bucks a week. There isn't much I wouldn't do for that kind of money. We better think it over, honey. We better think over what to do. Well, I... That's the idea. Think it over. Think it over, both of you. The minute I saw her, I knew that was the way I was going to have to play it. I knew I wouldn't get far with him. But with her, it was different. There wasn't much I wouldn't do for that kind of money. There wasn't anything she wouldn't do. I knew I'd planted the seed, and I knew how it'd grow. I knew how she'd go to work on him that night, almost as though I'd been in the room. Henry, what are you going to do about George? Oh, I don't know, honey. He's a good man. He must be in with bad crowd, that's all. Yeah, that's likely. He's played the angles so long they're round. I, I like George. That's why I hired him. If he's in with the wrong bunch, oh, that's all right. He'll come out of it. You going to let him go on gambling? I don't know what to say. You said yourself he had Henry, no... you could take him up on it. On what? His proposition. At least for a while. Oh, but I... You could pretend to. No, no, I don't like that. Anyway, where would that get you? It'd get you a 50-50 cut on $1,000 a week in the meantime. No, Marie, I don't want it. I don't want any part of you it. You heard what he said. He said he'd do anything for that kind of money. Oh, he didn't mean anything. Oh. But... I know what I'd do. I'd put a bullet in his head. Oh, now, Marie, don't talk that way. That isn't even funny. What are you going to do? Let him take over your business right out from under your nose? He's a gambler and a thief. Henry, if you called him on it, if you had it out with him and he started anything, it'd be self-defense. Why, no jury in the world would hold you on it. What are you talking about? I'm telling you. Well, don't be silly. I'm certainly not going to do anything like that. All right, all right, don't. See what happens. I wish I knew what was going to happen. Well, I'll tell you. You want to know? Oh, just let me try to think, can't you? Think. What do you suppose he's thinking about? Well, he said... I know what he said. Listen to me, Henry. It's him or you. Don't you see that? Three's a crowd. That's what he's thinking about. Murder. Yeah, I knew pretty much what they were talking about in there. I knew this dame pretty well. 
It only needed a day of knowing her to know that a word like murder was part of her natural-born vocabulary. To know that she could cut a guy's throat and think no more of it than clipping one of her fingernails. I didn't know just then who was going to get murdered. I found out. Autolite is bringing you Ronald Reagan in One and One's a Lonesome. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, hello. I saw lots of kangaroos in Australia, too. Why, their tails are... You don't say why Reming Chester the kangaroo's tail is as unique in the animal world as the White Gap Autolite resistor is in the spark plug world. It's the newest addition to the complete line of regular transport aviation, resistor, marine, and model spark plugs ignition engineered by Autolite. Will Cox, you ought to see the starting power of those critters. Man, they've got nothing on the White Gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. They give fast starts even in cold weather. Smoother performance, too, on leaner gas mixtures. Greater gas saving. Even double life under equal conditions compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. And it's all because of the 10,000-ohm Autolite resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug to make a wider gap setting practical. I said you should see... Your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Ronald Reagan, with Kathy Lewis in One and One's a Lonesome, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The night after Henry and his new wife came home, I didn't open up the back room in the warehouse. I put in the new table and counted out the profits for the week. I took a fair share over to Grover, but he read negative all the way. When he turned down that money, Marie tried on a face she must have been saving for Jack the Ripper. She knew he wasn't going to change his mind. She could see I was set to pocket big money on a four-hour schedule in the back room, while their take after 16 hours in the lumber yard would look like a piggy bank night before Christmas. I said goodnight and left them alone to what promised to be a rotten evening for both. I went over to the garage where I'd fixed myself up a little cot. I was mixing the paint we were using on the house the next day, but I hadn't been at it more than half an hour when I had a visitor. This is a surprise. I, um, I broke my fingernail. Thought you might have a nail clipper. See it? Isn't it pretty? Yeah. Do you have one? What? A nail clipper? On your keychain, maybe? Sure, here. Wait, let me do it for you. Hmm. Long and pointed. Like a pussycat. They can scratch, too. Like them? Sure. There you are. What'll I do with the victim? Keep it for a souvenir. Do you mind my coming to see you? Not if your husband doesn't. He doesn't know I'm here. He will if he thinks real hard. I don't care. I wanted to see you. Need more light? No. No, this is fine. Henry's not strong, you know. Well, he wasn't wearing a lion skin when you married him. It all happened so fast, and I wanted to get out of that dance hall. Oh, yeah, the dance hall. Well, that's the price of love. Or have you changed your mind? Yeah, I changed my mind. That's easy to do when it's all over. Is it all over? You married him. He's not strong. Maybe something will happen to him. Not likely. Nothing ever has. I did. Don't you like me? Huh? I like you. I like it here. I don't want to leave. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want my head turning into a home for your husband's bullets. This, uh... Paint you're using tomorrow? Yeah. Your healthy husband and I. Mm. Using ladders? No, we'll swing a couple of platforms on pulleys with ropes. Why? Want to learn to paint? No, thanks. I'm worried about Henry up on one of those things. He's not as strong as you are. Yeah, I know. Happened to fall off, he might be hurt. If he fell on the cement drive, might break his neck. 
That's right. Do the ropes ever break? Not often enough to make the odds good for betting. Could you make them break? Huh? Could you fix the ropes so they'd break when he got to the top? Not on your life. I'm happy with my little racket. I'm not taking any chances killing anybody. Then he'll kill you. Take your choice. How long do you think he'll watch that money going into your pocket? How long do you think he'll take that gambling? Keep talking. It'll be accidental. No murder at all. When he's dead, I get the warehouse. And the house. You get me. What's in it for you? You are? As simple as that. And I'll take a cut on those backroom profits. Go on. Henry's been talking about painting the house. I got the idea when he told me about a fellow doing the same thing who fell and was killed. If anything like that ever happened to him, he said I wouldn't have to worry. Everything was taken care of. Why do you cut me in? I told you. Because I like you. And because you couldn't cut me out. Can you fix the rope so it'll break when you want it to? No. But I could fix it so it would break. It'd have to be somebody else here, a witness, to see it was an accident. I already thought of that. A friend of his, Jim Brandon. you figured every angle, haven't you? You'll get your chance. Okay. The rope will break. Get it fixed up tonight? Okay. Where'll you leave it? There'll be two platforms. One for me, one for him. I'll take them both over to the house tonight before I go to bed. Put the one for Henry by the office. Put yours by the house. Yeah? I don't want you to be around tomorrow when Henry and Brandon set him up. That way nobody can say that you had anything to do with it. Don't worry. We won't have any trouble. We better not. I'm risking a lot for you. I won't forget it, baby. Don't. This is what the movies call love. You like it? I'm getting to like it. It's easy learning. I hope I won't have to forget. I'll worry about that. Let's talk some more. You got more to say? Mm-hmm. Lots more. Mm. Things are going to be different around here after tomorrow. Yeah. That's right. Just you and me and the backroom gold mine. Think we'll make you happy? I'm willing to take a chance. I'd better be getting back to the house. Sure. It's Grover's last night. Good night, Georgie. Don't disappoint me. Is that hard? Well, I had gloves with me when I came in here. You did? Here they are. Oh. Well, I think I'll keep them. What's the idea? I want a souvenir. I'm not going anywhere. Maybe I'll tuck them under my pillow. This is what the movies call love. After she left, I sat there thinking. Those gloves didn't help me clear my head any. They smelt like the powder room in the Club Paris. I liked the way she handled Grover. Sure, the kid was bright. The plan looked surefire with a payoff in fancy living written especially for happy homes. I strung together a couple of ropes and a pulley on two wooden boards and called it a platform. The next one took more time. I spent a few minutes burning the rope where it would rest on the pulley when the platform was up near the top. I pulled it apart a little with my fingers, made sure it wouldn't hold much weight for long. I fixed it just the way I wanted it. Then I slipped it through the pulley, anchored it on the boards, and had myself another platform, different from the first, but looking just the same. I put the good one by the house and the other next to the shop. By the time I was through, it was nearly daylight, and I lay down in the cot. The next thing I knew, she was shaking me. Come on. Come on. Wake up. Come huh? on. Huh? They're ready to start. Who? Who? Him who? and his pal are out there now waiting for you. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where are they? Out in the yard. The platforms. Yeah, they've already got them set up. Okay. It won't be long now, baby. Are you nervous? Sure. Like a sack of laundry. Don't let me fool you. I'm scared when the time comes, it won't work. Forget it. That rope won't hold a hundred pounds five minutes. And anything that hits that concrete will be dead before you catch your breath. How did you fix the rope? I burned it. Nobody will notice it. I pulled it apart a little. Just enough to hold it together while he's getting to the top. Well, let Brandon pull you both up. Nobody has to pull us both up. We can lift our own. There's a rope from the pulley that'll hoist her lower. Okay. Come on. A few minutes and you'll be the new owner around here. And I'll be talking about Mary and my boss. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, George. A few minutes, things will be swell. 
Which one of them picked up the rope by the shop? Brandon, his pal. Then it's on the right side of the drive. That's the bad one. Are you sure? Sure. That's the one for Henry. Wonder how long it takes to fall three stories. Three, maybe four seconds? I don't know. When the rope breaks, you count it. I'll be busy trying to look surprised. I want Brandon to go into town telling everybody about the accident we had out here. Well, don't overdo it. You're no actor. I'll keep my eyes on you, baby. That's a good idea. Matter of fact, I'm going to make a habit. Hi there, George. You bring the paint? Oh, yeah, Henry. Yeah. Right here. Oh, you know Jim Brandon, don't you? Yeah, we met. Hiya, George. Hello, Mr. Clover. Hello. Well, might as well get going. With all this waiting around, I've kind of lost the mood for painting. It's like gambling, Henry. Once you begin, you feel like you never belong anywhere else. Yeah, uh, George, uh, I got a couple of things I want to talk to you Not about. now, Henry. You've been talking about nobody being ready to paint. Now we're all ready, so let's paint. All right, all right. But when we finish, George, come over to the house. I want to talk with you. Sure, Henry. Maybe I was a little hasty last night. Right after we get through, I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> George must think he's a pretty fast painter. Gonna be all finished in the house before you get down over the platform, Henry. Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> I've done my share of painting, too. You'll have to jump some to beat me, George. I guess you're right. You two gonna stand there all day? That's right, Mrs. Grover. Neither of them can paint well enough to make this old place look any better. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I was telling Henry this morning, it's time he bought a new house for his pretty new wife. Thank you, Mr. Brandon. But as long as we have this house and the paint's right here, we may as well go ahead and paint, don't you think? Oh, sure, sure. Oh, you're right, honey. Well, come on, George. Let's get going. Can I help you, Henry? No, thanks. We can pull ourselves up, can't we, George? Yeah, that's right. Come on, let's uh, stand over here out of the way, Mr. Brandon. I want to watch this. Yeah, sure thing. You ever seen house painting before? Oh, yeah, yeah. Never anything quite like this. Yeah? Well, they're pretty good at it. Hey, this is kind of a rickety contraption. Is it going to hold? Oh, sure, sure. What's the matter, George? You having trouble? No, just watching. Well, now you've seen how it's done. You come on up in the sky. Be right with you, Henry. Hey, Brandon, when I get to the top, will you tie this rope to the bucket of paint and pass it up? Right, Henry. All right. Keep pulling, George. He's beating you up there. Hey, easy does it, George. That's no elevator. Don't worry about me. You got your own problems. Okay, Jim, pass up the paint. You ready to, George? Hey! Hey, I think the rope is slipping on the pulley. I don't feel anything. I don't see anything wrong with the pulley. It's breaking with the pulley! <laughs> Like I told you, I'm on a trip, but it's no honeymoon. A couple of hours ago, 170 pounds of Henry Grover hit the cement driveway. Then I got the surprise of my life. It lasted just two seconds before I hit two. I thought I was as safe as a glass of water, but I was just another fall guy because both platforms gave way. I'd never thought of that angle. Two partners make more dough than three, but one owner without a partner makes the most. No, I didn't think of that. But I had thought of a couple of others just in case. The fingernail, for instance. They gave me maybe half a day to live. So I told it to them. The cops. Almost the way it happened. And when I got through, I didn't even have to hint at those other couple of angles. They found it out all by themselves. And then they brought in Marie. Oh, George. Doctor, is, is he willing to... Skip it, baby. They know all about it. <laughs> know all about what? My name is William, Lieutenant Homicide. Homicide? These your gloves, Mrs. Grover? Yes, they're mine. We found them in sort of a funny place. In the tool shed where all those painting platforms were fixed up. Well, I don't see how that, that... Did you know those ropes were burned and frayed? Somebody pulled them apart and burned them. George did it. It was all his idea. He, sure he, he funny wa guy wanted to bump himself off. Let me see your hands. Mm. Nice hands. Nice nails. One of them's broke off, huh? What of it? We found it. In the rope where somebody pulled it apart. We want you for murder. Yeah, like I said... I'm going on a little trip any minute now, the doc says. 
but she'll be right behind me. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Ronald Reagan, with Kathy Lewis. Say, Harlow, it seems to make no difference whether I'm talking about kangaroos or platypuses. It always reminds you of Autolite. Well, that's as natural as you're a naturalist, Reming Chester, because Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Joseph Cotton. The play is called Blood Sacrifice, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. One and One's A Lonesome was written for radio by Nelson Sykes. Ronald Reagan may currently be seen in the Warner Brothers production, The Hasty Heart. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Cary Grant, Dan Daly, and Arthur Godfrey. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Joseph Cotton. You can buy Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite safe batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. An investment in boys is an investment in America's future. This is National Boys Club Week. Support the Boys Club in your community. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Joseph Cotton in Blood Sacrifice, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Hap me, boy, here's one that'll rattle the ivory between your ears. What is it that carries water, has plates, gives continuous service, and is associated with a good tip? A waiter. Oh, how dumb can you be? Listen, I'll make it easy. It needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And it's a tough little bundle of potent energy. Now, what is it? Uh, camel? Oh, give me strength. Look, Slap Happy, it's the famous Autolite Stay Full battery. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Why, the Stay Full has over three times more liquid reserve above the plates than batteries without Stay Full features. You caught me with my brains down, Wilcox. Glad to hear you admit it. Because the Autolite Stay Full battery is known from coast to coast as the battery that gives 70% longer average life as compared to batteries without stay-full features. And this is proven by tests conducted according to SAE life cycle standards. You're absolutely right, Harlow. Of course. You're always right with Autolite. And now, with blood sacrifice and the performance of Joseph Cotton, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense! Seen his dressing room. Gary, his arm through mine, his great, beautiful voice purring assuringly in my ear. It's wonderful, Johnny, wonderful. Two hundred thousand. Why, they didn't say that for Gone with the Wind. You're a success, boy, a success. A success. And well on the way toward being rich. On the marquee above the theater in lights, Garrick Drury and Bitter Laurel, and then in slightly smaller lights, by John Scales. New clothes, best food, a fashionable hotel, new and fashionable acquaintances. And I owed it, every bit of it, to Garrick Drury. Everyone said that, everyone except Gary. 
We had just finished seeing the men from the motion picture company. Gary had been charming, courteous, thoughtful, protecting my royalties, protecting his rights, and finally they were gone. Walters, Gary's valet, came into the room. Anything else, Mr. Drury? Not tonight. I'll pick you up in the car at the stage door at five minutes. Yes, sir. I'm going to see Mr. Scales for his taxi. Sure, I can't drop you anywhere, John. No, no, quite sure, thanks. Glad to, you know. Oh, uh, Walters. Oh, yes, sir. Bring along that play of young, uh, what's his name, Ruggles, Buggles, you know who I mean. I promised Fanny Taylor I'd read it, but, uh, well, it's perfectly useless, of course. We'll be playing Bitter Laurel for another two or three years yet. Eh, what, John? Well, come along. Five minutes, Walters. Yes, sir. Now, look here, John. Don't you worry about this movie deal. I've handled these characters before. 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 Well, listen to that, John. Wonderful sound. The empty theater. The empty, echoing, endless theater. John, you know what, sure. There's a play in it. In the last scene, the actor dies in the empty, endless theater, pouring out his death on eight pages to the ghosts of all the audience who didn't realize how great he was. Alone. His wife's gone to, uh, uh, Hollywood. Perfect. Well, what are we waiting for, Johnny? I'll put you in your taxi, you go home and write it, bring it to me tomorrow night. We'll fix it, and there we are. I can read the notices now. It's sensational, aren't they? Garrick Drury does it again, act as death scene, draws bravo. Sir, Garrick Drury, maybe. Well, come on, we'll get you on your way. Good night, Mr. Drury. I thought your performance was exceedingly fine tonight. Thank you. Good night, Scotty. Waters will be right up. You can lock up. Good night, Mr. Drury, Mr. Scales. Good night, Scotty. Well, this is raining. There's a cab stand right at the corner. We make a run for it. John, look out! John, are you all right? I, oh, I don't know. Knocked the, knocked the breath out of me. My side. Oh, how about you? You all right? No. Here, here, let me help you. Bye. You are hurt. No, no, no. Just jarred up a little. No. Broken bones. Gary! Oh, my Lord! I picked myself up from the curb where the car had thrown me when it hit us. My side hurt and my head reeled, but Gary! I saw him stagger out from the other side of the car, saw the jagged pane of broken glass in the store window, saw the bright spurt dyeing the pavement crimson where Gary's right hand clutched his left arm. A policeman came running for us. Here, yeah, yeah, here, what happened? It's Mr. Dury, officer. The yes. car skidded over the curb and knocked him through the window. Here, here. let's have a look now. Hmm. Oh, Captain, you got him in face. You've got him now. Oh, no wonder. He's got an artery. Hey, hey you, call an ambulance. Get a doctor. This man will bleed to death. We're not quick. Are you all right, sir? I, I hurt the side a little. All I feel that faint, but I'll be all right. Good, good. We've got to stop this bleeding here. Now, uh, help me. You put your hand right, right here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now. now, squeeze hard. Yeah. And keep on squeezing. Right, you, you over there. Uh, Come on, give us a hand. Uh, I'll right. take his head. You take his feet now. Oh, right. Easy, does it? Uh, 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 what happened? Mr. Drew! It's been an accident. Oh. Walter, here. Come, give me a hand. Oh. Hang on to the artery now. I'm trying to now. What is it? It's an accident. Mr. Drury oh. cut an artery. Here. Oh. Here. There's a couch in oh. Mr. Drury's dressing room officer. Right around this way. What's the matter? Oh. What happened to the light? Turn up the light. He fainted, Gary. Oh. I see. All right, all right. Here. Get on the couch. Easy now. Down we go. Now. You. Get an ambulance and a doctor. All right. My left arm, ain't you? Do you suppose I'll lose the use of it? Lord. Well, it's lucky it's the arm in the play, isn't it, John? Oh, no. I can always go on playing Keith. Always. The rest of my life. My play. All the rest of his life. No. Oh. That is the blood. I began to be sick. And the officer took his strong hand and... Gripped the artery in Gary's arm above my own shaking yeah, fingers. Okay. Now, you look peaking. Lie down, Mr. Scales. Let me hold that. Now, you uh, help rig up a tourniquet. Well, Walters, whatever your name is. Hey, will someone try to get a doctor? Just call for the doctor. There's no one on emergency. Everyone's out, and so are the ambulances. Then call a private hospital. This man is bleeding to death. Bleeding to death. This was the end, was it? No doctor on duty, and Garrick Drilly bleeding to death. And then I came to. I'll find a doctor.
But it was 40 minutes before the doctor finally came. 40 minutes while Garrick drew his life feet out from the improvised tourniquet. The doctor sat down his bag and took one look. We're still trying to get hold of an ambulance, doctor. Oh, never mind. We couldn't move him now anyway. There's only one thing to do. Give him a transfusion right here. Yes. Well, first we'll make a decent tourniquet. Now I'll test his blood for type. Oh, uh, by the by, wait around, all of you. I have to find someone among you with type of blood that matches his. Gary lay on a couch behind a screen in the dressing room. And there was a plate on the table, one with a border of pink roses from which during rehearsals we'd often eaten hasty sandwiches. Now there were four round blobs of red on it. Blood. Two blobs of mine and two of Gary's valet, Walters. Behind the screen, Walters was blubbering with grief while an intern arrived at last with the ambulance was murmuring fearfully. But, Doctor, I can't find his pulse. You can't. Bob, wait a minute. Here, you idiot, let me see. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course, here it is. But we must hurry or we'll be gone. Steady now, Walter, steady. We know you love him. We're doing all we can. Now, go look at those tests. The important thing is to give transfusion as soon as possible. Oh, let me give it. Uh, I'll give my life for Mr. Drury. Let me give the transfusion. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll see. I've already told you Drury's blood is type 3. Very difficult. You can only give him a transfusion from someone of his own type or a type 4 universal donor. Anything else would be like giving him prussic acid. I only hope that you or Mr. Scales will do. We'll have to make sure. All right, now, let me see. The doctor bent over the plate, pouring liquid out of vials onto the red drops. I stood where I'd been standing when he put the blood onto the plate before the intern's voice had cried out. Doctor, I can't find his pulse. Huh? Walters and the doctor had plunged around the screen to where Gary lay unconscious. I watched while the doctor finished with the vials. Then he picked up a grease pencil from the dressing table and drew a line across the plate, cutting it in half. Then, with a pencil, he marked the side on which I stood with an S and the side on which Walters had stood with a W. There uh, now. Now we'll be sure of which is which. It will take a few minutes to see if there's any agglutination. Oh, well, let's hope. That's all we can do is hope. And he disappeared once again behind the screen. It was then that I noticed the one rose on the border of the plate which had been blurred in the firing. I'd noticed it before many times. I'd noticed it today in the last few minutes, looking stupidly at it as you do at such things. But before, before the doctor had marked it, before he and Walters had gone running behind the screen, then hadn't the blurred rose been on the left, my left? But now it was on the right. Might Walters, in passing, have brushed it and turned it around? I stood and stared at the tiny pool on the side marked W. Little hard purple crystals were beginning to form around the edges. I looked at the side of the plate marked S. My side, supposedly. The blood was clear and bright. But what if the plate had been turned around? And the blood on the other side was mine. It was mine that was forming little purple crystals. I stood staring at the plate as the doctor came around from behind the screen. Now, let's have a look at this. Hmm. Well, looks as though we're in luck. Is it mine? May I give him the transfusion, oh, sir? Sorry, old man. Uh, Not unless you want to murder him. Oh. No, no, but Mr. Scales here, it looks as if he were that useful animal, a universal donor. Uh, All right, Mr. Scales, let's make ready. What? You're it, Mr. Scales. I... Oh, there's something I ought... Uh, well, I ought to mention that... You're not frightened, are you? There's no, not that. There's no I... danger from giving a transfusion, you know. No, donor, that no, 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 I'm not frightened, Doctor. Then come around here and let's get busy. We haven't much time. Doctor, I... I... Hello, you... John, old fellow. Okay. What's this? Final curtain? Oh, don't be silly. That's a rotten egg, eh? Dying, Egypt. Dying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not dead yet. Not by long shot. Now, take off your coat, Pete, Mr. Scales, and roll up your sleeves. Rotten eggs, eh? Rotten break for you, too, John. You'll have to close the play. Close the play. Close the play. I'm ready, Doctor. Well, to be sure. Now, sit down here. Hold still. You will hardly notice this. Make a fist. Like Tight. This? That's it. Uh, maybe feel a little dizzy for a minute afterward, but in an hour, you'll be as right as rain. That's right. Now, now, still. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad, was it? Uh, lie back. That's right. Good old John. Give me... <sighs> Lord, what a publicity story this will make. Playwright at actor's bedside. 
gives blood to save famous stars' life. If he had kept quiet, if he'd only... It might not have been too late then. But then I knew... I, I knew that I would never tell the doctor. I would never tell anyone. I, I would only wait and see. The revulsion, the contempt, the hatred that had been caged up in me for that smiling, posturing ape on the couch leaped now, clawing at the bars, howling for revenge. Going all right, Scale? Yes. Yes, perfectly. Thank you, Doctor. Autolite is bringing you Joseph Cotton in Blood Sacrifice. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Now it's my turn, Wilcox. Riddle me this. What is it that lives a long time, has great power and endurance, and can store water? Well, that's easy, Hap. An Autolite stay full battery. Oh, no. Yes, yes. That Autolite stay full battery needs no more water than a cactus, because it has more than three times the liquid reserve above the plate as compared to batteries without stay full features. Stop, Stop that, Wilcox, and answer my riddle. Now, let's see. Now, you mentioned long life. The Autolite Stay Full battery has a fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate. That accounts for its incredibly long life. Why, recent tests based on SAE life cycle standards prove that Autolite Stay Full batteries give 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay Full features. You're not even getting warm, Wilcox. Why, man, this Autolite Stay Full battery is tops in batteries. Talk about power, it's phenomenal. Endurance, sensational. And remember, it's the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Elephants is what I had in mind, Harlow. But I'm right too, Hap, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Joseph Cotton, in Blood Sacrifice, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I lay back there on the chair in the dressing room. The doctor had been right, there was no pain about it. I could feel little tinglings as the blood said goodbye to my body on the way to inhabiting the much bluer veins of a distinguished actor. No, no, I felt nothing. Only a gentle warmth after a while and a lovely serenity. And with it came little visual effects inside my closed eyelids, a kaleidoscope like they use in films to dissolve into flashbacks. That, that was it. Yes. I was having a flashback. I hadn't wanted to send the play to Gary in the first place, but I was new in London, and good old George Storpots, who was handling me, said he had a hunch about it. Everything to gain, my boy. Nothing to lose. May as well try, you know. Can't get hurt oh, trying. Lord, George, Gary Drury, it's just, just not his kind of play. It's a, it's a tragedy, a bitter, cynical, disillusioned tragedy. Well, he may. He just may like it, you know. I'll send it along over to his hotel. We'll see. I'd never met Gary until then, and... Of course, this tremendous charm of his, this flashing, winning, infectious, incomparable style of the man. When, well, when you talked to him, you were lost. And he did like the play. At least he said he liked it. Oh, yes, wonderful idea. Very strong. Perhaps a little grim, but then these are grim times. Of course, there are one or two things that need touching up, and we may have to make a change here and there. There's never been a play produced that didn't have to have a certain amount of rewriting during rehearsal. You understand. But I didn't understand. I was still too bewildered to understand. And the man had this fantastic charm, and he'd used it. Before I was out of his office, I'd signed a contract giving me a very pretty share of the royalties, and Gary the right to make any reasonable changes. He might be necessary to the script. Reasonable changes. <laughs> During rehearsals, we'd sit halfway back in the theater, and... Oh, John, I've been thinking. Yes? The cocktail scene in the first half of the me. It seems out of character. What do you mean? Kid wouldn't have acted that way. He'd have been shocked and hurt and angry at the change of the fiancé. He'd have denounced her and left the party. And I say, well, well, And then at the very end, Keith rolls up his uniform tunic with all the decorations on it and lays it under his head for a pillow and lies down on the bench. Oh, 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 oh wonderful curtain line. He says, I rest upon my laurels. Wonderful. Can you write it, boy? You're not serious. Of course I'm serious. 
Now, look here, Johnny. This is your play. I'm only no, concerned. But that's not the play, Gary. It's, it's all out of key with the rest of it. Oh, yes, that reminds me. I've been a little bothered about the ending, too. Oh, it's very dramatic, of course. But just at this time, it seems in a little bad taste, don't you think? The play altered, butchered, finally opened. We sat up waiting for the morning papers, and then they came. I read them, and I I wanted to run away and couldn't. The voices of the critics saying to the public, This broken back play is only held together by the magnificent acting of Mr. Garrett Drury. Saccharine as it is, Bitter Laurel provides a personal triumph for Mr. Garrick Drury. Nothing in the play is consistent except the assured acting of Garrick Drury. Mr. John Scales has constructed his situations with great skill to display Mr. Drury in all his attitudes. And that is a sure recipe for success. We prophesy a long run for Bitter Laurel. And run it dead. There was no stopping it. I caught myself wishing Garrick Drury would die or lose his looks or his voice or his popularity so that the whole thing could be buried and forgotten. Well, now, perhaps he was going to die. I watched the blood from my veins fill up the container. I thought of the blurred rose on the plate that might have got turned around. I heard Walter still complaining about something. I listened to the doctor. Blood won't do it at all, Walter. Lucky for Mr. Drury that Mr. Scales is around. Good man to have around. Universal donor. Blood mixes with all types. But was it my blood or Walter's that mixed with all types? I didn't know. I couldn't be sure. Yet somehow I was sure that the plate had been turned around, and that would mean that if the doctor used my blood for a transfusion, that... What was it he said? It would be like giving Gary prussic acid. It would be murder. <laughs> no one would ever know. The doctor might guess, but he would never dare speak. It would be put down to his own negligence. He came over to me and looked at the level in the container and nodded his head approvingly and then turned to Gary again. I felt myself pulsing and drifting like a man dozing in a snowdrift. Good evening, Polly. Oh, good evening, Mr. Oh, Drury. Oh, Looks oh, like mine, does it? It does indeed. But then we can't complain. Well, John, you must let me run. Yes, yeah, sir. Take a flower. Thank you, Flory. The show must go on, you know. Bless you. Oh, good evening, Mr. Skye. Flory, they have a carnation. Yes, sir. Two shillings, sir. Mm-hmm. Here you are. Pin it on for you. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful about your play, Mr. Skye. It's been a wonderful run. But then Mr. Drury does know how to pick them. Yes, yes, it does. Uh... Looks as if it might run forever, doesn't it? No matter what he's in, they all come to see him. Not that yours isn't a wonderful play. Mr. Drury gave me a ticket for the second night. Oh, it... He's always so thoughtful. Oh, what'd you think of it? I thought it was lovely. I cried ever so. When Mr. Drury came back with only one arm and found his fiancée with that other fellow at the cocktail party. Exactly. I will rest on my laurel. That was a beautiful curtain line you gave in there, Mr. Skiles, and the way you put it over. Yes, there's no one like Drury to put over that kind of line. Good evening, Flory. Oh, good evening, Mr. Skiles. Better Largo. <laughs> oh, good morning, oh, Molly. Sheridan, hello. It's oh, good to see you. It's been months. <laughs> Look who's here. <laughs> New York's rising drama. Oh, no, don't, don't. Have you seen it? I, I sent you tickets. Yes. Kind of you to think of us in your busy life. Yes, we saw the show. Oh, I know, I know. But well, like a fool, I signed a contract without a controlling clause. And by the time Drury and his producer had finished knocking the script around, there wasn't... Oh, John, much... it's a shame. Now, look, let's forget the play and go have a drink together, shall we? Oh, sorry, oh, but we have to think of our reputations, you know. <laughs> Good night, John. Come along, Terry. John. Well, John, it was a good play. How under any circumstances could you have let them do this to it? Come along, Sherry. Good night, John. Yes. Good night. Good night. Ah, hi. Almost full court. That ought to do it. Feel all right, Mr. Scale? Yes. Perfectly. Good. Now we'll throw you out of here and go to work. The doctor ushered me out of the room onto the stage. I saw him disappearing around the screen with a flagon in his hands as I closed the door. Just as I thought. There were the reporters waiting. I sat down. I, I, I felt weak, not, not right at all. 
Uh, Mr. Scales, how is he? Yes, Will they... he live, do they think? Well, they think he may. They're giving him a transfusion. Oh, it's your blood. Oh, what a story. No, please don't use that. Oh, yes, we know how you feel I, about all. I'm just doing what anyone else would do. He was my friend. I owed him everything. Well, of course, but you're a hero. You don't know how people feel about Garrett Drury. Don't I? Oh, incidentally, Mr. Scales, we hear you sold this queen right to the Oh, no, no, not yet. Yeah. It was, uh, well, we've been talking it over tonight. But if anything happens to Mr. Drury... You mean you we won't sell them? Huh? If anything happens to Gary, Bitter Laurel will never be performed again. My hands were wet and cold, and I could feel the perspiration running down my back. My head was light, and I, I seemed to be walking on air. The voices of the reporters were distant and indistinct. I felt the sudden need to lie down, to rest, sleep. The door to Gary's dressing room opened, and I saw the doctor standing there. His face and his voice were blurred. I, will you come, please? What is it? He uh, complaining of a pain in his back. He did almost immediately. We started the transfusion. He's, he's asking for you. Of course. I don't understand it. I don't understand. We all did our best. So much hemorrhage, shock, cardiac strain. It's always a gamble, you see, when the operation is left so late. Sometimes there is a particular idiosyncrasy. I should have preferred a direct test, but that's no good if the patient dies while you wait to make sure. Mr. Drury. Oh, Mr. Drury. What is it? Where's Bran? Oh, his son? No, no, he's yeah. understudy. He'll be here in a minute, Mr. Drury. They're waiting. Bran. Fetch Bran. The curtain must go up. Oh, I don't understand it. This, this, yes, this. yes, he's dead. Why did he die, Doctor? Blood transfusion, but I don't understand it. Mr. Scales is a type 4 universal donor. Still, there are sometimes personal idiosyncrasies. Yes, I... I caught Walter's gaze and followed it. He was staring fascinated at the plate, which still stood on the table. The rose. That one there that smudged from the firing. I remember noticing it. was originally on my right. Now it's on my left. Ridiculous. You did it. You turned the plate around. Because you knew that my blood would save him and that you... Oh, don't be a fool, Walter. I lost everything by his death. Why, why should I want him dead? You hated him. I've known I've seen it all the time. Because of the play. Oh, you killed him. Don't be a fool. Oh. You fantastic. What coroner? Coroner's... Oh. 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 What coroner? Oh. 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 It happened. There. The roaring in my ears. The spastic constriction of my stomach. The room began to teeter and twirl. I staggered toward a chair. Yeah, I, I can hear the doctor faintly as though from a long, long way off. What's the matter? What's the matter? Uh, mm. Easy now. It's shock. No, no, you know, here. Here, my... My side, where... Where the car hit me. Where? Well, show me. Just here. Good Lord, man. Why didn't you tell us? You're hurt. Walter, yes, sir. tell them to bring in the stretcher from the ambulance. Quickly, man. Yes, sir. It's ironic. <laughs> uh, when the car hit me, it, it, it was an injury to the spleen. <laughs> the spleen, think of it. <laughs> so you see, all the time I was giving Gary blood for a transfusion, I was bleeding to death inside myself. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? Death from shock and loss of blood. They, they gave me a transfusion, too. Too late. But I wouldn't have to die, they said. I, I would have lived if, if I hadn't given my blood to kill Gary Drury. <laughs> Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Joseph Cotton. Simmer down, Harlow. No more of those explosive riddles. I'm exploding with good news, Hap. The news that Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants, coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. 
All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Cary Grant. The play is called Salvage, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Blood Sacrifice was adapted for radio by Malcolm Meacham from the short story by Dorothy Sayers. Joseph Cotton may currently be seen in the Carol Reed production, The Third Man, a David O. Selznick release. You can buy Autolite Stafel batteries, Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. and its 96,000 dealers present Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's star, Mr. Van Johnson, in Salvage, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Happy Easter, Mr. Wilcox. Thank you, my happy hackster. Say, that motor sounds sweet as an Easter sonnet. Mission-engineered Autolite spark plugs, no doubt. Yes, sir. I just had it tuned up for the Easter parade. Well, you know, Autolite Ignition Engineers, a complete line of spark plugs, including regular, transport, aviation, marine, and the famous Autolite resistor spark plug. The spark plug that offers four big advantages to car owners everywhere. Go on, Mr. Wilcox. We're right in the middle of the Easter parade now. Well, wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs give greater gas savings, faster starts in cold weather, smoother performance. Even double life under equal conditions compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. Every advantage a winner. And it's all because of the 10,000 ohm exclusive Autolite resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug to make practical a wider initial gap setting. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Salvage and the performance of Van Johnson, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. So it's gone up in smoke. Oh, I'm not complaining. Maybe $400,000 seems a little steep. A week ago, I would have said four hundred grand was a lot of money to light a cigarette with. But it's funny the things you find out, the things that are really important when you're about to die. <laughs> She came in without knocking and sat down on the edge of my rooming house bed, and it was so quiet you could hear the springs creak, both of them. I went on packing my suitcase after a quick look for the changes marriage sometimes makes in a woman. I found none. She was still as approachable as a park bench. She sat there watching me, and suddenly I realized that love can be as close to hate as the two sides of a thin dime. Going somewhere? No, I just pack a suitcase to keep in training. Someday I may have to skip out in a hurry. Miss me? Beat it. I'm busy. <laughs> Just as I thought. You still love me, Danny. Deep down. What did you come up here for? To excavate? No. Thought you might be interested in a job. Any job you could offer me wouldn't pay enough. It might. Then my income tax would be too high. Beat it. It's a job flying a plane. Whose plane? If you're interested, you can get the details tonight. All I know is that there's good money in it, and it's temporary. What isn't? Are you interested? Where do I get the details? How about Mike's 59th Street for dinner? Eight o'clock? I'll think it over. You always said you like adventure better than money. I never said that. I like them both. Well, you get them both if you get this job. If I get it, who will I be working for? My husband. Who else? Miss 
Mr. and Mrs. Wendell H. Davis arrived at Mike's a little after nine. He was the kind of a good-natured, back-slapping, hand-shaking guy that dogs rub up against and children eat spinach from. Ah, oh. <laughs> sorry we kept you waiting, Connor. Just couldn't help it. You know, unexpected business. Forget it. You know what I think, Connor? There are only two kinds of people in this world. Those who are always waiting for something, and those who keep them waiting. <laughs> uh, how about something to eat? It can wait. What's the deal? The deal? Oh, of course, of course. Gloria thinks you can handle a certain job, Connor. It's a flying job. I can handle it. That's what I like to hear. Confidence. Nothing like confidence in yourself. Where did you learn to fly? The United States Navy. You don't say. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. I was in myself back in the First World War. Got myself assigned to as trim and see where the desk as you could find in Washington. <laughs> How long are we in? Four years. Four years? You don't say. Can you navigate? Sure. The United States Navy likes to know where it's going. All right. The job's yours. If you don't mind, Mr. Davis, I'd like to know what kind of a job it is. You'll be working for the Intercontinent Salvage Corporation, an enterprise incorporated under the laws of the state of New York. Are you satisfied? What are you going to salvage? Gold. That's nice work. Is there money in it? <laughs> Is there money in it? <laughs> Say, this fellow's killing me, Gloria. <laughs> I wonder if that would quiet you a little. We're in business, Connor. To salvage gold from the ocean bottom. Tell me, do you know what a galleon is? Sure. Four quarts. <laughs> All right. Now, this is a serious business matter, Connor. If you aren't interested, just say so. A galleon is an old Spanish sailing vessel. What of it? Galleon's the kind of a boat the Spaniards used to use to send gold back to Spain. Now, here. See this map here? The circle takes in Cuba and the Bahamas. Right in here, they went down by the dozens, gold and all. Sometimes pirates sunk them. Sometimes they hit a hurricane. But the gold is still there. Billions. Billions. <laughs> Some of the places marked here actually show latitude and longitude. If the stuff is located so exactly, why hasn't it been salvaged till now? Oh, plenty of it's been salvaged already. You don't hear about it because the government has a habit of taking such big cuts that most salvage work is kept secret. And some of it's a little harder to get at. Why? Oh, just little things like hurricanes, sharks, poison coral, sometimes island savages. But Intercontinent is going down after that gold on a big scale, legitimately. I see. You're making it a big business. Exactly. We're a stock corporation with almost a half a million dollars invested capital. And where does my job come in, exactly? Now, Connor, do we have to discuss all the details right now? Gloria's hungry. You're so right. I'm hungry, too. Let's relax and eat and forget business for a while, huh? No, let's not. All right. Have it your way, Connor. Briefly, there are three parts to it. The first is to do as you're told. The second is to keep your mouth shut. And the third is to fly an airplane. That's simple enough, huh? How much does the third part pay? It's not piecework, Connor. The whole job pays 10000 So far, so good. Your job is to scout the area ahead of the salvage vessel. The only way to cover that much water is with an airplane. Does that satisfy you? There was something about Wendell H. Davis and Intercontinent Salvage Corporation I didn't like. And when I saw the tub charted by Intercontinent, I liked it even less. It was built back in the 90s. Her original boilers had long since been replaced with a pair of pocket-sized oil burners. There was nothing left of her bright work, and the varnish had peeled off topside. She didn't look safe enough to sail in a fish pond. The last thing to go aboard her was the plane. A war surplus job Davis bought from somebody who had picked it up cheap from war assets. It was fitted with pontoons and extra gas tanks, and I took it up to the Cape and back on a trial spin with Wendell H. Davis accompanying me. Think she's good enough to fly non-stop across the Gulf of Mexico? The Gulf of Mexico? You ought to brush up on your geography. Just answer my question, Connor. Don't worry about my geography. My geography's fine. And your sense of direction's not so good. We're not going that way. Answer my question. If you want to fly the Gulf of Mexico, I guess you'll oblige. We were going out on the 11 o'clock tide that night. It was after 10. Behind me on the after deck, I heard a soft step in the darkness. Gloria. I'm going to kiss me goodbye. Seems we're always saying goodbye. I'll miss you, darling. Save it for your husband. I was just thinking of saying goodbye to him myself. What do you mean? This job I don't like. I don't think this tub can even get out to sea. What are you worrying about? There's a plane on board. I still don't like it. What don't you like about it, Danny? Mostly Wendell H. Davis. I don't think he's the good-natured, back-slapping guy he seems. It's a long trip. 
Something might happen to him. An accident. An accident? You heard what he said. Hurricane, sharks, poison coral. If you didn't want somebody to come back, it'd be easy. You'd be sitting pretty if he didn't come back, wouldn't you? We would, Danny. Together. Is that why you got me this job? Because I love you and I know you still love me. We would never have to say goodbye again. This would be the last time. I'll be waiting for you, darling. She walked away. There was a smile on her face like a cat that swallowed a bowl of cream. I stood there. Everything was the matter with this setup. My smiling employer, whom I didn't trust, a tub of a ship to sail in, and a plane that wouldn't have passed inspection in World War I. And Gloria, whose real name was Trouble. What sense was there to taking a job like that? No sense. Maybe that's why I took it. Autolite is bringing you Van Johnson in Salvage. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Get any Easter eggs, Mr. Wilcox? Eggs? Yes, sir. Half a dozen assorted colors. And what do you think was in them? Uh... You're right. You're right. A set of wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs. The newest addition to the complete line of regular transport aviation marine resistor and model spark plugs. Ignition engineered by Autolite. And man, you should have heard those proud beauties all firing in perfect order after I had them installed in my car. The Easter Bunny was sure good to you, Mr. Wilcox. Sure was, because those wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs give every car owner greater gas savings, smoother performance, faster starts in cold weather, even double life as compared to spark plugs without the built-in resistor. And it's all because a 10,000 ohm exclusive Autolite resistor is built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug. This makes practical a wider initial gap setting, the advantages of which have long been recognized by automotive engineers. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn out spark plugs with ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Van Johnson, in Salvage, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. When the tub went out on the 11 o'clock tide that night, I was on it. I kept thinking about Gloria and why she got me that job. I kept wondering if the tub could stay afloat. I kept wondering why Davis asked about flying the Gulf of Mexico. And then I found something else to wonder about. It took me a couple of days to realize that there was something funny about the crew. There were six Chinese who slept below deck aft, and none of them could speak English. The cook was a Korean, and this conversation consisted of a wide grin. The three deckhands were fresh from Portugal. The mate was a sullen German, and the captain was almost completely deaf, and a boozer besides. It took me a couple of days, but suddenly I realized what it was. There wasn't a man in that crew I could talk to. See anything of Mr. Davis? Uh, uh, the big boss. I uh, I sneeze. Look, you don't have to talk my ear off. Just answer yes or no. Listen, you're the mate on this tub and we're off our course. I tried to tell the captain, but he's so tanked up he'll be in Galapagos before his head clears. Hey! Oh, nuts. <laughs> I beat it into the radio cabin. The operator ought to be told we're off our course. I opened the door and saw the operator at his table, earphones clamped on. He looked around at me and I stopped dead. The operator in the radio cabin was a skinny, red-headed kid with a frightened look on his baby face. The only one in the crew who could speak English was a badly frightened kid. Hello. My name's Connor. I'm the pilot for that crate out there. Mine's Scott. Come on in. I can get in. This cubby hole must have been built to hold a captain's toothbrush. What I wanted was to, to check the time from Arlington. Sure. They'll be on in a few minutes. You're not exactly an old sea dog, are you? Well, this is my first job. You look nervous. Well, I... I want to make good, but I... Anything wrong? Do you know exactly where we are? 
Somewhere along the coast of Florida. Why? What's the latitude and longitude of where we are now? Well, let's see now. The, the latitude is about 30, and the longitude is around 78. That's right. So why does Mr. Davis tell me to send a message that our latitude is 25 and longitude is 72? What? We are within 500 miles of there. Why does he want anyone to think we are? I wonder. Did you see the diving equipment? Yeah. I once saw some divers work. This stuff is no good. That's what I thought myself. I wouldn't wear it in a bathtub. I hate to think of anyone going down in it. Maybe nobody has to go down in it. Huh? Maybe nobody was ever supposed to go down in it. What do you mean? Maybe this whole trip is a fake. Fake? Maybe what Wendell H. Davis is doing is skipping with the money invested in Intercontinent Salvage Corporation. That would explain everything. A broken down tub that's going nowhere. A crew that asks no questions. A, a plane that's meant to fly Davis out of the country while this tub is reported 500 miles from here. Oh, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not supposed to send false information when I know it's false. You might get yourself in a lot of trouble, Scotty, if you don't. You're right. But I ought to do my duty. Report our position accurately. And that's what I'm going to do. The dirty little rat. Get the plane started, Connor. He was just a scared kid. Get the plane started. Just a kid worrying about his first job. You heard me, Connor. Get the plane started. I looked down. There was blood oozing under my shoe. I looked at the table at the dangling earphones. Then I went out with Davis following me, the gun trembling a little in his pudgy hand. He got a black valise like bank messengers carry out of his cabin. On deck, the crew got steam on one of the winches. They freed the boom, and Davis climbed into the plane beside me. I turned on the ignition. We bobbed on the water and taxied for a minute to find the wind and warm the motor. We gathered speed like a roller coaster, the waves slapping at the pontoons. I climbed to about 3,000 feet and leveled off. The gun was still pointing at me. Throw that gun away, Davis. Keep flying. Where to? About ten miles south of Tampa. My wife's waiting to be picked up. We rented a beach cottage there a couple of weeks ago. Are you sure she's waiting? <laughs> That's the trouble with you, Connor. You don't trust women because you don't understand them. A woman has no sense of justice, like children and madmen. You can't hold them responsible for anything. <laughs> maybe she's waiting, maybe not. And after that? Across the Gulf. When do you pay me? When we land in Mexico, safe. Look, Davis, as long as we're both in this plane, anything that happens to me happens to you, too. So we're not going to land anywhere till you throw that gun away. When we land in Mexico, you'll get your money. What's the matter? Don't you trust me? How much is in that bag? All the assets of Intercontinent Salvage Corporation? Four hundred grand. A lot of fish to toss, toss to the sharks. Sharks? Down there. Big enough to swallow a guy like you in one gulp. Which goes into the drink? The gun or you? The gun stays where it is. Okay. We climbed to 6,000 feet. I looked at him and his hand was steady, the gun still pointing at me. I cut the throttle and we drifted a moment and lurched and nose straight down. The wind screamed louder and louder past the wings. I looked at Davis again. He was pale, but his hand didn't move an inch. At 1,000 feet, it twitched. At 500, I stopped breathing. The plane was twisting out of control, the water coming at us like a tidal wave. At 300 feet, I threw open the throttle. The plane floored for altitude, but the wind was hitting it like a pneumatic drill, trying to crack it wide open. It was a miracle that I leveled off. All right, Davis, you win. I... I could have told you. I always do. You don't know how close you came to being wrong. I almost lost control. We almost hit the water like a tub of cement. Yeah. For a minute there, you looked kind of worried. It's easy to make a mistake about someone like Wendell H. Davis. He looked like a good-natured, back-slapping guy until you get a close look at those gray, murderous eyes. the dark beach with the dimmed lights of a car. I brought the plane down on the water and taxied as close as possible. I climbed out with Davis behind me. We waded in. He was grinning as Gloria came toward us. Ah, got a rented car? Sure. Got in Tampa, like you said. Well, start it. I don't like flying with Connor. He almost spilled me in the drink. 
He might try it again. Is this where I collect, like that frightened kid in the radio cabin? What's happened? The less a woman knows, the smarter she is. Start the car. You won't get away. When that tub is found, you'll be wanted for murder. Me? Why? I, I couldn't kill him. I don't even exist. And neither do you. What do you mean? The captain will swear this plane was up scouting ahead of the salvage vessel when it crashed into the sea, and both of us were lost. You paid him? Enough, so he'll stick to his story. We were over a bad stretch, no chance of finding us. Little things like hurricanes, sharks, poison, coral, even savages. So you had your disappearance from that tub all planned. You don't look happy, Connor. That's too bad. I like to see a man die happy. <laughs> I stood there, paralyzed. She tried to hold onto his arm after knocking it aside. Blood was crawling down her face. He wrenched his arm free and she sank down on the beach. I don't know how I got to him, but I heard the crushing sound as I hit him. I could feel his nose spread under my fist like unbaked dough. The gun dropped from his linked fingers, but I didn't stop to look. I threw myself at him. His heels kicked up in my face and I stepped back. The look on his pudgy face was more astonishment than pain. He sank to one knee and tried to get up and fell. He lifted his head like a lizard in the sand, but there were no more words before it dropped again. She was still firing the empty gun at him. I took the gun gently from her hand. I lifted her head, smoothed back her hair. You dead? Dead enough. Just, just put your head back. Everything's blurred. You'll be all right. That yes. shot just sampled your skin. Just a superficial wound, that's all. If I killed him. I thought when you got me that job, you'd know that what payoff would be. I was all wrong about you. You risked your life for me. Oh, my, my, my head's spinning. Oh, you're going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right now. <laughs> Once we get across the gulf, just as he said, he doesn't exist. The plane fell into the sea while scouting ahead of the salvage vessel. The captain will swear to it. Your late husband bought us our freedom, paid for it himself. <laughs> Gloria. Gloria. <laughs> she blacked out. I thought of getting her a doctor right away, but that would be too risky. It was just a superficial wound, mostly shock. I tore off part of my shirt and wet it at the water's edge. I washed the blood from her hair and face and bathed the wound. I lifted her gently in my arms and carried her out to the plane and made her comfortable. Then I went back to Davis. I searched him, but he wasn't carrying anything. No identification, just a claim ticket on an express office in Mexico City. I took it, and I got his body into the plane and climbed in after him with the black bag. I turned on the ignition and the plane moved out into the gulf. I got rid of everything in my own pockets, everything that could identify me just to be safe. All I kept was an old cigarette case with no initials, a pocket compass, and the express ticket. Then I began prying open the lock in the black bag. I felt good. The strange feeling of being completely detached from the world down there, free of it. To them, I didn't exist anymore. A hundred grand could make a world of its own, a world for just Gloria and me. A bright moon rode between broken patches of cloud as I got the lock open. I stared in. I heard myself breathing hard as if somebody else was grinning over my shoulder. The bag was filled with strips of newspaper. I don't know how long I stared straight ahead like a blind man. I heard Gloria murmuring coming out of it. I grabbed her arm. The money. It's not in that bag. That black bag that's fake. Oh, he told me just before he sailed what he really did with it. Told him. you what? Didn't tell me till just before he sailed. Didn't trust anyone. Not even me. Afraid I might double cross him. Told you what? Where is it? He's carrying an express ticket. An express uh, ticket? That's why I was waiting for him at the beach cottage. What's the express ticket for? Where are we then? Are you taking me to a doctor? We'll get to a doctor, don't worry. What's the express ticket for? Uh, trunk. Mexico City Express Office. More money's in it. The express ticket? Then everything's okay. Uh, that ticket's worth 400 grand and we've got it. We've got it. Where, where are we, darling? Oh, don't worry about a thing, darling. Once we get across the gulf, everything will be all right. Gulf. Now, don't worry. I'll get you to a doctor as soon as we get across. You blacked out, but it was only a shot, just a superficial wound. Turn back. I got you into the... Turn place. back, Danny. What's wrong? We'll be across the gulf. Did you hear me? Turn back. Now, look, darling, get a hold of yourself. For heaven's sake, listen to me. Turn back. What's wrong with you? I'm doing this because I love you. You want to risk a murder charge? You can't prove you killed him to save me. You! You think I cared what happened to you? I did it because I hated him. Because he killed... Who? 
You don't mean Scotty. Turn back, please, for the love of me. What's that poor kid got to do with you? Oh, poor kid. That baby face would fool anyone. It always did. We once had a dancing act together. I got in the job on that tub. Job? We had it all planned. It was so simple, we thought. All we had to do was switch black bags, and once he took my husband across the gulf, Something's wrong. That first night out, Scotty drained the extra gas tank. He left enough gas to take this plane about halfway out over the gulf. He... Third night, Gloria was completely out of her head. It was horrible. You were in pretty bad shape yourself when this freighter picked you up. By the seventh day, I gave up all hope. Till then, I figured I had a chance. Maybe maybe one chance in a thousand. <laughs> chance worth 400 grand. You made it. If you kept quiet about that express ticket... <sighs> there is no express ticket. I found a soaked cigarette in my case. It didn't take long to dry. So I had a cigarette. <laughs> but no match. Till I remember the compass in my pocket. A compass? With a little magnifying glass on it. You know how the sun's rays through a glass like that can set fire to the paper? And I had a piece of paper. Just one piece. That express ticket? I didn't touch it. Day after day, I clung to that one chance in a thousand for seven days. Seven? Well, we picked you up on the seventh day. You mean just before we... <laughs> like I said, I'm not complaining. That cigarette sure felt good. Felt like a million dollars. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Van Johnson. What a parade. I'm sorry it's over. Over? Why, my merry man of motors, the Autolite Parade is never over. It's a parade of over 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants, coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye steel beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite Original Factory Parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Dan Daly. The play is called Six Feet Under, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Salvage is an original play written for radio by Sidney Rensall. Van Johnson is appearing on Suspense by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Irving Berlin Technicolor musical Annie Get Your Gun, starring Betty Hutton, Howard Keel, and Louis Calhoun. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Arthur Godfrey and Agnes Moorhead. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Dan Daly. You can buy Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite faithful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. Join in the fight against a killer which claims 562 Americans each day. Strike back at cancer by giving a generous contribution to your local committee of the American Cancer Society. Mail your contribution to Cancer, care of your local post office. Do it today. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Dan Daly in Six Feet Under, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Harlow, did you know that in the springtime, a young man's fancy turns to... The world-famous quality and performance of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs? Well... Autolite, you know, is the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. And when you come right down to it, who knows more about the best spark plugs for your car than Autolite ignition engineers? The men who design coils, distributors, and all the other important parts that go to make up the complete automotive electrical system. Why, it's the skill of the same Autolite ignition engineers that made possible the practical development of the Autolite resistor spark plug, the greatest advancement in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Have you no sentiments about spring? Sure, Hap. Spring into your car tomorrow and see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with six feet under and the performance of Dan Daly, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. You'll never know what it's like down there. You're six feet under ten hours a day without food or water. With that light on your face so the yokels can pay their dimes and stare down at you. It's like being dead, only you know what's going on. The pump that feeds the air down to you seems to be keeping time with your heartbeat. And you can't help thinking that if it ever stops, the heartbeat will stop with it. You get a lot of time to think down there. To think of all the things that can happen. And when the show closes for the night and they dig you up, you head for the nearest bar to forget all the crazy things you've been thinking. Yeah, what will it be? Double whiskey beer chaser. Hey, you with the carnival? Yeah. Must be interesting. What do you do? Got a sideshow. Fill this up, will you? Sure. What's your trick? Sword swallower? Now I roll over and play dead. Oh, you're the guy that's buried alive. Yeah, I saw you this afternoon at the matinee. Took the kids over. Yeah? What are you raising? A couple of undertakers? Oh, I didn't take them into your tent. Seemed kind of a morbid thing for kids. But not for you. Huh? What do you mean? Skip it. How about hitting this glass again? Okay. Now that people see that act of yours, the tent was crowded. I kind of thought it'd be different. How different? Paying a dime ahead just to look down at you through that glass. It's not a bad racket you got there. Yeah, big, fat, happy racket. Not tough like standing behind a bar and breathing and eating and moving whenever you want to. Well, if you think it's so hot, dig yourself a hole and pull up a cough and nobody's stopping you. If you want another drink, call me. Just leave the bottle. I'm still alive. I can pour my own. Suit yourself, Fred. They were all the same. They paid a dime to look at you down there. But if they saw you later above the ground, they acted like you were cheating them. Like you owed it to them to stay buried or they weren't getting their money's worth. I used to do another act. A juggling act. An act that took me years of sweat and practice to learn. But nobody came to see that. You had to learn a dog's trick to make a living. You had to trust people. People you wondered about. Hello, Jack. Get I'm lo- looking for you. Go on, get lost, Cliff. Don't follow me around. Miriam sent me out to find you. She knows where I am ten hours a day. That's more than most wives know. If Miriam was my wife. I'd spend a little time with her. You spend quite a little time with her as it is, Cliff. Quite a little time. Oh, you're talking through that bottle, Jack. Miriam and I are old friends. Yeah, I heard about it. Lots of times. You were a stage door Johnny when she worked on burlesque, weren't you? I used to laugh about you. That was before you came to work for us. But now I don't laugh anymore, Cliff. Now I wonder. You're drunk. Am I? What's a guy like you doing around a carnival, Cliff? You were a big shot accountant with a good business. And all of a sudden you chuck everything to learn to be a barker for a pitch like mine. And to dig me out of that hole every night. I'm not complaining. Why should you? Because I figure you gotta have a reason, Cliff. I figure that maybe some night you're gonna forget to dig. Oh, you're being ridiculous, Jack. Sure. Only you still haven't told me why you joined the show, Cliff. That's my business. Well, never mind, I'll tell you. Because you're in love with Miriam and it's killing you to see her married to me. All right, Jack, that's part of it. Sure, I love Miriam, but that isn't what's killing me. A bad heart is the thing that's killing me. What do you mean? I chucked my business and joined the show because I've only got about a year to live. Miriam is the only thing in the world I care about. And 
I wanted to be near her. That's a very touching story, pal. What am I supposed to do, break down and cry? Jack, I'd do anything to see Miriam happy. And if it meant killing you, I could do it without batting an eye. Because I've got nothing to lose. I want you to know that. That's good, Cliff. Now we understand each other. Have a drink. I don't want one. Oh, well, this ain't just an ordinary drink, Cliff. This is a toast to one of us. To the guy who buries the other one. For good. It was a fool thing to do. A mistake. Because he'd play his cards closer now. If I told him to pack up and get out, he might take Miriam with him. And I was crazy about Miriam. Something was wrong between us, but I was too crazy about her. I had to know I had to wait and find out if he could take her from me. And that meant I had to keep him around. And every day he'd have me helpless down there in that hole like a baby. I didn't want to drink anymore. I went back to the tent and tried to sleep, but I kept having that same dream over and over again. Not a picture dream, but a dream in sound. The sound of that air pump that kept me alive down there. It got slower and slower, and then it stopped. And I woke up choking. I jumped out of bed. Jack. Yeah. Jack, Jack, is that you? Yeah, yeah, Miriam. You go back to sleep. Is something wrong, Dick? Oh, I had a dream, that's all. Go back to sleep. Oh, well, maybe if I made you... I don't want any hot milk. I'm going out for a while. Jack, I hope you're not... Where would I get at this time of night? I'm not going to drink to save the lecture. You don't have to snap at me like that. That's all you've been doing lately. Have I? Well, nobody's died from it so far. I don't get you at all. Don't you? Well, maybe you're not trying hard enough. I'm going for a walk. Jack! Jack! I walked around the grounds. The moon was doing trick things with the shadows around the tents and the pitch signs along the midway. I loved it. A cheap two-bit carnival, but I loved it. When Miriam and I were first married, I used to dream about owning the work someday. Yeah, I was going to do big things. Clean up with a juggling act, then write the Becker brothers and offer to buy them up. The Ferris wheel, the ride, the whole show. I was going to own the world. But instead... I wound up with six feet of it. They could dig me up out of that hole every night, but I couldn't dig my dreams up anymore. Finally, I went back to my own tent and slept until showtime. Miriam was gone when I woke up, so I walked over to our pitch. I was going to pull a flap and go in, but then I heard her talk on the cliff, so I listened. I can't stand it much longer. He won't have to stand it after tomorrow night. He'll be away from here. Things will be different. You're sure you want to do this for me, Cliff? I want you to be happy. He suspects something. I know him. If he finds out... He won't find out. Not until tomorrow night. And when he does, it'll be too late. He won't be able to do anything about it. You love your wife and you stand outside a tent and hear her planning to murder you. It wasn't only Cliff. It was her, too. And I knew right then what I had to do. I had to kill them. I had to kill the both of them. And tonight, right away. Autolight is bringing you Dan Daly in Six Feet Under. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Hap, who knows more about law than a lawyer? You sure got me this time, Harlow. Well, then, who knows more about the best spark plug for your car than Autolight ignition engineers? The men who designed the complete electrical system for many makes of America's finest cars. They engineer spark plugs just as they engineer coils, distributors, and all other ignition parts to work together as a perfect team. Go on, go on, Harlow. Well, it's the skill of the same Autolite ignition engineers that made possible the practical development of the Autolite resistor spark plug. The greatest advancement in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. And the newest addition to a complete line 
of transport, aviation, marine, and regular automotive spark plugs engineered by Autolite in sizes and heat ranges for every purpose. I guess I've learned my lesson. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood town stage our star, Dan Daly, in Six Feet Under, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Now I knew. It wasn't only Cliff, it was Miriam, too. It was like getting hit in the stomach when you didn't expect it. You love your wife and you stand outside a pit and hear her planning to murder you. I walked around the grounds in a daze. I tried to tell myself that I was wrong, but your own ears can't lie to you. Jack! Oh. Hey, Jack! Oh, uh, hello, Bonnie. Hey, I've been screaming my head off at you. You hypnotized or something? Sorry, Bonnie, I was thinking. Oh, call for Cliff on the phone in the office wagon. You want to take it for him? All right. Hello? Uh, this is Morton at Trans Country Airlines. I have your reservations confirmed. Oh, oh, good. <laughs> Two seats on the midnight plane to Chicago tomorrow night. Th thanks a lot. I know you said you'd come in to pick up the tickets this afternoon, but I wanted to call and let you know it's confirmed. I'm glad you did. You'll never know how glad. <laughs> Just part of our service there. I'll hold the tickets for you. Now, you're going to enough trouble. You can cancel the tickets. <laughs> but I thought I'm changing somebody's mind. Nobody's going to Chicago tomorrow night. Nobody. When you see something coming and you know it's too late to stop it, you get calm. You watch it like it was happening to somebody else. I had to kill them. I had to kill the both of them. Tonight after the show. After they brought me up. I'd have ten hours down there to think of a way. I went into the tent and watched Cliff getting the hole ready for me. I wanted to laugh. Is this all right now? Yeah, that's deep enough. Cliff, okay. I want that speaking tube hooked up today. What's the matter? Getting lonesome down there? I thought you didn't like to talk to the customers. Today I feel sociable. I had a glimpse into the bright and cheery future. Hook it up. You're the boss. Where's Miriam? Getting a new roll of tickets from the wagon. When there's a crowd out there on the midway cliff, Calliope going and the merry go round and all, can she hear my buzzer? Well, why wouldn't she? It's hooked up right from the box to the ticket cage. But you never use it, so what difference does it make? It could make a big difference if nobody was in the tent and the air shut off on me. A big difference. Let's check it. All right, there's a button in the box. Press it. Counter's just outside the flap. We can hear it from here. Are you pressing it? You see me, don't you, Cliff? I, I don't hear anything out there. Neither do I. There's, there must be a, a loose wire or something. No, Cliff. It's the batteries. Because I checked while you were digging and the batteries are gone. Uh, oh, that's right. I, I forgot. When we were moving from the last town, my flashlight went dead. I, I borrowed the buzzer batteries. But you forgot to put them back. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. It slipped my mind. You never used a buzzer, so I didn't think of it. You thought of it when we needed the batteries. Jack, I tell you it was a mistake. That's all. That's the way the midway's opening up. There's no time to start an argument. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be time for that later, tonight. We can talk it over tonight, Cliff. That suits me. Come on. Let's lower the box. All right. I'll go get a new set of batteries. You might as well climb down, slide into the box. I'll cover you when I get back. I lit a cigarette. My hands were wet and shaking. Suppose he didn't wait until tomorrow night. Suppose this was it. I couldn't tip my hand by refusing to go down, but I had to make sure I'd come up again, just this once. He'd be gone a couple of minutes, long enough. I ducked out of the tent and across the midway to the pitch of old Anna, the fortune teller. Oh! Why are you so jumpy about Annie? You like, act like you've been seeing ghosts. I was communing with other world. Save, save that for the suckers. I want you to do something for me. I want you to promise, and I don't want you to forget. Is it evil thing? No, no, Anna, it isn't evil. When we shut down at night, I want you to come over to the tent, that's all. I want you to hang around there until Cliff digs me up, understand? Beware of lower world, Jack. Evil things lurk there. Promise me, Anna. I promise. But let me read your fortune in the cards. It only takes a minute. There's no time. Besides, you read them for me on the train the other night. Was there something there you didn't tell me? 
Are you trying to frighten me with a sucker pitch? There was evil. The death cards were around you. They were all around you. Shut up, you old fool. Just come over to the tent tonight. That's all I want from you. That's all. I had to grab a hold of myself. A crazy old woman with a deck of greasy cards. I've been with tent shows too long to let a thing like that get me. I went back to the tent, got down into the hole and slid into the box. Cliff lowered the narrow view shaft that the customers looked through. I fastened it to the hole just above my face. Then he started to shovel the dirt in on top of me. I could hear it hitting the box. There isn't another sound like it in the whole world. Then it was all done. Cliff looked down at me through the glass, and the smile on his face made me cold. Then he was gone, and I was alone with the sound of the air pump. In a few minutes, the customers started to come in, and it wasn't so bad. If anything went wrong, they'd be able to hear me through the speaking tube, just as I could hear them. Come on, Mother. Come on, look at it. Oh, you look. Give me the creeping wiggle, giggle. Well, you're the one who wanted to come in. Come on, it can't hurt you. Look, you can talk to him right through this here hoop, Nanny. Well, can you hear me down there? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, is it... Well, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> see, just like I told you, there's nothing to it. That's all we see you for our money? Sure, the whole darn thing's a jib. Well, so long down there. We'll all join you someday, sooner or later. <laughs> oh, Dad, what a thing to say. I think they'd give you a little more for your money, though. That's the way it was. Hour after hour, face after face, until all the faces blurred and ran together. Their voices came down with the same questions and the same disappointed wisecracks. But they kept paying and they kept coming. It was getting on to late afternoon because the crowd was beginning to thin out. Everybody would be headed home for dinner by 5.30 and the gang working on the midway would knock off and go to the commissary tent for chow. At 6.30, the crowd would drift back again. The big crowd with the men home from work. And by the time they were gone, old Anna the fortune teller, my insurance policy, would be standing by and Cliff would have to dig me out whether he wanted to or not. I was glad to see the crowd go for a while. It gave me the next hour alone to think and plan things out. Then it hit me. The next hour alone. I'd forgotten that part of it. I looked up. There were no faces in the viewing glass. I felt around with my hand and I found a buzzer button in the ticket cage. I pressed it again and again, but Miriam didn't come. Sure. This was it. They were up there now, getting ready to do whatever they were going to do. Then they'd walk away over to the commissary tent. And they'd eat and laugh. Nobody'd suspect them. It'd be an accident. I tried to think of something else. They wouldn't have the nerve to go through with it. And then I knew I was wrong. Because all of a sudden, there was complete silence. Somebody had cut off the air pump. I twisted and turned, and I pushed against the lid of the box like a madman. But it didn't budge. There was more, more than a ton of earth on top of me. The pressure on my chest increased. I couldn't breathe. Flashes of red and blue color were whirling around in my head. I looked up, gasping for air. And there was a face staring down at me. A child's face. See my baby turtle, mister? What are you doing down there, mister? Kid. Kid, get somebody quick. Go outside and get some help. I'm smothering. Don't just stare at me. Call somebody. You hear me? Stop looking at me. Get somebody. He kept staring at me, his eyes wide and frightened. He moved his mouth once, but he was frozen with fear. And all of a sudden, his face was gone. He was gone. I made one last hopeless try at the lid, and then suddenly I didn't care anymore. I relaxed. All the colors in the world exploded in my head. And then they all ran together. There was a roaring sound, and everything went flat. I came out of it slowly. The pump was going again. The beat of it keeping time with the throbbing in my head. And they were digging for me. I could hear the sounds of the shovels in the earth. And then finally, against the wooden top of the box. There we are, and give me a hand. 
Hey, you all right, Jack? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay now. All right, I'll boost you. Come on, pull uh, up there. It's all right, all right. Lay me on. I'm, uh, I'm all right. Jack, I'm come uh, over to my tent and sit down. There is evil here. I don't want to sit down. Where's Miriam? Where's Cliff? Somebody went for them to the commissary, and they will be here soon. Yeah, soon. But it wouldn't have been soon enough. Lucky thing I spotted that kid running out of here. He's been sneaking into shows. He saw the air pump motor out and back and turned it off while he was fooling around with it. You figure that's the way it happened, huh? Honey, what's the matter here? Jack, what are you on top for? What happened? Take a guess, Miriam. There was an accident. Some kid shut off the motor for the air pump. See, Miriam, that's all it was. Just an accident. Nobody to blame. Jack, I should have been here. Yeah, maybe you should have. You could have kept that kid out of the tent. It would have worked out better. Where's Cliff? Around, I don't know. You could have been killed down there. That's what I figured, too. I could have been, but I wasn't. Don't worry about it, baby. It won't happen again. It won't happen to me again. It was my game now. I was up walking and breathing. It was my game. I played the tender husband. I wasn't going to show my cards now. That came later. When she calmed down, I kissed her. Then I went looking for my last answer. The kid who had turned off the motor. There were kids all over the place, all looking the same, the way kids do. But I'd remember his face. You're bound to remember a face when it might have been the last one you'd ever see. Then I spotted him going into the house of fun. I nodded to the ticket taker and went in after him. I caught him in the room with the tilted floors and grabbed him. Oh, mister! Let me go! Take it easy, kid. You won't get hurt. I didn't do nothing on it. Why'd you turn that motor off? I was just fooling with it and it stopped, that's all. I didn't know what it was. Who told you to turn it off? Stop, kick. Tell me the truth or I'll... Uh, and I'll give you a buck. I am telling the truth. Tell me. Tell me who told you. Stop biting me and tell me. Oh. Oh, tell my pop. He'll fix you. Let me go. I'll let you go when you answer me. What do you want me to say? A man told you to turn that motor off, didn't he? All right, kid. All right. Here's your dollar. I don't want no dollar. I want to go home. I went into town and drank until the show closed down, until I was sure they'd all be asleep. Then I went to the first aid wagon and nosed around until I found what I wanted. A can of ether. Cliff was bigger than I, much bigger, and I had to be sure. I soaked a handkerchief in the stuff, and then I let myself into Cliff's tent. He was lying there, quietly. He was sleeping. He wasn't making a sound. I crept over to him and pushed the handkerchief over his mouth and nose. I held it there. Held his face right into it. He didn't even murmur. And when I let go after a while, his head dropped back. He was out. I picked him up and carried him to the pitch tent. I put him down in a box. And then I shoveled the dirt in on top of him. I left the air pump running. I wanted Miriam to see him down there. Him instead of me. Then I could stop it waiting up for me when I went back together. Well, well, it's about time you got back. I've been worried sick about you. Worried about me, baby? That's silly. I can take care of myself. That accident this afternoon. I'm still shaky. Yeah, I can see why you would be. Jack, there's been something wrong with us. Maybe it's my fault. I want to straighten it out. Everything will be straightened out all right real soon. Come on. Let's go for a little walk. But it's, it's after midnight. I know, but I got a surprise for you. Something I want you to see. What is it? Over at the pitch tent. Come on. She came. I had to hand it to her. She was playing the act of the hilt just like nothing was wrong. I took her arm and held it tight. Good and tight so she couldn't turn and run. And we went into the pitch tent. Well, what's the surprise? It's kind of dark in here. There's enough light down in the box. Go ahead. Take a look. Well, the, the hole, it, it's filled in. Yeah. The show has a new star for a one-night stand. Go ahead. Look. Jack, what the... <gasps> no. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Yeah. How do you like it now? That's the way I was today when that motor cut off. Get him out! Get him 
Oh, oh it's my turn to cut the pump off. Only nobody will be able to fix it this time. Oh, don't you crazy. Sure, I just ripped these wires out and he gets what I, I almost got. You're killing him. Oh, why? I knew, I knew what you were up to. You'll never take that midnight plane tomorrow. You'll never run away with him now. I wasn't running away with him. The tickets were for us. You hear me? For you and me. Well, there you forgot to tell me about it, baby. I couldn't. Cliff was lending us the money to buy the show. He said he'd be mine anyhow someday. I wanted to do it for you because I loved you. Because I hated what's been happening to you down there. Why would he want to help me? Because he loved me, that's why. And he knew you're all I care about. He sent the money for the show to Becker Brothers yesterday, and we were supposed to fly up tomorrow night to sign the papers in Chicago. You're lying. No. Yeah, you, no. you're lying. No. You're lying or you'd have told me. Would you believe me? Would you believe anybody? Do something! Do something! The shovels. The shovels, Miriam. Where are they? Quick. Quick. Help me. Miss Miriam, dig. Dig. Help me. Dig. Dig. That's it, Sheriff. You'll never know what it's like down there. You have nothing to do but think and... Well, you get to thinking crazy things. That's why it happened. And when we got to him, he was dead. I see. Mm -hmm. If you want to have that typed up as a confession, I'll sign it. Isn't much good that it do. A deputy that came in a while ago gave me a copy of the coroner's report. Cause of death, coronary thrombosis. His heart, no strangulation. He was already dead when you stopped that air pump. He was dead even before that, before you give him the ether. You, you mean Jack didn't kill him? Not according to the coroner. Death from natural causes. The, then you're not, you're not going to charge me with murder? You can't murder a dead man, mister. Just like you can't lock a man up for being a fool. Oh, Jack. <laughs> it's all right, baby. You heard him. They can't do anything to me for being a fool. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Dan Daly. Hey, hello. Here's a poem for you. All right. Summer, winter, spring, or fall, Harlow doesn't change at all. Be it day or be it night, Wilcox thinks of Autolite. <laughs> well, you're right there, Hap. Any season is the right season to talk about the more than 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, starting motors, Bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Ray Milland. The play is called Pearls Are a Nuisance, and it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Six Feet Under is an original play written for radio by Joel Murcott. Dan Daly will soon be seen with Ann Baxter in the 20th Century Fox Technicolor production, Ticket to Tomahawk. Buy world famous Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Auto 
Wright and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Ray Milan in Pearls Are a Nuisance, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Mr. Wilcox, what are the batteries for today's game? Why, my beauteous Bobby Sox neighbor, the batteries in today's driving game are the Autolite Stay Full batteries. The batteries that need water only three times a year in normal car use. You don't understand. I Why, mean... certainly I understand. You mean the Autolite Stay Full battery is right in there pitching with day-after-day -day dependability. And you're right in there catching all the advantages of longer battery life. Seventy percent longer average life, in fact, than batteries without the Stay Full features. And this is proven by tests conducted according to SAE life cycle standards. But I mean baseball. Right over the plate, my girl. The Autolite Stay Full battery has three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. That's why it needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Mr. Wilcox, let's get back to... To the batteries. For today's car, it's Autolite Stay Full batteries. The batteries that need water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, friends, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Pearls are a nuisance and the performance of Ray Milland, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. It's quite true I wasn't doing anything that morning except looking at a blank sheet of tape in my typewriter and thinking about writing a letter. It's also quite true that I don't have a great deal to do any morning. But I like not doing anything. It gives me something to do. And I don't like telephone calls that interfere with it. That's why I have two telephones. One, a public phone that I can ignore. The other, a private phone. Which I'd better answer if I know what's good for me, and I do. What'd you say, darling? I said good morning, dear. How oh, are you, darling? Busy? Yes and no. Mostly no. Why? Somebody has stolen Mrs. Penruddock's pearls, and I want you to find them. Stolen pearls? Well, possibly you think you have the police department on the line. This is the residence of Walter Gage. Walter Gage speaking. If you aren't here in less than a half an hour, you'll receive a small parcel by registered mail containing a diamond engagement ring. I'll tell Mr. Gage when he comes in. I went naturally. I even hurried. Ellen's voice has that effect on me. I think it's the way she says... Walter, darling. Yes, Ellen. Mrs. Penruddock's pearl necklace has been stolen. So you said on the telephone. My blood pressure remains normal. It's a string of 49 matched pink pearls that Mr. Penruddock gave his wife on their golden wedding anniversary. Only 49 pearls for 50 years of marriage? I wonder which was the bad year. Oh, shut up, darling. Yes, dear. The worst part of it is the pearls are false. False? Evidently, they were all bad years. Don't be silly, Walter. I have a very simple solution for you. Call the police. Be quiet, darling. Yes, dear. The pearls were real enough when Mr. Penruddock gave them to her. The fact is, she sold them to an old friend of hers in the jewelry business, and he had copies made for her. Those copies had been stolen. Ah. She tells the police Mr. Penruddock sure to find out she sold the real ones. So you've got to get them back, Walter. What does it matter if they were false? Well, she's terrified that the thief will blackmail her when he finds out they're only imitations. Mr. Penruddock might hear of it, and the cat's out of the bag. I begin to see what might be described as daylight. Good. But where do I start looking for these baubles? I know who stole them. The chauffeur we had here a few months, Walter. A horrid big bruiser named Henry Eichelberger. He left suddenly the day before yesterday for no reason at all and without a word. I'm sure he stole the pearls. Uh, how big did you say he is? About six feet. In that case... Three. Uh, three? Six feet three? Three. Oh, I'm sure he didn't take them. Couldn't have. He tried to kiss me once, Walter. Oh? He did? Tried to kiss you, eh? Well, where is this big slab of meat, darling? Here's the address he gave when he first came here to work. <sighs> Sounds like an unpleasant neighborhood. Not half as unpleasant as it'll be for Eichelberger when I arrive. Tried to kiss you, did he? The pearls are the important thing, darling. Mm. And be careful. He's six feet three, remember. I find it difficult to forget. <laughs> Eichelberger's address proved to be a seedy-looking hotel upstairs over a Chinese laundry. At the head of the stairs was a door marked manager. I rang the bell. Full up, bud. Roll. I'm not inquiring for a room. I'm looking for one Henry Eichelberger who, I'm informed, lives here. Uh, down the hall, Jack. 218. Have the kindness to show me the way. <laughs> oh, well, what do you know? A duke, no less. Okay, your lordship. Uh, pick up your feet, eh? Uh, this is it. Uh, he's 
Watch out, eh? Have the goodness to unlock the door. I wish to go in and wait for Eichelberger. Um, uh, two bucks, and I won't even tell Eichelberger when he comes in, eh? That is the deal. Here's your money. Hey. If you hear any noises later on, ignore them. Yeah, uh, sure, sure, eh? I searched all the likely places where he might have hidden the necklace. Then I searched all the unlikely places. No necklace. Then I heard someone at the door. How'd you get in here, Sonny? The explanation of that can wait. I'm looking for one Eichelberger. Are you he? Get you a real comedian. Well, I loosen my belt before you make me laugh. My name is Gage. Walter Gage. Are you Eichelberger? Give me a knuckle and I'll tell you. I'm the fiancé of Miss Ellen McIntosh. I'm informed that you tried to kiss her. What do you mean, tried? I hit him rather severely in the left eye. Then the right. Then I gave him a crushing uppercut to the jaw. He looked at me with an air of patient resignation. Oh, well. And then he hit me. Oh. I bent over and took hold of the room with both hands and spun it. When I had it nicely spinning, I gave it a full swing and hit myself on the back of the head with the floor. I believe I lost consciousness at about this point. At any rate, I was no longer aware of the time of day. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ray Milland in Raymond Chandler's satirical detective story, Pearls Are a Nuisance. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Let's see now. A pinch hitter is a substitute. Ah, but there's no substitute for that famous Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Mr. Wilcox, we weren't discussing those batteries. Why, Dora, they're the batteries for today's game. I mean, car... This power-packed Autolite Stay Full battery has a fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate to hold the power-producing material in place and lengthen battery life. Why, recent tests conducted according to SAE life cycle standards proved that the Autolite Stay Full battery gives 70% longer average life than batteries without the Stay Full feature. Oh, I give up. Nobody but nobody would give up an Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. That marvel of engineering know-how has three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without stay-full features. <clears throat> That's why the Autolite stay-full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. So, friends, see your Autolite battery dealer and have him install an Autolite stay-full battery in your car. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Ray Milland as Walter Gage with Hal March as J. Henry Eichelberger in Pearls Are a Nuisance, a muscular drama replete with situations well calculated to keep you in suspense. While I was thinking about the possibility of getting back to my feet in the very near future, a wet towel began to slap at my face and I opened my eyes. Oh, boy. The face of one Henry Eichelberger was very close to mine. I thought maybe you was killed, Jack. You got a stomach as weak as Chinese tea. Oh, what happened? As if I didn't know. You tripped on any bitty tear in the carpet. Feel like getting up? Oh, thank you, Henry. Uh, may I call you Henry? Oh, no tax on it. You look okay now. Why don't you tell me you were sick? Eichelberger, you swine. That does it. Oh, cut it out, will you? You muss my hair. I wish you'd fall down when I hit you, Henry. Just once. It would work wonders for my morale. You and me could get along, Jack. Uh, look, I never kissed you, girl. Even if I ain't second, I wouldn't like to. Is that all that's eating on you? No, there is another matter. Well, sit down and tell me to score. No, only no more haymakers. They give me a headache. Promise? I promise. Tell me, why did you leave the employ of Mrs. Penreddick? Well, you tell me. Am I what you might call a good looker? Well, well don't Henry... soap me. No. I wouldn't call you handsome exactly, but unquestionably you ate your spinach as a child, if that's a consolation. Get you a real comedian. Well, I lose from my belt. Look, suppose you fell for a doll with stars in her hair. A guy like me that looks like a taxi going down a street with both doors open. And suppose you get a job where you see this doll all the time and every day. 
Uh, no, it's no dice. What would you do, Jack? Me, I, I just quit the job. Ellen? Yeah. Henry, I'd like to shake your hand. Go ahead. Now there's one more thing. I am empowered to arrange for the return of Mrs. Penruddock's pearls, which you have no doubt stolen. Oh, you got nerve, Jack. You think I stole some marbles and I'm sitting around here waiting for a flock of dicks to swarm me. The police have not been told, Henry, and you may not be aware that the pearls are false. False? You mean they're false? Exactly. <laughs> and you think I would bother myself to hook some phonies? You didn't mean to steal the necklace, Henry? No, now look. If they was ringers, I wouldn't be bothered. And if they was real, I wouldn't be holed up in no cheap flop in L.A. waiting for a couple of carloads of bolt to put the sneeze on me. Would I? That is exactly what I thought, Henry. Well, as long as you didn't steal them, how would you like the job of helping me recover them? You kidding? No, Henry. It's obvious that if you didn't snatch those marbles, I believe that's the expression, <laughs> someone else did, and you can help me find them. Now, how about it? Well, why not? Why not indeed? You got any ideas where to start? Yes, I have. I feel that we must, as they say, <laughs> tap the grapevine. When a string of pearls is stolen, all the underworld must be seething. Yeah, well, maybe you got it right. But this underworld that's doing all the seething ain't going to seethe much over a string of glass beads. Or am I punchy? I am thinking, Henry, that the underworld probably has a sense of humor, and the thief who went to the trouble of stealing some worthless trinkets would be the butt of considerable coarse humor. Yeah, there's a nucleus of an idea in that, all right. I would say something like that could get around a pool room and start a little wholesome chuckling, all right? Yes. Now, all we need to do is to locate a reliable crook. Yeah. Let's see, there's a, there's a gay named Lou Scandese that runs the Blue Lagoon downtown might be interested in some marbles, but he don't like being asked questions. He sounds dangerous. Uh, we'll turn him inside out and take a look at his liver. Very well. Let us go and beard this Scandese character in his malodorous den. Yeah. Now leave us do what you said. Mr. Scandese's Blue Lagoon was not difficult to find. It was a rather soiled establishment bathed in an unpleasant blue light. Henry and I went through a small, dim dining room to a door marked private. Wasn't it awful? We didn't even knock. You, Scandese? Who wants to know? Me and my friend here wants to talk to you. Don't talk, I'm listening. It's about some pearls. Forty-nine. Is that right, Walter? Quite right. I don't think I heard about them. Try and remember. Maybe if I pulled off one of your ears, it might help. Oh, well, now, Henry, you seem to be doing all the work. Do you think that's quite fair? Uh, okay, Walter, you work them over. These fat guys bruise so lovely. Look, take it easy. I ain't heard nothing. You guys insurance, man, huh? Give him my card, Walter. Uh, this is my personal card. It has my phone number on it. Okay, thanks. You may be surprised. You may get a call. What do you think, Walter? You think this muzzler is leveling with us? I dare say he wouldn't be above telling us an untruth. I <laughs> get you a real comedian while I loosen my belt. <laughs> you give us a straight good scant easy. Straight goods, absolute. We'll cooperate. I'll bet you get a call. Okay. So long, scant easy. And keep your schnozzle clean if you don't want to be looking for it under your desk. Yes, remember that. What now? I think you've done an adequate day's work, Henry, and the procedure would seem to be for me to go home and wait for the telephone to ring, bearing glad tidings from the underworld. What about me? I would suggest that you wend your way homeward also. Here's my private number. Call me in the morning, after you do your sitting up exercise. <laughs> Get you a real comedian. <laughs> I went home and waited for the phone to ring. I must have fallen asleep after a while. It was quite dark out when the call came through. Well, here goes. Walter Gage speaking. Um, uh, uh, Walter Gage, Acme Insurance Company. Well, when did you become an insurance company? Oh, it's you, Ellen. Well, why didn't you call on the private phone? I didn't have the number handy. You haven't found the pearls yet. How did you know? We just got a phone call. From whom? He wouldn't say. All he said was he heard from somebody named... Uh... Scandese? Yes, that's it. That we were looking for the pearls. Has he found out the pearls are false? No, and I didn't tell him. All right. Now, don't worry. We have an idea how to get them back. We? Who's we? Henry and me. Henry? Henry who? Eichelberger. I've hired him to help me find the pearls. Are you out of your mind? Didn't Henry take the pearls? Of course not. He only left because he was in love with you. Oh, Walter. That big brute. How could you say such a thing? But, Ellen, I thought you'd be flattered. Flattered? I never want to 
speak to you again, Walter Gage. Goodbye. Ellen! Ouch. Women, I sometimes wonder. Oh, honey, I'm so glad you called back. Now, listen, darling. Who are you calling honey, sweetheart? Who is this? Never mind. Your name Gage? Yeah. A guy named Scantese he says you're looking for some oyster fruit. And a frail named McIntosh says you're the guy to talk to. Possibly. Well, uh, I got 49 of them. Pink ones. Five grand the price. I, that is entirely absurd. Those pearls happen to be false. Uh, quit your kidding. You heard me. Five G's. I'll give you until tomorrow afternoon to scrape it together. Then I'll call you and let you know where to meet me. Hello? Ellen, this is Walter. I told you I never want to speak to you again. All right, I won't speak to you. Just tell me the name of the man who sold Mrs. Penruddock's pearls for her. Gallimore. Roger Gallimore. He has a jewelry company down there. Thank you. Walter, darling... How do you like it, darling? I went to see Mr. Gallimore. He was a tall, pink man of about 70, and he listened to my narrative of events with considerable interest. Five thousand seems like a great deal of money for a string of false pearls. Yes, indeed. That, Mr. Gallimore, is why I came to see you. I believe I can hazard a guess as to the reason for such an exorbitant demand. And I further believe that you are in a position to confirm my impression. And what might that impression be, Mr. Gage? I believe that the pearls are in fact real. You were a very old friend of Mrs. Penruddock, perhaps even a childhood sweetheart. When she gave you the pearls to sell, you did not sell them, Mr. Gallimore. Instead, you gave her $20,000 of your own money and returned the pearls to her pretending that they were imitations of the original necklace. Son, you think a lot smarter than you talk. Uh, then I am correct. Embarrassingly so, Mr. Gage. The pearls are real. Now, what would you like me to do? Entrust me with $5,000 with which to retrieve them. Son, it is so long since I heard anyone talk the way Jane Austen writes that it is making a sucker out of you. Thank you, sir. I know that my language is a bit stilted. <laughs> And so, Henry, Mr. Gallimore gave me this check. You mean he gave it to you? 5,000 fish, just like that? You have said it. Kid, you got something with that daisy chain chatter of yours. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. At any rate, all that now remains is for the phone to ring. Aha. You can say that again. Aha. Hello? Gage? Yes, who is this? Yes. You got the money? It's in my pocket at this exact moment. If I have any assurance of honorable treatment, I am prepared to go through with it. Okay. Tonight at 8 sharp, you'll be in Cathedral Park. You got that? Yes. At the end of the dirt road. Be there at 8 sharp. Come alone. No plans, no funny business, no smart work, no slip up and nobody hurt. That's the way we do business. Very well. Oh, one last thing. Where did you get my phone number? From Scandisi? Who else? 8 o'clock then. And no tricks. That is very interesting. What? The telephone. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hooray for Alexander Graham. What's his name? But uh, what did that guy say? Hmm? Oh. Oh, yes, yes. It's all arranged. I'm to meet them tonight all by myself and give them the money. All by yourself, huh? <laughs> Get you a real comedian. Wait till, I, wait till I loosen my belt all by... They'll take the dough and leave you laying there bleeding all over yourself and they'll still have the marbles. I ought to go with you. Henry... It is my duty, and I must brave these monsters in human guise alone and unattended. Of course, I I do have a big car, and you could hide on the floor under a rug. It's a cinch. But maybe... Walter, the only thing wrong with you, as far as I can see, you got holes in your head. All I'm trying to do is keep you from getting another one. I'm going with you. So it was settled. Henry was to go with me. That afternoon, I stopped at the bank. Where I cashed Mr. Gallimore's check and changed it into hundred dollar bills. Forty six hundred, forty seven, forty eight. You counted as though it were your own. Five thousand. Five thousand. Now, a roll of quarters, please. A roll of quarters, please. There's an echo in here. I'll leave them in the wrapper. Mm, quite heavy, aren't they? Yes, aren't they? <laughs> So, late that evening, I found myself in Cathedral Park with Henry Eichelberger, boy, in the back of the car. I was very nervous. I think 
Kenley was also. Neither of us were any too sure of what was going to happen that night. Oh, my back. What's the matter, Henry? Aren't you uh, comfy back there? Oh, I'm comfy, all right. Only my heater keeps digging into me. Ain't we there yet? Uh, we're getting close. Now stay down. This is business. This is the end of the line, Henry. Be careful. They're probably watching me. Okay. What's that? Me, Walter. My gun is breaking my back. Well, stop sitting on it. I did. Anything stirring? No. Keep quiet. I'll make like a little mousy. Don't you think we've waited long enough, Henry? Well, we've only been waiting 15 minutes. You sure this is the place? Yes. Let's get out of the car and see if anybody shoots at us. Then we'll know if somebody's around. That seems to me the difficult way of finding out. But let's try it. As I personally feel sure that there is no one here but you and I. Suckered. You know what happened, Walter? What do you think, Henry? It was just a tryout to see if you'd show. Suckered. I ought to go back and twist that scan deasy so he spends the rest of his life looking up his left pants leg. Well, Henry, what is the next move? Beat it on home, I guess. Anyhow, I won't need this gun anymore. My back is sore enough from it. <clears throat> we stood there and looked at one another, Henry and I. He doubled his hands into fists and shook them slowly in his sadness. I, too, was melancholy. In the brief time I'd known Henry, I had grown very fond of him. Yeah, that's it, all right. Nothing else to do but beat it on home, Walter. That's all is left to us. I took my right hand out of my pocket. I have large hands. In my right hand nestled a roll of quarters I'd gotten from the bank that morning. My hand made a large and heavy fist around them. Henry didn't notice. What are you looking at me so funny for, Walter? I just wanted to say good night, Henry. Huh? You had two strikes on me, and this is the big one. I don't get it, Walter. Oh, oh. He got it then. My fist with nearly a pound of metal in it caught him squarely on the jaw. For a moment, he wavered back and forth on his feet, then... Henry Eichelberger lay motionless on the ground, as limp as a rubber glove. I found the pearls twined around his ankle inside his left sock. Well, Henry, I said, although he couldn't hear me, you are a gentleman even if you are a thief. You could have taken the money a dozen times today. You could have taken it a little while ago when you still had the gun, but even then, it, that repels you. You threw the gun away, and we were man to man, but still you hesitated. In fact, Henry, I said for a successful thief, you hesitated just a little too long. But as a sporting man, I can only think more highly of you. Goodbye, Henry, and good luck, I said. I put a hundred-dollar bill in his chubby little fist and withdrew. End of story. But how did you know it was Henry, darling? You told me so, little lemon cookie. You were quite sure of it. Well, I know, but you must have had proof of some kind. There was one other minor little detail that convinced me Henry was the guilty party. I gave Scandisi my phone number, but I have two telephones. One is a private line. Only two people had that number. You were one of them. Henry was the other. When Henry's accomplice got in touch with me, he used the phone number I'd given Henry. Not the one I gave Scandisi. You see? Oh, darling. You're so clever. Oh, of course. You may kiss me if you like. Months after Ellen and I were married, we received a letter postmarked Honolulu. It was from Henry. My dear Walter, due to the bulls finally putting the squeeze on me, I have only just received the joyous tidings that you and Ellen are embarked upon a happy tide of holy matrimony. I am so glad for you. I often think of you, Walter, particularly with an overwhelming curiosity as to what it was you struck me with that night. Oh, well... I dare say it can only be conjecture on my part now. A hammer, perhaps. At any rate, I entertain no feelings of ill will toward you. On the contrary, I am indebted to you greatly. The ease with which you talk, Mr. Gallimore, out of $5,000 has changed my life. I have been taking English lessons myself, 
And I'm now practicing on a wealthy widow woman, not without financial success. Ah, too surely, sport. Devotedly, Henry. P.S. Was it perchance an anvil? I wonder. You know, Henry wasn't such a bad fellow. All I really disliked him for was his barbaric English. Now he's changed that. Maybe I should have married him. What do you think, Walter? Get you, a real comedian. <laughs> Wait till I listen to myself. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Ray Milan. Mr. Wilcox, what's your batting average? Very high, Dora. 400, as a matter of fact. You see, I'm batting in Autolite's big league of more than 400 fine products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Agnes Moorhead. The play is called The Chain, and it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Pearls Are a Nuisance is an original story by Raymond Chandler, adapted for radio by Ronald McDougall. Ray Milland appears by arrangement with Paramount Pictures, whose current release is Captain Carey, USA, starring Alan Ladd and Wanda Hendricks. Autolite wishes to thank the readers of Radio Mirror Magazine, who have voted Suspense the best mystery program for the second consecutive year. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Claire Trevor, Donald O'Connor, and Charles Boyer. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Agnes Moorhead. You can buy Autolite staple batteries, Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And its 96,000 dealers present Miss Agnes Moorhead in The Chain, a suspense play produced and edited by William. Say, Harlow, whom do you go to? Ignition Engineers. Now, who knows more about the best spark plugs for your car than Autolite's Ignition Engineers? The men who design and build complete ignition systems. Greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. So, friends, go to your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with the chain and the performance of Agnes Moorhead, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. All I did was write a letter, that's all. You can't blame me for what happened. I didn't start it. It came to me and I followed the instructions because I was afraid. Hundreds of people do it every day, so how can you blame me? Everybody in town knows me. They respect me. I've always been a good wife. By the morning it started, I was fixing George's breakfast. 
Not just toast like some women fix, but bacon and eggs and hot biscuits. Down to the road to pick up the mail. Why do you always run for the mail? Are you expecting something you don't want me to see, George? If there was anything I didn't want you to see, I could have it sent to the office. Oh, could you? I didn't know you were important enough to be permitted to receive personal mail there. Leonora, that's enough. Bert Reynolds was appointed district manager. I should have gotten the job, but I didn't. Now, let's forget about well, it. Well, maybe you can forget about it, but Abby Reynolds won't let me forget. She has a high matter to do her work now. She can spend half her day in town, but not Leonora Carpenter. No, poor Leonora is bottled up here without a car, without anything. Here's your coffee. That's all the trouble I've gone to. I guess I can throw the rest of the breakfast out. What was in the mail? Just this letter for you. For me? Who was it from? I don't know, Leonora. I've never opened your mail. Well, you're being me so sarcastic. Oh, dear. From my cousin Emily. One of those ridiculous chain letters. This letter was started by a holy man in Tibet to end all evil. You must make two copies and mail them to others within 24 hours or the chain will be broken. Whoever breaks the chain will meet with evil. A Navy pilot broke the chain and was killed in a crash two days later. <laughs> Such a ridiculous thing. Now, who can I send it to? You can burn it and not send it to anybody. Well, maybe you don't think so, but I think our luck is bad enough as it is. I could send one to Abby Reynolds, of course, but I'd have to sign my name to it. And since you... You're peeved with Abby. She's fortunately spared. Besides, she'd tear it up. Yes, she would. That'd be just like Abby. What's the name of the man they hired? I don't know. Kirch, something or other. Kurchevsky. Peter Kurchevsky. Peter Kurchevsky? You're not thinking of sending a copy to him. Why not, George? Why not? Well, it's absurd. You don't even know the man. I send one to him and he sends one to Abby. He probably won't send it to anybody. But he will, George. He's a foreigner, isn't he? And they're all so superstitious. He'd have to send it to her. He may not even know anybody else. Suit yourself. Need anything from town? No. Time for him to be getting back to the office. It's very early, George. You never used to leave so early. You used to eat a big breakfast. I'm just not hungry. Well, maybe you'll be hungry by the time you get to town. Then you'll have time for a second breakfast at the drugstore. Maybe. You might even meet Miss Holden. She has her breakfast there. Leonora. She's very pretty, George. Not at all like your former secretary. Betty Holden's a very efficient girl. If she's pretty, I've never noticed. Well, notice it, George. Notice it while you're having your second breakfast. I'll see you at dinner, Leonora. He never did. Some wise can't see the signs, but I could. I cleaned up the house spotless the best way I kept it. Then I sat down with the letter. I made a copy and addressed it for Mr. Peter Kachetsky, care of Mrs. Abby Reynolds. Then I made the second copy. Whoever breaks the chain will meet with evil. I hadn't spoken to George about this copy. I sealed it in an envelope and addressed it to Miss. Betty Holden. I mailed the letters and I waited patiently. I watched George's face the next night when he came home. I had all his favorite things for dinner. I even had my hair put up the way he liked it best. Not that he was ever pleased with the things I did for him. I wasn't the one he had on his mind. You're not very good company tonight, George. I find very little to say. I passed your office today. You seem quite animated in there. But perhaps you find this whole conversation more stimulating than mine. We were discussing something that was very embarrassing to me, Leonora. Oh. Why did you send her that letter? Well, it said send two copies, and that's what I did. Well, why Miss Holden? Why not? Because it was a stupid and childish thing. Is that what she said? She's too much of a lady. That's what she thought, and so did I. Oh, you and Miss Holden seem to think very much alike. It's a pity you're not married to her. Yes, Leonora. It is a pity. So it's true, then. You agree that I'm stupid and childish. What other agreements do you have, George? Why do you twist things so? I said... I know what you said. You think I'm deaf, George? I'm not. I'm not blind, either. She's my secretary. That's all. If that's all, then why don't you fire her? For what cause? Because I don't want her there. That's cause enough, isn't it? I'm your wife. Isn't what I want important? Not when it can cost somebody a job without reason. Oh, you're so noble, aren't you, George? But that isn't like you. I know because I live with you. 
You're a liar, George, and I could get her fired without your help. I'll go to Burt Reynolds and tell him... Leonora, if you do that, I'll... Go ahead, go ahead and hit me, George, because the secretary means nothing to you. No. That wouldn't do any good with you, Leonora. You're not worth it. You stay here and talk to me. Where do you think you're going? I'm going out to the guest room over the garage. Where I go from there, I'll decide later. You mean you're going to stay out there? That's exactly what I mean. You want to make a fool of me. You want people around town to listen that you left me. You want them to laugh at me. They'll never know unless you tell them, Leonora. You'll make sure that Betty Holden knows that they'll won't. George! George, come back here. Do you hear me? George! <laughs> It in their faces every time I went into town. The woman is always to blame when something goes wrong. But they didn't know what George was like. I went to town every day with a head to a knot to show them I had nothing to be ashamed of. Thursday was the day Abby Reynolds did her shopping at the Bon Ton. I planned to meet her accidentally. Leonora! Oh, Leonora! I'm so glad to see you. Hello, Abby. I tried to phone you this morning. Oh, well, I've been in town all day. Bert told me to call you. I'm glad I ran into you instead. It's... Well, there's something I have to tell you. We know you meant no but harm. George has been criticizing me to Bert. Why, no, dear. I meant about the letter. The chain letter you sent to Peter Kachetsky. What harm could that do, Abby? None. That's what Bert tried to tell him, but he's a, a very quiet, strange man, and... Well, you see, Leonora, his wife died yesterday. Oh, no. No, Abby. He got the letter a few days ago. No. He can't read English, so he usually brings his mail to Bert. But his wife got sick that morning, and he took her to the hospital. He didn't bring the letter to Bert until this morning. And without thinking, of course... You read it to him? Bert tried to reason with him, but he didn't seem to hear. He just kept staring... Then he turned and walked out of the house. He blames me. He thinks it's my fault. Why did you ever send it to him, Leonora? Why did you pick well, him? Well, I did no harm, Abby. I swear. I swear on my heart. I just mean... You better tell George about it. In case there's any trouble. Yes. Yes, I, I'll tell George. You see, if I'd sent the letter to Abby, it never would have happened. That's what I would have done if she wasn't always trying to make herself better than I was. I wouldn't have been in this if it wasn't for her. I left the barn town and went to the square. The Country Hill bus wasn't due for half an hour. I couldn't stand there, so I walked out of town and across the wooden bridge over the river. The side road was pitted with rust left by the rain, and I, I stumbled and the heel of my shoe broke off. I sat down on a patch of grass and tried to fix it, and then I heard a branch snap in the trees behind me. Hello, Mrs. Carpenter. It was a voice I'd never heard before. But when I turned, I knew the face. Peter Kachetsky. He was all dirty and unshaven, and he had a half-empty bottle in his hand. You afraid, ah, huh, Mrs. Carpenter? You stay away from me. Stay away, do you hear? No. He started for me. I threw the shoe. It caught him in the face and a nail tore dashing for it. I turned and started to run up the hill. I got you. I could see him behind me. He was getting closer and closer, and the house was still a quarter of a mile away. It's a quarter of a mile away. Auto Light is bringing you Miss Agnes Moorhead in The Chain. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. What ignites the ignition system? I, uh, I'll ask the Autolite ignition engineers. And what sparks a spark plug? Uh, that's another for Autolite ignition engineers. If anyone knows spark plugs, it's these same Autolite engineers who design coils, distributors, and all the other vital parts that make up the complete ignition system used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. They really know, eh, Harlow? Yes, sir. And look at the Autolite resistor spark plug they developed. It's one of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Can they talk about spark plugs like you, Harlow? <laughs> sure they can. And your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer can tell everyone listening to this program as much about world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs as I can. No. Sure. 
So go to him and have him replace your worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, for smooth performance and the best in gas mileage, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star Agnes Moorhead in The Chain. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. My lungs were ready to burst. I wanted to scream, but no sound had come. And there was nobody to hear me. Nobody but Peter Kukitsky. He was coming along after me. I heard the ball drop and break. I could see the house now in the clearing through the trees. I started to cry. I couldn't run any faster. I just couldn't. He was almost up to me. He reached out and I, I felt his hand tearing at the back of my coat and then he fell. He fell. I heard him go down, but I didn't send a look. I crossed the clearing, up the steps of the house. I tore the clasp on my handbag to get the key. Well, it was stuck. Kuchetsky staggered into the clearing. I remembered the safety under the doormat. I got it and opened the door. He reached the fourth steps. I slammed the door and locked it in his face. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Go away, do you hear me? Take you me don't get away from me. Nobody wants to help you. You don't get away. I can wait for you. I leaned against the door trying to get my breath. I could feel Kachetsky on the other side of it like a big crazy ape. What did he want to hurt me for? I took a chair and raised it under the doorknob. Then I heard him move. He padded down the porch steps, but he wasn't going away. He was moving around to the back door. I reached to the house. The door was locked. So were the storm windows on the lower floor. I ran upstairs to the bedroom. George's service revolver was in the bureau. I got it. I opened the window. Come down, Mrs. Carpenter. Get off this property. No, come down. Look, I got a gun and I know how to use it. You understand? Will you go? You killed my wife, Mrs. Carpenter. I didn't. I didn't. I never saw. I never you knew her. You actually touched you. I can't arrest him for attempted murder. There isn't even enough evidence for a simple assault. I want that man arrested. Do you hear me? Well, what you want has nothing to do with the law, Mrs. Carpenter. You're supposed to protect people. That's what we pay taxes for. Kachevsky pays taxes too, Mrs. Carpenter. 
You fired a gun at him. If you're smart, you'll drop this. Haven't I the right to protect myself in my own house? In the house, yes. Well, but you were behind locked doors firing at a man out in the open. Oh. If you'd killed him, you'd have been charged with murder. Now, take my advice and don't use that gun again unless somebody breaks but in. But that man is crazy. He's just crazy. If I had a simple mind like his and the same thing happened to me, I might be crazy, too. But I can't locate my husband. I'm alone here. You, you've got to find that man and arrest him. I demand All right, all right, all right. All I can charge him with is trespassing. We can hold him until his fine is paid, and that's all. Well, I don't care what you charge him with. Arrest him. Just arrest him. He may bring counter charges against you. What charges could he bring against me? I've never hurt anybody. I've never done anything to anyone. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Mrs. Carpenter. I uh, like nice people. Goodbye. If you see my husband, tell him to come home. Tell him I'm alone here. I, I don't know what I'll do alone. When we find Kachevsky, I'll call you. to get dark and I sat there listening to every sound. And then it started to rain. I heard it pounding on the roof. It frightened me. If somebody came up to the house, I wouldn't be able to hear them. Seven o'clock came and then eight, nine, ten. I didn't dare light a light. On the floor, I heard a call. George. It had to be George. The headlights flashed through the windows as the car turned into the drive and, and a moment later I heard his key in the lock. Leonora. What's the matter, George? Are you surprised to see me? All the lights were out. I thought you were in bed. Oh, is that what you thought? Is that why you waited so long to come home? Where were you? Where I go is no longer any concern of yours. You were with her. All right, Leonora, I was. For the first peaceful evening in ten years, but not the last. What are you saying, George? I'm going to divorce you, Leonora. I'm moving into town tonight. I'll be at the hotel. How? I won't do to stop you. I know I can depend on you for that. The wife doesn't mean anything to you, George. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what happened today. I know you tried to kill a man with a gun. How do you know that? Everybody knows it. The police are looking for Kachevsky. You have no feeling about what you've done to that poor, confused devil, have you? I haven't done anything to him, the superstitious idiot. All I did was send a silly letter. That didn't kill his wife. I'm sorry she's dead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm no sorry. you're not. You're only sorry because you're afraid for yourself. How can you say that to me? Because I know you, Leonora. After ten years, I really know you. You didn't send those letters the way other people send them. I... You sent them with a curse out of the evil of your heart. You can't kill people with a curse. Which is fortunate for me. I'm not talking about the act, Leonora. I'm talking about the intent. I want to get my clothes. You can't. You can't. I won't let you. All right. I can get others. Goodbye, Leon. I forbid you to leave this house. Get out of my way. No, George. No, I'm your wife. Remember how things used to be with us? They can be that way again, George. Let go of You me. know I can make you happy. Kiss me. Just kiss me once. Get out of my way. No, George. <laughs> oh, don't leave me. <laughs> don't leave me. <laughs> I tried to see, but I couldn't. The rain got heavier. Each time the lightning flashed, I could see the river below. It was beginning to wash over the bridge. A shudder tore loose and started to bang. Hello. 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 Who is it? Lieutenant Marsh at police headquarters, Mrs. Carpenter. Have you found Kachevsky? Yes, the boys brought him in about a half hour ago. I uh, did all I could. Oh, what do you mean? Trespassing is a minor charge, Mrs. Um, Carpenter. Bail was set at $25. Mr. Reynolds just came in and bailed him out. You mean he's free? You let him get away? You've got to send somebody up here. You can't leave me alone if he's loose. I'm sorry, Mrs. Carpenter, but there's a storm emergency besides the bridge is washed out, and I'm tying up the line talking to you. Good night. Here's your party. Hello. George. Oh, George. It's the 
Nora. You've got to help me. Please. They arrested Kachetsky, but Bert Reynolds bailed him out. I know it. Bert told me. You, you know it. You let him do it. You want me to be killed. He took Kachetsky home and put him to bed. But he won't stay there. He's crazy. Oh, come out here, George. I need you. The bridge is out. There's no road over. Well, he'll find a way to get here. Oh, do you want me to go mad, George? I- I'll give you the divorce. I-, I won't fight it. I promise you, George, only don't let me die. You know, you're, you're hysterical. <laughs> it's after midnight. I'll be... Go on, George. Go on. George, please, George. George. <laughs> I was dead. Dead like I was going to be dead. Kachetsky would come. They didn't know it, but I did. The rain stopped, and I sat there listening to the ticking of the clock. It struck one, then two. That was all. It was so peaceful, and I almost dozed off. Something was moving outside. I went to the window and saw the figure of a man turning into the shadows behind the house. I found the gun where I left it under the sofa pillow. I couldn't shoot him until he broke into the house. I walked to the kitchen and waited. There was something with the door. There was a metallic sound. He was forcing something into the lock. And then it clicked. The door swung open. He was framed in the center of it and I fired. <laughs> he fell. I backed through the house. Opened the front door. And started to run. Sea of mud. I knew he was dead, but I could see him behind me, chasing me. I got to the river. It was soft in the flood, but there was a boat coming across. Oh, I just cried with relief. When it landed, I, I ran to it. A man jumped out. Hello, Mrs. Carpenter. Oh! No! No, you're dead! You can't hurt me! You're dead! My Let wife me... is dead, Mrs. Carpenter. Oh. Look at me, lady. Look at my face. I'll give you money. I'll give you money. I won't say anything about you. You can Why get Why you do this thing to me, Mrs. Yes. Carpenter? Oh. What I ever do to my you? Husband. My husband was the one. He told me to do it. I didn't want to. He made you me. You lie, lady. Your husband is good, man. I'm choking Don't you like to die, Mrs. Carpenter? You like to write letters? You like other people to die. Tell me, you must have this wrong. Nobody's for it. You know that, don't you? Who's going to punish I... me later? You? I didn't mean to shoot you up there tonight. I, 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 I thought you were hurt. I was coming down to get a doctor for you. I, I... You, you just came across the river. You, 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 you couldn't have gotten down here before me. George! It was George! I killed George! You kill your husband? I thought it was you. I, I mean, oh, I don't know. You want I to kill know. me, but you kill him. I don't know. Oh. No. You kill I, your husband, I, Mrs. Carpenter. I, I, you kill I, him. I, now they're going to make you pay me. An accident, I tell you, an accident. Run, it was an accident. Mrs. Carpenter. It was an accident. Run. It was an accident. I tell you, I came back here to the house and I found George. I left him just as he was so you could see it was an accident, Lieutenant. I, I, I called you as soon as I got the phone light working. Yes, I see, Mrs. Carpenter. Uh, yeah. Did you get all that on the wire recorder, Chuck? Oh. Yeah. Good, shut it off. <laughs> well, you better get your coat, Mrs. Carpenter. I'm being arrested. On suspicion of murder, Mrs. Carpenter. Oh, but you're making a mistake. All I did was write a letter. And kill your husband. But that was an accident. Why should I kill George? I had no reason. But you did have a motive for killing him. A very strong motive. He left you. He was divorcing you. He was going to marry another woman. And you knew all that before you shot him. But I didn't. I... It's on the recorder. Oh, you don't believe me. Don't worry about me, Mrs. Carpenter. It's the jury you've got to confess. All I did was write a chain letter. Suspense. 
presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Agnes Moorhead. Doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief. Half your test stating my belief that every car owner can be happy if his car is equipped with a set of the world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. So be sure to have your dealer give your spark plugs a spring checkup. Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, starting motors, bullseye, sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Miss Joan Bennett. The play is called The Statement of Mary Blake. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Chain is an original play written for radio by Joel Murcott. Agnes Moorhead may soon be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Cage. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Claire Trevor and John Lund. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Joan Bennett. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite safeful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. 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 and its 96,000 dealers present Miss Joan Bennett in Statement of Mary Blake, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Harlow, where did you get those suspenders? Hap, my envious end man. Those are Autolite Stay Full Battery Suspenders. What queer animals on them? Is that a camel? That Hap is a contented camel with a smile from hump to hump. He knows that Autolite Stay Full batteries are the batteries that need water only three times a year in normal car use. And that's because they have over three times more liquid reserve than batteries without Stay Full features. Wow, what's this dancing dervish doing? He's celebrating his release from camel watering. Just got a new Stay Full battery. This is going to kill me. Do Autolite Stay Full batteries do handstands too? No, on my suspenders they do. Because Autolite Stay Full batteries give 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay Full features. According to recent tests based on SAE life cycle standards. And remember, too, Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. Anything else, Wilcox? Just one more thing. You're always right with Autolite. And now, with statement of Mary Blake and the performance of Miss Joan Bennett, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. <laughs> found myself at the far end of a long corridor, the length of it stretching before me in a winding pattern, the walls of it a thick and pregnable cement. There were no windows, only a small opening high on the wall to my right. Through this, a single shaft of light fell into a pattern which told me there were iron bars on that one small window. At first, it seemed that I was alone in this place. I stood huddled and afraid, unable to move. Somehow I had the feeling that soon I would not be alone. Then faintly, from out of the darkness ahead of me, I heard him coming with slow, shuffling footsteps. The walk of a man who has not long been without his eyes. I saw his cane first, a slim thread of white in the blackness before me. I watched him, tapping up and down in a nervous rhythm. Tapping, coming closer, closer. 
I felt the muscles in my throat tighten in an effort to scream. But I made no sound at all, nor did I move. I just stood there and waited and watched him come toward me. Then in the next instant, his face was caught in the shaft of light, and I saw him very clearly. The searing marks of pain were there, and with them the lines born of brooding and evil. And I looked for a long time at that face, and I found myself wondering if I could see behind those dark glasses, would I find in his sightless eyes any sign of repentance? I remembered suddenly how Gregory Martin had looked the first time I saw him. His tall form standing with casual poise in the doorway. That handsome face creased by the broad smile that bid me welcome into his home. Hello, Miss Blake. Come in, won't you? Thank you. Here, let me take your bag. Thanks. Mrs. Martin isn't here just now, so I'll show you your room. Oh? I think you'll find it very comfortable. In fact, I hope you'll enjoy your life here and your work with me. Oh, I'm sure I will. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed to find myself actually about to work with the Dr. Gregory Martin. Oh. When you've gotten your things unpacked and had the chance to catch your breath a bit, perhaps you'll join me for coffee. Wonderful. Then I'll show you through my laboratory. I felt no fear at all that first day. My room was luxurious and beautiful, and the laboratory is beyond anything I'd ever imagined in its completeness. I didn't meet Lorna Martin during that first day as a member of the household, but in the evening, her husband invited me to join the intimate group of friends that were gathered in front of a glowing fire in their living room. And how about you, Professor? Let me fill your glass. I have my customary toast to make. Yes, my boy, indeed. I want to join you on that one. <laughs> Attention, everyone. A toast. The toast. To the lovely Lorna, a woman of such abundant charm that it's unfair, really, for one man only to call her his. But three years ago, she made her choice, and I found that it was such a commendable one that, that I, for one, think we should forgive her. And so, here's to the lovely Lorna, my wife. I joined in Dr. Martin's toast to his wife, and at the same time studied the faces of the people who were gathered in a semicircle around the room. There was a glint on the glass of one man's pince-nez that gave his face a weird, somewhat supernatural look. He was smiling broadly in the direction of Mrs. Martin, and his teeth and the light of the fire seemed to be made entirely of gold. I looked then at Lorna. She was looking past the others at her husband, and although she was smiling, I, I saw that there were tears in her brown eyes. Beneath her polish and exquisite breeding, she was insecure and afraid. Late that night after the party, I was thirsty, so I put on my robe and went quietly down the carpeted stairs. The big double door that led into the living room was closed, but I could see that a lamp was lit inside the room. And then as I passed by, I heard her. She was sobbing softly. I turned quickly to go back to my room. I didn't want to be placed in the embarrassing position of hearing something I shouldn't. But before I'd gotten out of earshot, I heard her sobbing stop suddenly with a noise that sounded like the flat of a palm hand hitting hard against a cheek. Next morning, I was working with Dr. Martin and loving every minute of it. We worked silently, swiftly, with no regard for anything outside of the task immediately at hand. That is save for one little thing. Dr. Martin seemed fascinated with a little vial of amber liquid which he kept on a desk. Twice he abandoned his work to walk over to it, lift the glass container up to the window and study its contents, his lips forming a strange half-smile. Why, yes. Yes, that's it, of course. What? I, I beg your pardon, Dr. Martin. Were you, you were speaking to me? Oh, no. No, Miss Blake. Uh, talking to myself, I expect. Scientists frequently do, I understand. Yes, I've heard so. <laughs> My formula, Miss Blake. I just realized it's almost the color of her hair, isn't it? Alona's, I mean. My wife has very pretty hair, don't you think? I think Mrs. Martin is a beautiful woman in many ways. <laughs> That's a rather generous opinion to form in so short a time, isn't it? 
Do you always analyze people so quickly and so flatteringly? How about me, for instance? Oh, I don't think you're being fair, Doctor, but since you asked, I'd say you're a man of great charm and certainly a scientist of remarkable ability. <laughs> I should be pleased, I suppose. However, it sounds like generalities. I think I'll have to see what I can do toward creating a more specific impression. Yes. Ah, truly beautiful color, isn't it? I've never seen anything quite that shade of amber. What is it, Doctor? It's a mixture of my own. I'll let you in on it someday, soon. But meanwhile, I'd advise you to keep clear of it. I think I could safely claim it to be the fastest acting poison in existence. A new experiment, Doctor? The most exciting experiment to which a scientific mind can apply itself. And I have every confidence that I'll be able to work it out to a successful conclusion. Sounds challenging, challenging, Doctor. I hope I'll be allowed to work on it, too. I assure you, my dear Miss Blake, I wouldn't attempt this particular experiment without you. Neither of us made mention of his poison again, and indeed it seemed that the doctor had quite forgotten it. We were both working hard on the completion of his current project. Lorna Martin worked with us part of the time, and it was only then that I learned she had previously always assisted her husband with his work. It was in fact Lorna who suggested the final step that led him quickly to the result he had been striving for. We worked from early morning until late at night, and on the third day towards midnight, the project was completed. We had a late supper, and after a glass of liqueur, I left the doctor and his wife and went to my room. Yes? I'm sorry. Were you asleep? Oh, no. No, I was just sitting here relaxing, doctor. I'm still too excited to do any sleeping. Well, that's exactly how Lorna and I found ourselves feeling. So we decided to sit up and talk a bit over another glass of liqueur. We wondered if you'd join us. After all, this has been a three-way victory, Miss Blake. We want you in on our triumphal toast. Oh, that's a generous thought. I'm afraid I wasn't much more than a spectator in this instance. Oh, nonsense. Come along. Well, I am certainly eager to talk with Mrs. Martin. I had no idea she was an active colleague of yours in the laboratory. Oh, yes. Lorna's been of tremendous help to me. In the past, I would say she's been quite indispensable. Lorna's brilliant mind amazed me from the first moment I met her. Ah, here we are. Lorna, my dear, Miss Blake and I were just having a most engrossing conversation, wholly about you. It seems Miss Blake has been greatly impressed by the work you've done on this idea of mine. Oh, Dr. Martin, you're making it sound as if I'd minimized your own work. I didn't oh, mean... Well, of course you didn't. I do understand. And you needn't make apologies in my direction for your appreciation of my wife's talent. Here, now. It'll occur for you, Miss Blake. Same as earlier? Please. There you are. Thank you. Alona, dear, how about you? Your glass can stand a little replenishing, I should imagine. Now, let me see. No. Why, you still have some that you haven't even touched. In the few seconds What's that had passed since Dr. Martin soft. and I had entered the room, three distinctly sharp and clear thoughts had crossed my mind in sudden, quick succession. And each of them struck at my insides like the painful puncture of a thin, sharp blade. One, that Dr. Martin professionally was insanely jealous of his wife. Two, that it was totally unlike Lorna Martin not to speak to us as we entered the room. And three, that Dr. Martin had just gone over to his wife to make absolutely certain that she was dead. Autolite is bringing you Miss Joan Bennett in Statement of Mary Blake. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suss. Ben. Say, Harlow, can I get a pair of those Autolite Stay-Full battery suspenders? Uh, Hap, there's a catch to these suspenders. Of course. Wouldn't be suspenders without a catch. Well, <laughs> to get a pair of these, you'll have to rave about that special feature of the Autolite Stay-Full battery, the fiberglass retaining mat that protects every positive plate to keep the power-producing material in place for longer life. 70% longer life, in fact, than batteries without stay-full features. And this is proven in recent tests based on SAE life cycle standards. Doesn't anyone but you have a pair of those wonderful, wonderful s suspenders? No, no. These suspenders were made for me by a happy car owner who recently bought an Autolite stay-full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Said he couldn't thank me enough for telling him about it. So, friends, see your Autolite battery dealer tomorrow. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. 
And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Miss Joan Bennett, in Statement of Mary Blake, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I stood there, unable to speak. Dr. Martin looked at me. He was amused, amused at my reaction to his wife's murder. I rather think I could read your mind quite accurately at this moment, Miss Blake. Why? Why? Did... Why? Why does one do anything? What motivates any action of man? There is a need, a desire, a want behind every action. I wanted to kill my wife. It's as simple as that. The poison. <laughs> yes. Come into the laboratory. The poison. We'll look for it. It isn't on your desk. You did kill her with it. But I don't see it. And, and why have you made it a point to have a witness? <laughs> oh, I remember now. You talked of this as an experiment, and you told me I would work with you on it. Just what... what patience, you... my dear girl. Patience. And what is the next step, Doctor? To call whom? The police and tell them what? When one discovers that one's wife has been murdered, one naturally calls in the authorities. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Uh, listen carefully, please. This is Dr. Gregory Martin. My address is 12448 Pilgrim Drive. Would you send some men over immediately, please? My wife has just been murdered. The complete realization of what he had done seemed to come upon me all at once. A sudden delayed shock that hit me with the impact of a hammer blow. I looked at him and he seemed a total stranger. A maniac whose next move I could not predict. <laughs> I was laughing, and while he laughed, I reached desperately behind me, closing my fingers tightly around the glass container I felt in, and I prayed that it contained something that would serve as an effective weapon against the murderer. With one quick movement, I flung it full in his laughing face. And I watched it eat away his skin like a sheet of tissue paper in a soaring flame. When the police arrived, they found Lorna Martin seated erect and beautiful in the chair in the sitting room, while her husband writhed in pain on the floor of his laboratory. I was at Dr. Martin's desk, they said. I remember lifting my eyes to follow mutely the movements of the men who streamed into the room. Through the door, I could see them bending over the body of Lorna Martin, and I watched with a strange, detached curiosity as two interns administered temporary treatment to Dr. Martin's injury. Then they took us away. The three of us. I don't remember much about it. Do you want to talk now? Come now, Miss Blake. We realize that you've been under a great strain. We want to find out exactly what happened, and we must know exactly what part you played. You know, in view of what has happened to Dr. Martin and his wife, a man so revered and well-known... We will be subjected to a great deal of pressure to bring someone to justice for this thing. Justice? How can Lorna Martin ever know justice? Let's hear your story, Miss Blake, from the beginning. There were three people alone in that house when this happened. And of them, only you were able to speak. Now, let's hear what you have to say. How about it? All right. You'll talk on the stand. <laughs> Where to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. It was like a dream, still. The setting now is a court of justice. Yes, Mr. And I sat numbly among strange faces and gesturing hands and questioning voices. Please tell the court. I could hear words tumbling how towards long, me and then well felt soft through only to Gregory return with Martin, renewed force. Please. Dr. Martin has been my close friend and associate for over a dozen years. His fine character cannot be questioned. He and his wife were an unusually devoted couple. This thing that has happened is shocking. Visitor in the Martin home for many years, Dr. Lee. Yes? Uh, can you relate to the court any scenes you witnessed in the Martin household which might have an important bearing on this case? I uh, attended a gathering at the Martin home on the very night that Miss Blake first came there. She sat with us in the living room, and throughout the evening I was aware of her studying Dr. Martin with a peculiar intensity. It was extremely odd. As the medical examiner on this case... Will you please tell the court your findings which revealed the cause of Lorna Martin's death? Mrs. Martin was poisoned. A 
poison was in liquid form taken internally. It was obviously expertly prepared by someone well acquainted with scientific formulas, someone who had access to an excellently equipped laboratory. Please tell the court whose fingerprints were found on the liqueur glass from which Lorna Martin drank the poison that killed her. We found on the glass the prints of Mrs. Martin and uh, those of Mary Blake. Uh, and no others? No, sir. No others. Did you discover any more of the poison like that which was used to kill Mrs. Martin? Uh, there were several drops of it left in the glass from which Mrs. Martin drank. Uh, later, during our investigational search of the entire house, more of the poison was found. And will you please tell the court where the remainder of that poison was found? Yes, sir. In a perfume bottle on the dressing table in the room of Mary Blake. The voices floated in and out and around the room. And some of the words hit against the walls and echoed back at me. Then I rode on them to the front of the room and the voices were loud and strange and my senses seemed blocked by them. And by a hand that pointed towards me. And a face that swung down at me like an inflated comic balloon. I almost laughed. Perhaps I did. Can you, Mary Blake, in any way account for the fact that only Mrs. Martin's and your own fingerprints were found on the glass of poison? Can you give the court any explanation for the perfume bottle containing the remainder of the poison being found in your room? Mary Blake, can you in any way explain the testimony we have heard repeatedly during this trial of your unusually strong personal interest in Dr. Martin? The words were strung like beads on a string and wound round and round me until I felt them so tight it seemed I couldn't breathe. Then suddenly the voice that was strangling me with the words came through to me clearer and louder than ever before. And this time the words were built in a big stick and it was carefully aimed and swung straight toward me. The prosecution at this time is able to bring forth its most important witness. We ask, however, that due consideration be given him by all those present in this courtroom, as his condition is still very serious. He has suffered from extreme shock And as a result of the injuries he recently sustained, he is and will forever remain totally blind. Now, clerk, will you please inform the nurse outside that she may now bring the doctor into the court. Prosecution calls to the stand Dr. Gregory Martin. He came in, seated in a wheelchair. His hands and almost all of his face, save an open slit across his mouth, swathed in thick white bandages. There was something about seeing so handsome and powerful a figure so completely incapacitated involuntary gasp escaped from my own lips as well as from those of every person in the crowded courtroom. Without a word being spoken, the prosecution had easily scored its most effective point. And after Dr. Martin had finished his spoken testimony, the big stick of words came down upon me with full force. Mr. Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, how do you find the defendant? We find the defendant guilty as charged. Yes, then more words. Words coming at me with final flattening blows. This court hereby sentences you to the Women's State Penitentiary for a period of not less than 99 years. I found myself at the far end of a long corridor. The length of it stretching before me in a winding pattern. The walls of it are thick and pregnable cement. There were no windows, save for a small opening high on the wall to my right. Through this, a single shaft of light fell into a pattern which told me that there were iron bars on that one small window. At first, it seemed that I was alone in this place. I stood huddled and afraid, unable to move. Somehow, I had the feeling that soon I would not be alone. Then faintly, From out of the darkness ahead of me, I heard him coming with slow, shuffling footsteps. The walk of a man who has not long been without his eyes. I saw his cane first, a slim thread of white in the blackness before me. I watched it, tapping up and down in a nervous rhythm, tapping, coming closer, closer. I felt the muscles in my throat tighten in an effort to scream. But I made no sound at all, nor did I move. I just stood there and waited and watched him come toward me. Then in the next instant, his face caught in the shaft of light. And I saw him very clearly. Mary, Mary, please wake up. 
Oh. Come on now, get hold before you rouse the whole block. Come on now. Uh, oh, we can't have this oh. every night. Oh, what's oh, that dream? I can't stop dreaming. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. I, I don't belong here. I didn't do anything. But I'm here. He still won't leave me alone, not even in my sleep. Oh, there, you see, Warden. That's the way it is every night. We can't seem to That's do enough, it. That's enough, Mason. We're releasing Mary Blake. What did you say? You're free, Miss Blake. The nightmare is over. Come with me and I'll tell you what has happened. The state has no way of returning these weeks of freedom it wrongly took from you, nor of erasing the shock and heartbreak you've been forced to suffer. We can only hope that it has not too deeply embittered you and hasn't totally destroyed your faith in the justice one customarily finds in our courtrooms. There seems to be a limit to bitterness, Warden. I, I find that what I feel now is not a release from injustice, but a release from fear. I know that he can never reach me again, even in my dreams. How can I be so sure of that? Well, it's another of the things that can't be accounted for rationally about this case. It leads one to wonder if some... Oh, some metaphysical force wasn't put to work in place of the erring machinery of justice. Miss Blake, when you blinded Dr. Martin, you limited his vision to mental images. And over the period of time that has lapsed since the day you received sentence, it seems the doctor's mind would not free him from one particular visual experience... He, too, suffered from a recurring dream, which, due to his impairment, was inflicted upon his waking as well as sleeping hours. The dream? Did, did he describe it? Oh, he did, in detail. It seemed that there was... Slow, groping steps. I entered a narrow corridor. With my hands, I felt that the walls were of a thick, impregnable cement. And the tap of my cane produced an echo that told me the corridor was one of interminable winding lengths. I did not want to enter nor walk through it. Yet it seemed that I was forced to. And the walking, walking, seemed endless. I wanted to cry out, but could find no voice. I wanted to see a single light from a window or an open door to know that there was somewhere... An end to the blackness. But there was no light. And no end. I wanted to turn back. But there was no turning back. And no end to my walking. And although I had the feeling of being alone in this place, I knew that I was not alone. And never would be. And it was worse than being alone. For though I could not see her, and though she did not touched nor speak to me, I knew she was there. And for me, she would always be there. Mary Blake, my accuser. For she is the innocent, and I am the guilty. And for the innocent, there is always a freedom. And for the guilty, there is never an escape. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Miss Joan Bennett. Hello, I just ran out and bought an Autolite Stay Full battery. Now, do I get a pair of those wonderful suspenders? Well, Hap, you sway me. But let me sway, I mean, say a word about the more than 400 products made by Autolite. Welcome to original equipment on America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, core electric windshield wipers, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because... They're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. (laughs) 
Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Mr. John Lund. The play is called The Man in the Room. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Statement of Mary Blake is an original play written for radio by Shirley Gordon. Miss Joan Bennett will soon be seen in the MGM production, Father of the Bride. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Claire Trevor and Charles Boyer. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring John Lund. You can buy Autolite Stateful Batteries, Autolite Resistor, or Regular Spark Plugs, Autolite Electrical Parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. John Lund in The Man in the Room, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Harlow, what's the best bait to use for bass? Mm, I don't know, Hap. Better ask an ichthyologist. An ichthyologist? An ichthyologist, an expert on fish. When I need information, I believe in going to an expert. That go for spark plug information, too? Sure. And who knows more about the best spark plugs for your car than Autolite ignition engineers, the men who design and build complete ignition systems, used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. You mean they know how to build into spark plugs the best in quick starting, smooth performance, and gas mileage, eh, Harlow? Of course, Hap. That's what's made Autolite the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. And it was Autolite engineering know-how that made possible the development of the Autolite Resistor Spark Plug, one of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite Spark Plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite Spark Plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with the man in the room... And the performance of John Lund, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. When I was ten, I first read Edgar Allan Poe's story of the miraculous room. The room whose terrible walls closed slowly in upon their prisoner. It made a deep impression upon me. My most persistent nightmare was that I was the poor devil in the story. I didn't know then that he had been impressed by it, too. And that someday I would actually be the man in the room. Excuse me. Can you tell me what floor Miss Markham is on? Miss Markham? What do you want with her? Well, I, I want her to do some work for me. She does typing, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. Third floor. Step in. Thank you. You're a writer? Yes. What do you write? Stories, mostly. Mm hmm. Tell them? Occasionally. Mm hmm. She's down at the end of the hall where you see the door open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Miss Markham? Yes, right. What can I do for you? I saw your ad in the paper. I thought perhaps you could do some work for me. Oh, yes, yes, of course. What is it? Typing? Mimeographing? Typing. Manuscript. You're a writer? Yes. Oh. Would you shut the door, please? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Thank you. You'll find that I do absolutely perfect work, and at the most reasonable rates. I've had many years of experience, although not in this city. I've just recently moved here. Will you have much for me to do? Well, <laughs> that depends. Frankly, Miss Markham, the price is a factor with me. You see, I'm a freelance writer, and at best, that's a precarious occupation. I see. 
Well, is 30 cents a page too much? Why? 25. <laughs> I was about to say that 30 seems extremely reasonable. Well, I've already said 25, so we'll leave it at that. You're very kind. Not at all. Excuse me, please. Was... Was that the elevator man running down the hall? Well, no. I didn't see anyone. It's been a lovely day, hasn't it? Yes. Yes, it has. I think the weather is so perfect here. I know I'm going to love this city. It's so difficult coming to a new place and trying to establish oneself, especially so late in life. But I think things are going to work out fine. I hope so. Would you like to leave your manuscript now? Yes, here it is. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, 40 pages. I'll have that ready for you day after tomorrow. Oh, that'll be fine. I'll come back and pick it up then. I left the office and rang for the elevator. The old man who ran it didn't speak to me on the way down, but I stood in the back of the car and looked him over carefully. He was a funny little old duck, almost dwarf-sized, with shoulders so rounded he was nearly humpbacked. I was sure he was the one who had been listening at the door upstairs. But, after all, it was none of my affair. Two days later, I returned to the old office building to pick up my manuscript. You come to pick up your typing? Yes. Here it is. She left it for you. Oh. Well, uh, I've got to go up anyway. I have some more work for Miss Markham. I'll take it. She don't want to be disturbed. Well, I... Just give it here. All right. I gave him the manuscript and left. Several days later, when I returned, he had the completed work ready for me, down on the first floor. That's the way it went on on the other occasions when I had typing for Miss Markham to do. The old man took it from me downstairs and had it ready for me when I returned. There was always a reason for me not to go upstairs. Miss Markham was working and didn't want to be disturbed. Or she just left for lunch. Or she wasn't down that day because of illness. One day, when I came to pick up some material, the elevator was not down on the first floor. And my curiosity got the better of me. Instead of ringing, I took the stairs and walked up to the third floor. Oh, it's you. Where's Miss Markham? She ain't here. You can see she ain't. Yes. Are you typing? Sure. I help her out sometimes. She's sick today. Oh, I see. I just finished your story. That's... that's fine. <laughs> it won't sell, though. What? I say it won't sell. It's clumsy. Oh, you think so? Yes. It's all hodgepodge. You write too fast. Well, I'm sorry you don't like it, but uh, if you'll just put it together, I'll send it off anyway. All right, but it won't sell. That night at home, I'd been working for hours on a plot for a mystery story. I was having absolutely no luck. I simply couldn't concentrate. Then I had a thought. How would it be to use Miss Markham and the elevator man as a basis for a story? Just take the situation as it stood now and fabricate the rest of the plot from there. Let's see. The old man could have murdered her and hidden the body. Possibly he'd done it immediately after I'd seen her last and she'd been dead all this time. I even made up a fine name for the elevator man. I called him Dracklin. But for the life of me, I couldn't build a story. Why had he killed her? What had he done with the body? The plot wouldn't move. And yet, somehow, I couldn't discard it and try another. I knew that I was stuck with it until I worked it out. Well, how about the reality? What had happened to Miss Markham? Why hadn't I seen her for over two weeks? The only thing to do, I decided, was to find out more about the real situation. Perhaps I could evolve something from that. Hello? Hello, George? Bert. Oh! Fine. Listen, George, who does your typing? My typing? Why, uh, Harrison Lewis. Oh, yes, at 50 cents a page. I forgot you were rich. <laughs> Why? Well, I thought perhaps you'd seen the same ad in the paper that I did. 
A Miss Markham. She's been doing some work for me. Markham? No, I, I didn't see it. Well, why? Is she any good? Oh, yes. She's very good. Well, uh, what, what does she charge? 30 cents a page. Hey, that is cheap. <laughs> Maybe I'll switch. Where's she located? 202 West Olive. Why don't you go up and see her anyway? Let me know what she says. All right, I'll go in the morning. Fine. Goodbye, George. The next morning, I called information and got Miss Markham's office number. It was not yet listed in the directory. I called the number, somehow knowing there would be no answer. Hello? Oh, hello. Miss Markham? Yes? Well, this is, uh, this is Mr. Freeland. I, uh, heard you were ill yesterday. Just thought I'd call and see how you were. Oh, that's very nice of you. Thank you very much. I'm feeling much better today. Oh, I'm glad. I, uh, I expect to have some more work for you at the end of the week. All right. Just bring it in. I will. And, oh, yes, Miss Markham, I haven't received a bill from you yet. Uh, would you send one soon? Yes, I will. Thank you. Goodbye, Miss Markham. Goodbye. I hung up thinking, well, there goes my plot into a cocked hat. I realized then that I had begun to believe something had happened to Miss Markham. Talked myself into it, I guess. Confused the fiction with the reality. But just because she was alive and well, that was no reason why I couldn't still build a good story from the same idea. Now, let's see. Gracklin had killed Miss Markham and hidden the body. But when I called up, she answered. No, I couldn't use that. But wait a minute. Why couldn't I? Why, certainly, there was the twist. Sure. Gracklin gets another woman to impersonate Miss Markham. The only ones he'd have to worry about would be the people who had seen the first Miss Markham. Well, that's the way my story would go anyway. I sat down at my typewriter and made it sing for a couple of hours. The story was coming along fine. Only thing I needed was some background on Gracklin. Well, nothing like the source. At about 4.30 that afternoon, I was down on West Olive Street near the 202 building. At about 5, Gracklin came out and started up the street. He got on a bus, so I looked around for a cab. Cabby, you taken? Yeah, hop in. Good. Listen, follow that bus, but not too close. I'll tell you when to stop. Okay. He stayed on that bus all the way to the end of the line. I got out of the cab about a block before the final bus stop and saw the old man get off. It was almost prairie here. Large vacant lots and only a few scattered houses. He entered one of them. After about 20 minutes, when it was getting dark, I walked slowly up to the place. There was a light around in back. I went quietly along the side of the house to the window. I looked in. There sat Gracklin, bent over a table, writing with a quill pen. But it was the room that surprised me. The walls were filled from floor to ceiling with books. Heavy, scholarly books. And then... I saw it. On a smaller table against the wall stood her picture. She was younger in the photo and prettier, but it was unmistakably she. Miss Markham. Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Lund in... The Man in the Room. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Carlo, do ichthyologists and zoologists have anything in common? Well, in a way, Hap, you see, any kind of an ologist is an expert in his field. Well, I guess that makes you a spark plugologist, eh, Wilcox? <laughs> well, not exactly. I'm more of a gabologist. The real experts are the Autolite ignition engineers. They design and build complete ignition systems for use as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. So naturally, they've built spark plugs that will work as a team with the ignition systems. Spark plugs that are unexcelled for quick starting, smooth performance, and gas mileage. Sounds logical. Of course. And these same Autolite engineers developed the famous Autolite resistor spark plug. One of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. They're experts, all right, Harlow. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs 
with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, John Lund, in The Man in the Room, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. And the next morning's mail was her bill. But there was a mistake. She'd charged me 40 cents a page. So I put on my coat and started downtown. As I walked up Olive Street, I wondered if Draxon would let me up to see Miss Markham. If it were in my story, he couldn't, because I'd immediately recognize her as another woman. Three, please. Watch your step. Miss Markham is in today? Yep. You know, I haven't seen her for some time. She's always been out or sick or something. That's so? Certainly it's so. You were the one who kept telling me. Oh, well, I can't remember everybody who comes in here. Oh, I shouldn't think it would be too hard. I'll bet not over ten people a day come in here. This is the most deserted office building I've ever seen. (laughs) Well, sometimes it is a little quiet. You know where it is? Yes. Come in. Miss Markham. You are Miss Markham. Yes, of course. Why? Oh, no reason. I'm a little confused. Been writing too much lately, I guess. Oh. Well, uh, the reason I came down is because of your bill. There's a mistake. But don't you remember you said you were going to charge me 25 cents a page? But your bill says 40. Oh, oh, yes, I do remember now. That's right, 25. (laughs) The error is mine. I'll change it. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, that's all right. I wasn't worried about it. If you'd like to refigure it, I, I can leave you a check right now. Uh, do you possibly have the cash? Well, let's see. Yes. Yes, I think I do. Would you prefer that? If you don't mind. I paid the bill and went home. Back to my story. My story that had turned out to be pure fiction after all. Miss Markham was alive and well and back in her office, looking just as she had the first time I saw her. Well, I had used all of the real situation I could, and from now on I was operating on pure imagination. Let's see. Hey, wait a minute. Just because she looks the same doesn't mean she's the same woman. She was a twin, see? The first Miss Markham's twin sister, and Grackman was, uh, their brother. Why had he killed the first Miss Markham? Well, for money, her life savings. That was always a good motive. And the twin sister was in on it and would split with him. Fine. I rattled off the story and the next morning brought it in to be tight. Good morning, Mr. Whelan. Good morning, Miss Markham. Got another story for you. Oh? Well, I'm not sure that I can start on anything right now. I'm closing up the office, you know. Oh? Oh, yes. This climate doesn't agree with me at all. As a matter of fact, I never did like city life. You've evidently changed your mind about things. I beg your pardon? Remember the first day you came up here? You you were telling me how well you liked our city and the weather? Oh, yes. Well, you can always depend on a woman, can't you? Yeah, I guess so. I really wish you could finish this story for me. It's not very long. Oh? Only about 28 pages. I see. Well, perhaps I can rush it out. I sort of feel that I owe you something anyway. Why? For being so nice about that mistake I made on your bill. Oh, that was nothing. Well... Leave the manuscript here, and I'll try to have it done by tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow's my last day. Come in about two o'clock. Right. And thanks a lot, Miss Markham. The next day was Saturday. And if the building had seemed deserted on other days, it had really been a beehive compared to two o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Now it was a morgue. When I entered Miss Markham's office, she was standing there holding a sheaf of papers. Mr. Freeland. Where did you ever get the idea for that story? Oh, well, I I hope it didn't disturb you, but I was desperate for a plot, and I guess I just let my imagination run wild. I see. Well, I'll just put it in an envelope. Thank you. And I'll pay you now, because I probably won't see you again. That's right. You probably won't. Well, I guess I'll just say goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Markham, and good luck. Thank you. And the same to you. 
Drachman was waiting for me there on the third floor. He had probably just stayed there while I was in the office. I got in the elevator and he closed the door. Get your story, Mr. Freeland? Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Hmm. Not a bad story. Miss Markham, let me read it. Oh? But it needs rewriting. Oh, is that so? Yes. Like I told you before, Mr. Freeland, you write too fast. You aren't careful enough with the reality. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, uh, now that part about hiding the body in the elevator shaft, for instance. You almost had a good thing there, but I could tell you've never been in an elevator shaft. Have you? Why, no. You've passed the first floor. Uh, let's go down a bit. I'd like to show you something. This is the basement. Yes. Yes, I see. You notice how the air gets closer as you go down? It's little touches like that that make a story real. Yeah. Sub-basement. Mr. Freeland, would you like to see what an elevator shaft looks like? Well, I... Come on, it's very interesting. Especially for a writer. All right. Fine, follow me. Now, we'll just go down these stairs on your left. Uh, there's only a few of them, but they're kind of dark. Be careful. I will. Wouldn't want you to fall. Now, we go through this little steel door. After you, Mr. Freeland. Thank you. I see... This is what the bottom of an elevator shaft looks like. Yes, yes, it, it, it is interesting. You can make all kinds of noise down here and no one would know. Well. <laughs> now, about your story. You had me, I mean, Gratlin, bury the woman in the floor of the shaft. Now, that would never do. No? No. If you dug a grave down here, the inspector would find it in a minute. Oh. Oh, uh, yes. The inspector's very sharp. Very sharp. But in the wall. The wall? Yes. See those bricks? Now, if I go to exactly the right place, look, I can pull several of them right out. And after I've got all the loose ones out, there's a regular cavity been dug out behind them. Come here. Look for yourself. Huh? Miss Mark! Yes. See how snugly she fits in there? I spent a long time digging that hole. She's dead. You, you killed her. Yes. Didn't you really know? Uh, I just put these bricks back now. You had some of the things quite right. The woman upstairs is Millie, her twin sister. This one's name is Dorothy. I married Dorothy, but I should have married Millie. You see, Mr. Freeland, I am a writer, too. More than a writer, a poet. But I didn't sell anything, and Dorothy lost faith in me. She typed stories for hats like yourself. While I had to turn to running an elevator, she caused me to lose faith in myself. Finally, Dorothy left me and came here. I followed her and got a job in the same building. At last, I did what I'd wanted to do for years. I killed her. When I told Millie, she said I'd done quite right, and she came here to help me. You're insane. No, Mr. Freeland. I am a poet. I'm getting out of here. No, I don't think you are, Mr. Freeland. <coughs> are you surprised how strong I am? I've done many things in my time, even if it waits in a circus. You, you madman. No, don't try to get up, Mr. Freeland, or I'll just have to knock you down again. You see, I've got something quite interesting in store for you. You remember Edgar Allan Poe's wonderful story about the man in the room that got smaller and smaller until it would crush the life out of him? What, what are you talking about? Well, Mr. Freeland, I have such a room. You're in it now. The walls won't move, but the ceiling will. Look above you. Most elevators won't go all the way to the bottom of the shaft, but this one will. I fixed it. Get out of my way, you lunatic. I warned you, Mr. Freeland. <laughs> Crushing blow, and I dropped to the ground, stunned. And you were wrong on my name. It's Alan Jones. Then he jumped out of the door and slammed it shut. 
I staggered to it, but there was no knob or latch of any kind on the inside. It was smooth and flush with the wall. I heard his footsteps running up the stairs. Then I heard them above me, in the elevator. Then came a sound that drove me to panic. Racklin, stop! You'll never get away with two murders. You'll go to the electric chair. Racklin! Listen, listen. I won't tell anybody about Miss Markham. I'll tear up the story. Racklin! I sank to my knees till it came on. Then I fell flat on my face. And still it came closer and closer. Only inches away now. Desperately, I flung out my arms to flatten myself close to the ground. And my hand touched the bricks of the wall. Found one of the loose ones. Without knowing what I was doing, I, I clawed at the loose brick and pulled it out a little. Then, miraculously, the elevator hung suspended. The side of it caught on the brick. I knew it wouldn't be stopped for long. Already the side of the elevator was grinding into the brick. And in a moment, it would break it and come pressing down upon me like an ant. But then, I heard a new sound. The elevator stopped crushing into the brick now and hung motionless. He'd evidently shut off the power. He was trying to make up his mind what to do. Suddenly, the elevator lifted. I saw it going up and up, away from me. And then, I don't remember. I must have fainted. The next thing I knew, two policemen were holding me up, asking me questions. I told them something of what had happened, and then I asked them about the elevator man. Oh, him? Well, we sent him off in the wagon. It was a funny thing. You see, there was this guy from some publisher, I think he was, came here to tell this elevator guy they'd won some big poetry contest. Well, this fellow from the publisher waited around upstairs and finally started pressing the buzzer. When the elevator came up, the old man jumped out, knocked the publisher guy down, and then went running out into the street. That's when we got him. <laughs> After we sent him off, we came back to investigate. And we found you. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> well, that's about all there was to it. Except that old Drackman really was a pretty good writer, I guess. Because I made the changes, he suggested. And you know what? I sold the story. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. John Lund. Hello. Got another poem for you. Okay. Harlow Wilcox, the car owner's delight, awoke one night from a deep dream of... Autolite. But let's be more specific, Hap. I dreamed that every car in America was equipped with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And you know, spark plugs are only one of more than 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts. At your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Miss Claire Trevor. The play is called Angel Face, and it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Man in the Room is an original play written for radio by William Idelson and Mary Castle. John Lund is currently being co-starred with Barbara Stanwyck in the Paramount picture No Man of Her Own. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Charles Boyer, Edward G. Robinson, Jack Carson, and Dennis O'Keefe. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense. 
starring Claire Trevor. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite faithful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. In spite of better food supplies, millions are still starving in Europe and Japan. The need is particularly acute in free Berlin. Send your contributions to CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Miss Claire Trevor in Angel Face, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. The flowers are blooming this spring. Color. Uh, have nothing hey, to do hey, with hey, it. Hey, hey, hmm. hey, half. You better save that for the bathtub or consult a voice expert. Seems to be an expert for everything these days, Wilcox. Everything from voices to... to spark plugs. Mm. Take Autolite spark plugs, for instance. They're designed by Autolite ignition engineers. The men who engineer spark plugs, just as they engineer coils, distributors, wire, and all the other important parts of the ignition system, to work together as a perfect team. Why, the skill of these ignition engineers has made Autolite spark plugs world famous for their quality and dependability. Ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs, you might say. Yes, sir, and these same Autolite engineers developed the famous Autolite resistor spark plug. One of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Real experts, eh, Wilcox? Right you are, Hap. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now with Angel Face and the performance of Claire Trevor, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I see her already, if you don't mind. Out of my way. There's got a doorman downstairs in this building. You're supposed to get yourself announced, honey. The name is Wheeler. Does it mean anything to you? Wheeler? I had caught Ruby Rose Redding, the noted burlesque queen, at breakfast time. Hers, not mine. Quarter to three in the afternoon. Breakfast was a tomato and lettuce, untouched and a glass of bromo salsa. She banged her cigarette to death against an ashtray and looked me up and down, like auditioning me for her chorus, chorus line. Wheeler, what's it supposed to mean? Are you his mother? I'm a little young for the part, but I'm the only one he's ever had. Oh, now I get it. The big sister act. Okay, run through it once, then get out of here. Sure. I don't mind coming right out with it in front of your maid if you don't. Yeah. Is that... <laughs> Take Cooper around the block a couple of times. Madame, I took him once already. Well, take him again. Maybe you can get him tomorrow already. But Madame, get out of here! Wait, Madame. Well, I'll give it to you short. I want you to lay off my brother. Your brother? Now let's see. What am I supposed to have done to him? He's been spending money like wild, money that doesn't come out of his salary. And another thing, he started wearing a gun about two weeks after you started wearing him. Did I teach him to shoot it, too? No, but I think some of your friends may have. Oh, you've been reading the gossip columns. Well, I read them, too. Some big gum from Philly is supposed to be paying my rent. Forget it, honey. That's my publicity. Now will you get out of here and let me get my massage? Look, give him a break, will you? Pick on someone your own size. Well, of all the... Hey, I've heard of wives pulling this bit, and even mothers. And once in a picture, it was the old man. Now it's his sister. Well, send Grandma around tomorrow. I'll, I'll beat it. I walked out past her. If she touched me, I, I think I'd have murdered her. Hello, sis. Where you been? Oh, I went for a walk. Why aren't you at work? I quit my job. You did? Chick, you aren't going to Chicago with that dame, are you? Why Chicago? Well, it's in Variety. Ruby Rose is opening a club there. It's 
It also says a big shot gangster from Philly is backing it. Oh, what? Well, does he know about you? What are you trying to do, scare me off? Oh, no, you're such a big shot, that wouldn't work. All that about that guy, that's nothing but publicity. Ruby told me all about it. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, look, sis, you don't know her like I do. Oh, chick, I'm not going to let you get mixed up with this. Now, no cracks, Jerry. Look, Ruby Rose Redding makes good money, all right, but the rent on that plush-lined rat trap she lives in, if you can call it living, is around 3000 a month. Now, somebody's paying those bills. Oh, nuts. What do you really know about More her? than you ever oh, will. Please. I'm in show business, too, you oh, know. Oh, lay off, will you? Chick, wait, listen. I heard enough. Chick, please. Get away from the door, Jerry. I never raised a hand to you in my life, and I don't want to now. I won't let you go, Chick. Not for her. Not for something that ought to be washed out of your hair with gasoline. Get out of my way, Jerry. Oh, don't go, Chick. You're heading straight for the eight ball. Chick. Chick. Don't go to her. Dissolved two girls sitting at kitchen table playing very solitary solitaire. About four that morning, I was looking for an aspirin. When the doorbell buzzed, Chick, I... Chick, I... You're Jerry Wheeler, aren't you? He was nice. I found out his name later. Lieutenant Nick Burns. The other one had a face like one of those cobblestones they dug out of 8th Avenue when they tore up the trolley tracks. Your brother. What time do you leave here this evening? I really couldn't say. I... My clock's out of order. Miss Wheeler, your brother was going to Chicago with Ruby Rose Redding, the dancer. You knew that, didn't you? Oh, now, why would he go anywhere with anyone with a name like that? Your brother went to the Alcazar Apartments at 8.15 tonight and beat up this Redding thing. What? Then he put his two big thumbs on her throat and throttled her until she was dead. You were just saying that. He's just saying that, isn't he? That's the way it is, Angel Face. Well, he didn't do it. Please... Please, he didn't do it. All right, I... I did know about him and Ruby Rose, but... But he couldn't have done that. I've been on the squad eight years, Angel Face, and we never in all that time caught a guy as dead to rights as your brother. He showed up with his valise in the foyer of the Alcazar at exactly 12 minutes past eight tonight. He said to the doorman, what time is it? Did Miss Redding send her baggage down yet? We've got to make a train. Well, she had sent her baggage down, and then she changed her mind. She had it all taken back upstairs again. There's your motive right there. Well, that doesn't prove anything. The doorman rang her apartment and said through the intercom, Mr. Wheeler's here. And she gave a dirty laugh and sang out, I can hardly wait. I don't see that. So what? So she was alive at 13 minutes past 8. The doorman went out for coffee at 8.15. At 8.20, Ruby Rose asked the operator to give her the police. She was shrieking with fear. At 8.32, I arrived. Your brother was crouched over, shaking her, and she was dead. There were two thumbprints on her neck, as well as the marks of a big signet ring where she'd been pummeled. The initial... W for Wheeler. Is that a case or isn't it? Was was Chick wearing that ring when you arrested him? No, but there's a ring mark on his right third finger where he got rid of a ring he'd been wearing a long time. He pawned it. He needed money. Told us he lost it. Well, even if he did hit her... How do you know somebody else wasn't in that apartment just before Chick showed up? Where was that, that French maid of hers? Discharged. Got her notice in two weeks' pay and left around six. Story checks. Did... Chick confessed? Oh, no, no. He was crouched over, shaking her, trying to restore her, he said. All right. All right, I'll tell you everything. Write it down. Yeah, that's more like it. I went there this afternoon and told her if she didn't lay off my brother, I'd kill her. I came back home, found Chick packed up, ready to leave. I, I tried to stop him. He hit me. Ask the neighbors. They heard his rowing. He struck me, and I couldn't stand it. I beat it up to her place in a taxi. Got there first, went in the back way, and and gave her one last chance to leave him alone. She wouldn't take it. She was all soft and, and squashy, and I, I just grabbed her by the neck and pushed hard. I've got big thumbs, too. Mm-hmm. Got all that, Coley? Uh, yep. Well, that about puts a lid on it. Let's go. Yeah, let's... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, Angel Faye? Aren't you going to take me? Who wants you? Oh, you think this is one of those phony confessions. Well, maybe the newspapers won't think so, and they'll be right. Maybe you did do it at that. Maybe I'm underestimating you. What was she wearing? Pajamas. You're right. That was a good guess. See you later, Angel Faith. The way he said it, I couldn't tell whether it was a threat or a promise. 
I never saw him again until after the jury had found my brother guilty of murder in the first degree. Autolite is bringing you Miss Claire Trevor in Angel Face. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Carlo, speaking of experts... Experts, did you say? That reminds me of Autolite ignition engineers, the men who design and build complete ignition systems, used as original factory equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. They're ignition experts. So naturally, they know how to build Autolite spark plugs so they'll work as a perfect team with all the other important parts of the ignition system. That means they know how to build into spark plugs the best in quick starting, smoother performance, and gas mileage, eh, Harlow? right oh, and say, it's the skill of these same Autolite engineers that made possible the development of the Autolite resistor spark plug, one of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Edgewise. How's that again, Hap? Just trying to get a word in edgewise, Harlow. <laughs> well, here's the last word, Hap. See your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you'll be right, because you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Claire Trevor, in Angel Face, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I was coming out of the courtroom in a wet hen frame of mind, and guess who had an umbrella? Hello, Angel Face. Get away from me, you butcher. <laughs> the girl feeling better already, huh? Just keep out of my way. Oh, now, wait a minute, Angel Let Face. Let go of me. You need help, baby. I'm trying to give it to you. All right. Tell me the name of the little man who wasn't there. Wasn't where? In that courtroom, standing trial for her murder in place of Chick. Can't you see? It's got to be another... Oh, what's the use of trying to sell you? Oh, go on. Sell me. Convince me your brother didn't do it, and I'm with you up to the hill. Well, why did you wait till now to say that? Well, you didn't give me anything to go on. Nothing but that phony confession of yours. Well, it was better than the perjured testimony of that doorman and that, that phony French maid. Uh, and you, you sat up there with your face hanging out and put in your two cents worth. Look, Angel Face, I was sent by my superiors in answer to the patrolman's call that night. Question, chick, and put him under arrest. Don't hold that against me. What do you care whether I hold it against you? They really don't know? No. Look in the mirror sometime and find out. Right then, I decided to stop holding it against him that he was a detective. I kind of liked the guy, and maybe, just maybe, he could find a way to help clear my brother. And over a couple of Manhattans in a cheery little bar, I told him so. Uh Uh-huh. Well, you got a plan, Angel Face, or are you going into it blind? I think I'll start with that French maid. Why her? She left two hours before the murder. That's level. Yeah, maybe so, but she was greased plenty to soft pedal of one right name that belongs in this case. Mm. She may not have been there, but she knew who to expect around. She may even have tipped him that Ruby Rose was throwing him over for chick. But if she's been paid off enough to commit perjury, what makes you think she'll tell you anything? I'll club it out of her if I have to. Wait a second. Here, try this first. Use a little intimidation with it. It may work. A hundred and fifty bucks. Mm-hmm. Hey, aren't you married or anything? Not yet, Angel Face. Now, here's her address. Suzette LeBlanc, real name, Susie White, 435 West 54th. The street had been roped off and there was a block party or something going on. Anyway, it was noisy. I elbowed my way up the steps of 435 and found Susie White's name on the bell panel. I broke my best fingernail on the button. No response. I pushed into the hall, past the drunk, falling oh, out. Pardon me. And fought my way through the fumes to the stairway. Her door was standing open. The lock was broken and the molding was a mess of splinters. This was the point where the private eye always finds the dead body, but I didn't find anything. Somebody had taken the room apart. I wondered if they had found what they were looking for. When I hit the street again, the ugly-faced drunk I had passed coming in was standing by the front steps. And there was a fresh wood splinter clinging to the elbow of his coat. I remembered the splinters on the broken door upstairs. I, I stopped next to him and made like straightening my scene. I looked good that way. Then I started walking. Fast. So did he. I paused in some some steps leading down to a basement apartment and waited for him. Hello, beautiful. Well, how are you? Just fine. 
Is this your house? Yes, indeed. Yeah, how about a little drink, baby? Uh-huh. Invite me in. Sure, you go first. Yeah. He hit the iron railing with his head on the way down, and the paving stones at the bottom did the rest. It was right there in the first pocket I looked in behind his wallet. A letter addressed to Ruby Rose Redding and postmarked Philadelphia. Nick, here I am, over here. Oh, hello, Angel Face. Nick, I... I know, I know, you didn't find her. I may as well tell you why. She doesn't live there anymore. What? Nick? They fished her body out of the Hudson about a half hour ago. Oh, well, what are you smart detectives calling it? Suicide? Yeah, I might as well. Listen, she was being paid off to keep quiet about a certain friend of Ruby Rose's. Wow. He must have decided he didn't dare leave any bets uncovered. What certain friend, for instance? This certain friend, for instance. I watched his face as he read it. I knew every word of it by heart. It said, Dear Ruby, I hear you've been running around with some punk. I don't believe a word of it, but you better get rid of him before I hit town. Mm. We'll be in New York Friday night. Milk. P.S. The Chicago deal is off. I'm giving you featured spot at the Calcutta instead. About that punk, drop him or I drop you. Milk. So that's the missing name. Milk Miletus. Plays rough, too. Runs the Calcutta Club. And Friday night, Nick. The night she was killed. Mm. Miletus. The initial on that ring could have been M as well as W. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. But Melita spells real dull, baby. Your brother wasn't even car fed to Ruby Rose. Oh, maybe she was scared of Melita's. And maybe she wanted out. Oh, well, could be. You could sell me, but I convinced easy from you, baby. You're not selling it to the grand jury. She had something on Melita's. And that's why he couldn't afford to lose control of her. Well, what Ruby Rose Redding could squeeze out of a man, I can. Yeah, what he squeezed out of her, he could also squeeze out of you. Namely, your breath. Oh, yes, but I have a friend on the force. Well, maybe Ruby Rose, Ruby Rose had a friend on the force, too. Why do you say that? If she didn't. It would be the only department she missed. Oh. <laughs> what now? Come and catch my act at the Calcutta Club. Now go on, lift them a little higher. Don't be coy. Look, I sing and dance, and that's all. You got any numbers with you? Numbers? Look, what are we wasting time for? Let's meet the guy who does the hiring. Hey, wait a minute. Mr. Miletus wants you. Where? She says she wants to meet you, Mr. Miletus. Sure, why not? Well, hello. Hello yourself. Oh, Mr. Miletus. You know, I've always wanted to work for you. <laughs> okay. We start the Calcutta tomorrow night. Oh, thanks. Oh. Buy yourself some up-to-date lyrics, get yourself a dress. Mac will tell you the kind uh, I like. The silver dress they put on me fit like a wet compress. I wore it for two nights, and Milk Melitas sat at its table. On the third night, after my last spot, after the orchestra had gone away, I got the message from Garcia. Hello, baby. Hello. Angel face, huh? Yeah, mm-hmm. My name is Faye Angel, so I call myself Angel Faye. <laughs> Good tag. Sit down, Angel Faye. Mm-hmm. I gave him my warmest high-voltage smile and took out my compact. I saw my eyes in the mirror, and in each iris there was a little electric chair with chicks strapped in it. That made it a lot easier to keep the high voltage running from Milk Miletus. He was good-looking in a swarthy, loose-lipped sort of way. Nothing that tagged him as a gangster except his name and a habit of keeping his right hand in his coat pocket all the time as if he were holding a gun. We talked through the bottle of champagne, and he ordered another. I kept smiling because somehow I had to get into his apartment. We went back to what we'd been talking about, and I said, Well, some night I might just feel like changing the scenery around me. Dissolve to girl entering the Miletus apartment on Park Avenue. It was a duplex with a two-story living room and a bedroom opening, opening off a balcony. I decided to start at the top and work down in case I needed to get out of there fast. I gave his bedroom a suspicious wife treatment. On the night table, I found the nine letters to Ruby Rose and a bunch of treasury certificates. 
the kind doctors have to make out to get narcotics. In a box containing studs, cufflinks, and one thirty-two caliber bullet, I found what I was really looking for and never really expected to find. A signet ring with the initial M on it. When I got the bell, I thought fast. If Miletus was out of town, everybody who knew his private number would know better than to ring it. If he was checking up on me, I had nothing to lose, so... Hello? Angel face? Oh, Nick. Oh, what a scare you gave me. Listen, I've got all I need. Some dope certificates, the rest of the letters, and best of all, a signet ring with his initial. How am I doing? Not so good. Melita's just got back. So is the devil over a phony wire somebody sent her a decoy him out of town. Well, that was me. Only I thought he'd stay overnight at least. How did you know I was here? Angel Face, did you really think I'd let you go into this alone? I'm downstairs now. I've been watching every minute. Oh, I wish I'd known. I wouldn't have been so scared. Well, he ought to be scared. He left the club five minutes ago. Must be... Oh, happy. all right, Nick. Now, look, Angel Face, if you could... Nick, someone just came in. Take it easy, baby. Sergeant Coley and I'll be right up. I went out onto the balcony that overlooked the living room. Miletus was there. He looked surprised and pleased when he saw me. Then the man with him looked up and I... I nearly plunged over the rail. It was ugly face. The masher I had kicked down the flight of stairs. Miletus turned to him. Get up, Rocco. Can't you see I have company? Wait a minute. That's her. The dame I was telling you about. Oh. Don't be calling my lady friend dame. I'm trying to tell you, Come Mel. here, Angel Face. Come on down. Don't be scared. <laughs> oh, sure, Mel. Why should I be afraid of you? At last, huh? Finally, you wanted a change of hey, look, scenery. Boss. Mm-hmm. Get out, Rocco. Well, yeah. Get yeah. out. Okay, Mel. It's your party. Come here, Angel. <laughs> no, no. Now, wait a minute. What for? Well, a girl likes some soft lights and a little sweet music, you know. Okay, I'll go mix us a drink. He came back from the bar on tiptoe with the drinks, looking like a cat stalking a bowl of cream. I threw up my first line of defense. I picked up my purse and made like making up my face. Well, honey, what's the big idea? <laughs> I'm just putting on my face. Oh, you don't need it. <gasps> my purse. Leave it there. Oh, I will not. Those are my things. You haven't any right... Hey, 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 what's that? Just things of mine, some letters. Let me see, though. No! Let me see. No! Oh, oh. What else did you lift out of my room? I... I was jealous. Her letters. Sit down. Oh. <laughs> you were plenty jealous. Jealous of the whole United States Treasury, eh? Bill! Bill! Open up! Stay where you are. What's up, Rocco? I'm trying to tell you about the game. She's trying to frame you. She's Wheeler's sister. You weren't at the trial. You were in Shut up about Wheeler. What's got you so excited? There's cops all around the building. Two detectives coming up. Okay, Rocco. Cheap little... I'll fix you. Even if they get me, I'll fix you. You're wrong, Milt. I took those things because I knew they were coming here. I I did it for you. Oh, for me, she said. No! No! I looked up at Miletus. There was blood running down the part of his hair. He dropped down to his knees beside me like he wanted to apologize, but he didn't say anything. Then he fell over on his side and didn't get up anymore. His right hand, the one he always held in his coat pocket, was grabbing at the rug. There wasn't any thumb on it. And there'd been two big thumb marks on Ruby's throat. That wasn't necessary, Nick. You didn't have to kill him. He let go of her when we came in. I, I know. I I shouldn't have, but he had that right hand in his pocket always. I thought he had a gun in there. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, I saved the state some money. You got that stuff, Angel Face? It's over there in my purse. Good. Nick, uh-huh. Ruby Rose was throttled by a man with big hands. Two big thumb marks on her neck. Look at Melita's. No right thumb. Yeah, that's bad, Angel Face. I... Nick. Uh, what? This, uh, ring here. Isn't this your fraternity ring? Don't move, Nick. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. Do we have to mention all this, Coley? Yeah, Nick. I think we'd better. <laughs> Mr. 
So that's about it, Captain. Uh huh. And as you know, sir, Nick met Ruby Rose while he was doing undercover work on Milton Melitis. Yeah, so... but I didn't know he'd gone on seeing her after he left the assignment. Uh, I guess nobody did, except me. Yes, I... and Sergeant Coley clinched the whole thing with that ring. Well, Miss Wheeler, the ring clinched the case, all right, but not against Melitis. An M upside down, see, is a W. But an M sideways is a Greek letter. And Nick planted it in Melitis' apartment for me to find, huh? It was Nick's fraternity ring. Yeah, that's right. He was probably afraid you were digging too deep to find the real killer, so he killed Melitis to make you drop the case. Oh, his plan might have worked without Coley here. Uh, uh, well, Miss Wheeler, this isn't exactly good news, but thank you for filling in some of the blanks. Oh, Captain. Yeah? When will Chick be free? Uh, it takes a little time, but he'll be home. I guess he learned about women the hard way, huh? Oh, he hasn't learned anything yet. That kid brother of mine. Just wait till I get him home. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Miss Claire Trevor. Carlo, the expert, will cox the bright, never will desert the cars. Because of Autolite. Mm. Because, folks, Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on money makes of America's finest cars. Generators, coils, voltage regulators, wire and cable starting motors, electric windshield wipers. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, if your Autolite equipped car needs replacement parts, ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Dennis O'Keefe. The play is called Very Much Like a Nightmare. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's Suspense Play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Angel Face is an original play written for radio by Cornell Woolrich. Claire Trevor may currently be seen co-starred with Fred McMurray in Borderline. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Charles Boyer, Edward G. Robinson, and Jack Carson. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Dennis O'Keefe. world-famous Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Dennis O'Keefe in Very Much Like a Nightmare, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Hello. Yeah? What spectacular event heralds the approach of summer? Why, getting an Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that has three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Come on now, Wilcox. I mean for fun, for pleasure, for excitement. Well, so do I, Hap. What could be more fun than driving a car that has an Autolite Stay Full battery to give you extra starting dependability? What can give you greater pleasure than the knowledge that your Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use? And what excitement when you find out that SAE Life Cycle Standard Tests show that Autolite Stay Full batteries give 70% longer <coughs> average life than batteries without stay-full features. The circus is what I had in mind, Harlow. You should have seen the menagerie. Every kind of animal... Camels? Naturally. Wouldn't be a circus without camels. Well, no camel can teetotal water like the Autolite stay-full battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Just remember, friends, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with very much like a nightmare and the performance of Dennis O'Keefe, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. It started out like nothing more than a small, freakish accident. The kind of thing you could tell a little sheepishly as a joke on yourself. 
And by the time it was over, it was very much like a nightmare. A dream you wake up from, drenched in cold sweat, shaking all over with the clock pointing at 3 a.m. and the covers on the floor. It was only my second day back on the job after a short bout with the flu germ, and I'd been up practically all night working on a job my boss, old Hard Rock Gilman, had been kind enough to save, especially for me. As I walked into the lobby of the Nugent building, my biggest worry was simply whether the little pills my pharmacist mate Hermie had given me would keep me alive and jumping through a rather long day. Eddie, the hot-faced kid who ran the elevator, was just about to take it up as I came in. Hold it, Eddie. Uh, oh, hi, Mr. McClain. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dupre. Didn't see you. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Mr. Frey. How are you? Anybody for three? Don't think I've seen you around lately, Mr. McClain. No, I've been playing hooky. Lucky you. Bye, Betty. Have I ever let you off any other place? <laughs> Mr. Prey, though not precisely my type, was one of the rare plus qualities to be discovered in the Nugent building. She was one of the few girls I've seen around office buildings who actually looked as though they belonged in somebody's penthouse apartment. She usually tagged along with Ferris, a cocky-looking character who also worked at Circassian Brothers Importers up on five. Hi, Bob. Watch your step. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Miss Dupree. Yes? Um, uh, is, uh, everything all right? What? Oh, uh, yes, I think so, Eddie. But maybe you'd better check with Mr. Farris. He may want to send out for a sandwich around 11. Okay. Seven, Miss McLean. Watch your step. Thank you, Eddie. The morning went slowly, even with Hermes pills to help, but at noon I resumed a pleasant custom which had been temporarily interrupted by my illness, that of having lunch with Miss Catherine Warren, a delightful young lady on whose future I had very definite, if uh, not especially dark, design. Now for the gruesome lecture. What time did you go to bed last night, Bart? Who, me? Last night? Well... All right, then. It was this morning. It was this morning, wasn't it? Mm, such a charming girl to be so snoopy. <laughs> Would you like to hear about a very interesting conversation I had going down on the bus this morning with a young man named Herman? Hermie? How a guy like that can run a prescription shop beats me. What would the doctors do if they knew he went around blabbing professional secrets? It's you, not Hermie, I'm concerned about. And I'd like to know what makes you think it's smart to start taking dope. Dope? Oh, that Hermie and his melodrama. All he gave me was something Something to, to keep you from getting the sleep you ought to be getting. At this rate, you'll be back in bed again before you know it. Ah, they're just little white pills. Perfectly harmless if you don't try to swallow the whole box. Why, well, Hermie says... Here, now, well, let's take a look for yourself. Uh, oh, that's it. <clears throat> it's the wrong box. What do you mean, wrong box? All right. So I'm a fugitive from a drug counter. These are the, uh, well, the other ones. The other ones? Well, the fact is, darling, at first I was as leery about these stay-awake things as you are. I started worrying. Suppose the stuff was slow wearing off, or suppose I developed insomnia or something like that. Uh, Hermie said he doubted that that would happen, but uh, just to make sure, he fixed me up with these uh, sleeping pills. More dope. Oh, look, honey. It's not Gilman I'm doing this for. You know that. It's us. I wouldn't have tried to come to work. Uh, I know, I know, Bart. I'm sorry. Forget it. Shall I call you tonight before I tuck myself in? <laughs> if you don't, I'll come over and toss tear gas through your window. I made my way back toward the Nugent building, wedged is very appropriately in a narrow dead-end street. About halfway down the block, I heard footsteps behind me, and then a voice, familiar enough. McLean. It was Ferris, Marie Dupree's boyfriend. Hi, McLean. Hadn't seen you around lately. Been out of town? No, oh, just had to stay in for a few days. How's it with Sergisian <coughs> Brothers? Never better, never better. And with you? No complaints. Say, uh, say something was said in the elevator this morning. You know, Eddie, uh, about him picking up a sandwich for you around 11. I was wondering if that's just an arrangement with the people on the floor. I don't get it, Mr. McLean. Eddie's never picked up any sandwiches from me. <laughs> Somebody's kidding. Oh, here we are. Going up. Oh, hi, Mr. Farris. Mr. McLean. Hi, Eddie. Eddie, what's this about some sandwich service you've got? Been holding out on me? Uh, well, I, uh, uh... Well, Eddie, I, uh... I just thought I overheard you and Mr. Free say something about sending out for a sandwich, so I... Oh, no, no, that was... Uh, no, you got us wrong. I, I never said I that. I told Mr. McLean, Eddie, that it was probably some kind of kidding you and Mr. Free were carrying on. That goes to show you should never kid on the job. Yes, sir. 
That's a good motto for Eddie, huh, Mr. McLean? Never kid on the job. The three of us stood silently in the rising elevator. It, uh, it seemed to me that Ferris had pushed the sandwich topic a little farther than necessary. Eddie was pretty upset. Well, why would he... Oh, well. Well, it wasn't any of my affair. I went back into my cubbyhole to wait till 3 o'clock, the hour for which Gilman had called the conference with Fisher of Barton and Fisher, well, our big account. And it was in this conference that the, the sleep I hadn't got started creeping up on me. Out of a fleecy fog, I, I suddenly heard Gilman barking at me. McLean! Uh, yes, huh? Heaven's sake, what's the matter with you? You didn't get out of bed too soon, did you? Uh, sir, <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I'm all right, Mr. Gilman. Uh, uh, good. I'd appreciate your getting Mr. Fisher's brief finished up for me. I hate to ask you this, but I wonder if you'd mind getting it done before you go. I managed an apology and stood up. My, my eyes burned and my neck muscles seemed to be dragging my head down as I went back to my office. It had been ten, maybe twelve hours since I had taken the last couple of stay-awake pills. And if I could borrow enough energy for the next forty-five minutes, I told myself I could clean up this last job and the whole blessed night would be mine for sleeping. This time I'd cut the dose in half, only take a single pill. So I shook one of the pills out of the little box and followed it with a glass of water. Then I sat down at my desk and unclipped the sheets that Gilman had given me. I don't know when it was that I, I noticed that the words had started running together. I, I looked at the papers and it was like peering through water. A bell was bonging somewhere far off in the distance and I, I seemed to be lying across a bed... Slowly, I forced open my eyes and blinked while reality swam into focus. For, for a moment, I really didn't know where I was, and it, it was just silence and the, the lost feeling of being in the wrong place. And suddenly, I realized the bed I had seemed to be lying across was my office desk. I, I couldn't quite get it clear. Well, what was I doing here? The outer office was nothing but darkness. Stiff and cramped, I stood up. I, I looked at my watch. It's 2.15. 2.15, but that, that's impossible. I... Only a few minutes ago, I looked at my watch and it was... Oh, no. No, it couldn't have been a few minutes ago. Gilman was here then and Miss Tyler and the others. It, it can't be two in the morning. It... Oh, 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 bright boy, McLean. Hermes Pills. <laughs> For the second time, I'd made a stupid mistake about the pills. When I went into the washroom, I'd taken the wrong pills with me. The sleeping pills. The others were still in my top coat. <laughs> I laughed again, but this time I, I didn't like the sound so much. Somehow it seemed too hollow, and then suddenly, standing there in the middle of the floor, seven stories up in an empty office building, the darkness moved in on me, and I, I got that funny feeling as, as if the darkness wasn't all, as if I, I had something worse to contend with, like... Like in Blind Man's Buff when you're a kid and you shrink back and hold your breath while the hand fumbles past you in the darkness. As weird as it seemed, all of, a, all of a sudden it was like being on the island again with the Japanese somewhere near you and not daring to light a match. And holding your breath for the darkness so thick it choked you. Holding your breath because that overloud breath might be your last. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Dennis O'Keefe in Very Much Like a Nightmare. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Carlo, one of the circus men told me that elephants drink ten gallons of water a day. Ten gallons a day? Wow. Mm -hmm. And an Autolite Safeful battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. It's the super battery that has three times as much liquid reserve as batteries without stay-full features. Yes, but the elephant is a mighty powerful critter, Wilcox. Well, talk about power. Man, the Autolite stay-full battery is amazing. You see, there's a fiberglass retaining mat at every positive plate to hold the power-producing material in place. That gives you advantages like extra long life, extra starting dependability. You know, Wilcox, the elephant lives a phenomenally long life. Yes, but half think of the lifespan of the Autolite stay-full battery. Why, according to SAE Life Cycle Standard Tests, it gives 70% longer average life than batteries without stay-full features. And the Autolite stay-full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite battery dealer. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Dennis O'Keefe, in Very Much Like a Nightmare. 
A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I felt my way out into the darkness beyond the door. The hall stretched out like a cave to the stairs and the faint red glow of the exit lights. The angle of the stairs at the landing, there was a window, and I, I pressed my face against the cool of the glass. I had to wake up. And suddenly a, a light fanned out over the loading platform down below. Somebody must have opened the door down there. I, I saw a truck and three or four men dwarfed by the distance, and the light from the door was gone, but I, I could still see the stabbing beams from a couple of flashlights. Who was working there at this hour? Why? <laughs> and then I heard the whistling. Eddie. Eddie, the elevator boy. What's he doing here at this weird hour? Two o'clock in the morning in an empty building with no passengers? Lead-footed, I moved down one flight and waited there on the sixth floor, straining every cell to hear the whistling again, but I didn't. Instead, I, I heard something from the fifth floor, and I, I felt my way down toward it. Sure, I'm laughing, Joe, because I know Marie, and I know that when she talks like this, she's not meaning half what she's saying. And then we've been drinking. I haven't been drinking that much. We feed him everything he asks for. Line it up so that all he's got to do is walk in. And even before the stuff is out of the place, he's ready to cheat us out of what he promised. Marie. So we get for letting ourselves get mixed out of it. Yes. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Hello, no. Ferris. <laughs> now, I tell you something, Miss Dupree. <laughs> you don't know who you're fooling with. You start calling names and you're going to get hurt worse. Lots worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hit you and that ain't all. You figure you don't get enough for what you do. You figure you're being cheated out of your cock. But I tell you something now. You open your mouth the wrong way, I handle you myself. No way, Joe. You think we're so scared of you? We'll stand for anything, don't you? Well, if I get something, you get nothing, too. Open my mouth. I'll open my mouth over. We know you. Get out of my way. Where do you Marie. think you've gone from? Marie. Back here. Let me go. Joe. Let me go. I told you. Joe. I told you to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> was this nightmare I'd stumbled into? If I hadn't been groggy and I worked, looked down on the platform from seven, who would have been tipped off by the flashlights. Sir Kissian would never have had his workmen stumbling around in that sketchy light with stuff costing a small fortune. The elevator. Eddie was in on it, too, handling something a little hotter now than sandwiches. But after the doors opened, I... I noticed that the whistling stopped like being cut in two by a knife. The longer I stood there, the more unhealthy my position became. And then I wondered about Albert, the night watchman. Where was he? He had a gun, but suddenly I, I wanted to get out of there more than anything in the world. Just get out. My dash for the stairs to the fourth floor was like a slow-motion dream. Hermie and his sleeping pills bumped to the floor just out of range of the nearing light as the elevator dropped toward me. And suddenly there it was, a nakedly lighted little room suspended in space. I was staring through its fourth wall at Eddie. His face looked sick and green as he hugged the corner there at the controls, as if nothing could make him look behind to the rear of the car where a big man I hadn't seen before held something in his arms. Something like an oversized doll whose legs dangled limply. My panic was fighting my fogginess. I stood there trying to think. Then I remembered the telephone. There was a perfectly good phone in my office. That was five flights up, five long flights. Couldn't there have been a phone on one of the other floors, a pay station? I fought my way upward again and found it. I found it on the third. I remembered not to close the door of the booth completely because if I did that, the little light would flash on and light was the last thing I wanted. I, I broke the phone off the hook, took a deep breath, and... The coin sounded louder than a fire bell in the dead of night. Clumsily, I, I dialed the operator. Number three. Number, please. The dope. The words wouldn't come out. Number, please. Police. I want the police. My palms were sweaty. I, I was listening with half an ear down the hall. I thought I heard a slight scuffling sound, but I couldn't be sure. Why was it taking so long? Police department. Hello. I'm calling from the Nugent building on 3rd Street North. There's, there's a robbery going on here. A robbery, a... A girl's been killed. What's that address? Who's calling? Oh, my name's McLean. Bartley McLean. I, I work in this building. The, the address is... All right, mister. Hang up that phone. A sudden glare of the flashlight struck across my face like a fist. I shriveled in nothing inside. And, and I saw the man behind the gun. It wasn't Joe. It wasn't any of the men I'd expected. It was the guy I'd almost written off as gagged and tied or dead. Albert. Albert, the night watchman. Hang it up. Albert. 
I was looking for you a while ago. It's all right. I'm McLean. It's Robert McLean, remember? Gilman and company up on the seventh floor. Hang up that phone, Mr. McLean. Hello, would you repeat? Oh, look, you don't understand. You don't know what's going on. I know what's going on, all right. Oh, will you take that gun out of my face? I, I tell you, there's a gang of crooks in this building, Albert. You uh, never should have been here tonight, Mr. McLean. What? Come on. We're going to see him. Him? Joe. Come on. Walk. It was a trick we practiced a hundred times for combat use, but I never tried it before when it really counted. So it came to the head of the stairs. I whirled and chucked down hard with my right hand. I heard the gun go clattering, but my timing was way off. My lever and left never got into the play. Albert had me by the throat and two of us kicked down the steps toward the landing. Locked together like a couple of wrestlers, but it was Albert who took the brunt of the fall. His heart was still beating. He was just knocked out before... For how long? I suppose when someone had hurt us, they... They must have heard us in the gun fall, too. The, the gun. Up at the top of the stairs. I, I had to get it. I, I had to get that gun. I had the gun in my hand. I, I didn't feel so naked now. I headed upstairs for Gilman and Company's quarters fast. The door was still ajar the way I'd left it. I slipped in and closed it behind me. I knew that maybe I had only a matter of a few minutes to get out of final SOS. Albert would come to and start talking. I stumbled over to my desk and put the gun down and started to reach for the phone. Right, like... fella, just stay where you are. What did I tell you, Ferris? I knew our boy would be coming back to see us. Let's go in and visit Petey. Okay, guy. Move out where we can see you. Petey, Ferris, at least three of them, and everything was in their favor. My hands moved even before I thought the desk drawer was open. I slid the gun into it, then moved in front of the door. Okay, Mac, or whatever your name is. Petey, yeah. look him over. Yeah, sure, Joe. Ain't you hanging around here a little late, Mac? Well, I, I went down the hall for a minute. I, I had some work to do. I guess I fell asleep. When I woke up, I just want to find out what time it was. Hey, mister, I think you pick a bad night to work late. Petey, you wait in the hall and keep your eyes open. In five minutes, we'll be out of this dump. You stay here with this guy, Fred. You're no good to us downstairs, and I'm tired of looking at you. Petey, I'll yeah. tell you what. I think maybe we better make it easy for Ferris. Oh, no, look, Joe, I mean, uh, no more. What are you talking now. about? What are you Please. talking about? I mean, suppose we take this guy's tie, make a nice handcuff for him. Then these two businessmen can sit down and talk business until we're ready to go. In a few seconds, not only were my wrists locked together, but I was sitting in the chair facing the door while Ferris slumped from the seat I wanted to have. A chair at the desk, inches away from the gun in the drawer. Harris didn't look at me at all. Silence ticked by an agent. I, I shifted a little in my seat, testing Ferris, seeing if he'd notice, but I, I got no reaction. Just that queer look on his face. The elevator would be bringing bad news in a matter of heartbeats. I ha- Hey! Hey, who's that? Uh-huh. What? On the phone, the telephone. Oh, the phone? Why, it's, it's my wife, I guess. You, yeah, you see, I, I told her I'd be working late. She's probably calling to say that she's on her way down to pick me up. Why, is she coming down here? Look, Joe don't want nobody else butting in down here. Oh, I don't want her down here any more than you do, but the phone ringing and ringing like that, you should just figure I've dozed off and come on down. Yeah, but Joe might... Hey, Farris, don't you think this guy had better answer? Come over here, mister. Talk to her. Tell her, uh... Hello? Tell her she, she don't have to Hello. pick you up. Eh? Hello, darling. I figured it was time you were calling. Oh, it is you. By darling, I've been worried out of my mind. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Hermie and I have tried to... Oh, yes, dear, yes. Uh, I've just about wound up the work for the uh, Warren people. I, I figured you were just having a little trouble putting Junior to bed. Listen, tell her not to come down. What is it? What are you talking about? Who is Junior? And the Warren people? Yes, darling. Uh, put the car back in the garage. Uh, Hermie, uh, Hermie is here. He, he's going to drive me home. Hermie? Why, oh, Hermie's here with me, don't you? Why, is something wrong? You're absolutely right, dear. Absolutely. Oh, my darling. All right, don't talk all night. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Bye. Who is this, Jaime? Why, he's, uh, he's a friend of mine. Sometimes we both work late and he drives me home. I, well, I had to tell her something she believed. I, I didn't want to call him back. Yeah, well, we'll fix that. So he pointed me back to my chair and took the receiver off the hook. And all the time, we might have been pictures on the wall for all the interest that Ferris took in us. 
Petey went back out in the hall, and when Ferris did speak, it was all I could do to keep from jumping out of my skin in his face. I suddenly remembered when and where I'd seen a look like the one on Ferris's face. Funny thing. All this time, I never knew you were married. Oh, yes, yes. I've been married three years now. Marie and me, we... That's what we had in mind all the time. We figured we could make it work. We were going to get married. But you know how it is sometimes. You burn up all you make on clothes and cough there. Joe said no rough stuff. Marie just got excited. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. All right, Ferris. Here they come. Let's roll. Ferris. Uh -huh. Ferris, listen to me. The desk drawer in front of you. There's a gun in there. A gun. A gun? And Joe. What about the gun? Joe's coming back. There's not much time, Ferris. Right in front of you. In a desk drawer. Open it. Get the gun. So, here's the boy who went out to find what time it was. Smart boy. Can't keep his nose out of people's business. Well, we're going to fix all that up. Oh, look, Joe. Shut up. We found the watchman wife guy. But one little thing we didn't find. We don't find the gun you took off of him. Now you're going to tell me what that gun is. I got something figured out for that little gun. Okay, where is it? Come on. Ask me, why don't you, Joe? Is this what you're looking for? Oh, 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 wait a minute. Oh. With the first shot, Ferris buckled, sweeping the lamp off the desk. In the darkness, I groped for the outer office. Petey was in my path, but he was through stopping anybody. When I got to the window there at the first landing, I didn't waste motion this time in the lock, especially with my hands done up the way they were. I kicked twice, and the pain was out of the window, and then I was out. And my escape was rickety, but it had a railing, and the cold, wonderful night air was smacking me in the face. And then, just as I realized that the throbbing in my left arm meant that not all the stray let it miss me, I, I heard the music that I had been waiting for. Bless her. Bless my Catherine. I'm not in the Nugent building anymore, and here at Pratus and Miles, I manage to exercise such talents and training as I have without putting too great a strain on my blood pressure, a situation which not only pleases Mrs. McLean, a girl named Catherine, but also meets with the unreserved approval of her husband. Aside from an aversion to little white pills and a tendency to sneak frequent looks at his watch long about closing time each day, said husband is reputed to have only the normal number of faults. His greatest strong point remains his memory, which is uh, convenient equipment for anniversaries. It will also ever be cherished for reminding him that the look on the face of a fellow named Ferris was a carbon copy of the expression he had last seen the day one of the men in his outfit disobeyed orders and wiped out half a dozen belligerent nippanies. Ferris got only two, while the man who was protesting what had happened to his brother got twice that many. But it is possible that he died just as happy. Personally, I... Oh, good Lord. Look what time it is. Where's my briefcase? Go on down. Hold it, Johnny. Make room for one more. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Dennis O'Keefe. Harlow, you just can't beat the circus for real thrills. The suspense is terrific when the barker sings out, Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, voltage regulators, wire and cables, starting motors, electric windshield wipers. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <laughs> Next.
Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Mr. Edward G. Robinson. The play is called A Case of Nerves, and it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear, and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Very Much Like a Nightmare is an original play written for radio by M. Carl Holman and John Michael Hayes. Dennis O'Keefe may soon be seen co-starred with Anne Sheridan in the Howard Welch production, Woman on the Run. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Charles Boyer, Broderick Crawford, and Jack Carson. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Edward G. Robinson. You can buy Autolite faithful batteries, Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This week marks the 16th annual observance of World Trade Week. Every one of us has a stake in the commerce our country carries on with the rest of the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. is the man in black, here to introduce this half hour of Suspense. Now, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. I got off the train in Toledo and walked through the station to the street. I passed up the waiting taxi and swung aboard a bus. Taxi drivers would likely to remember you, and I couldn't take a chance on that. I hadn't paid any attention to the bus. I didn't know what the line was or where it was going. It didn't make any difference. I didn't know Toledo very well anyway. I watched out the window, and when I came to a likely neighborhood, I got off. Strange, unfamiliar quarter of the city, and yet familiar because every city has neighborhoods like it. Drab, tasteless houses looking almost alike. And then most of them, drab men and women anxious to make a dollar by renting a room. Now, this here is a nice room. It's the best one I got. Two windows on the other side. There's a nice soft bed. Well, I'll take it. How long you figure I'm staying? Oh, uh, just overnight. I'll pay you now. Oh, well, that's two dollars, please. Yeah. Oh. What's the matter, mister? Are you sick? Yes, I... Yes, I'm very sick. Is there a doctor near here? Hey, you are sick. Yeah, I... I think I'll... I think I'll go to bed. That doctor... Oh, yeah, yeah. There's Dr. Martin just around the corner. He's young, but he's good. Well, would you call him for me, please? Ask him to come right up. Oh. Yeah, sure. Mm. Right away. Come in. I'm Dr. Martin. You're Mr. Uh, my name is uh, Wentworth, Doctor. James Wentworth. Oh, yes. I just got into town. I'm afraid I'm in for my old trouble again. Oh, what's that, Mr. Wentworth? Trigeminal neuralgia. Ah. Oh. Had bad attacks before. Uh, just where is the pain? Here. And here. Oh, yes. Now, if you... No, 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 no. Don't touch it. It's like a red-hot iron. Even the draft of air. I know. Really, you should have that nerve operated. Yes, I, I'm going to have it down when I get home. Oh, and where's that? Cleveland. Cleveland. I know a lot of men there. Who's your hmm. doctor? Uh, Dr. Fletcher. Lawrence Fletcher. Yes. Uh, no, no, uh, Andrew. An Andrew R. Fletcher. Hmm. I don't recall him. But he's waiting to clear up a heart condition before he operates. Oh, yes, very sound. Now, uh, how did this attack come on? Oh, the way they always do. I, I was shooting and I... That's the nerve with the razor. Oh, yes, the trigger point. It's very typical. Now, that doesn't help me when that nerve starts jumping. When will you be back in Cleveland? About three days. I'll give you a prescription. Uh, this is morphine, a quarter grain. You've taken it before? Yes, that's the only thing that gives me any relief. Well, then I don't have to tell you about it. I'll drop this off at the drugstore and have them send it up. Well, thank you, Doctor. Tell them to hurry. Then I'd better give you a shot right now. Huh? Oh, uh... Huh? uh you know, Doctor, I... Uh... 
I think the pain isn't so bad now. I, I don't like to take more than I have to. Oh, well, if you're sure you can get along... Well, yes, yes, I, I, I can make out all right. I'll hold the tablets until later. I paid Dr. Martin, young Dr. Martin at Toledo, and he left. I waited for the package to arrive from the drugstore. Then I stayed the night so the landlady wouldn't think it was peculiar. In the morning, I got on the train and went back to Cleveland, to the hospital with the little white tablets in my pocket, with the little white tablets with which I would kill the leaves. It had been so simple to deceive the young, impressionable doctor. So simple to counterfeit the symptoms that I'd seen Louise react to for four years now. It would keep her in bed for four years more. Great. <laughs> for twenty. I'd live with the tic douloureux, the painful nerves so long. Too long. Too long indeed. Dr. Van Tua had to come every day now, and this had to be on hand day and night to combat Louise's attacks, to quiet the raging nerve with morphine. This but not for long. In my pocket were the little white tablets that would bring her peace. I went into the hospital kitchen. Oh, hello, Mr. Oh, hello, Nellie. I'd like to bring Mr. Baker a milk. Of course. I just give it a touch of the fire to take the chill out. I've missed you. In a way, I hear, Mr. Baker. Yes, I had to go out of town. And you ask me it's a good thing. For you, I mean. <laughs> you needed a change. The hospital day after day was telling on you. Oh, I don't think so. Yes, it was. I could see. You're a good man, Mr. Baker. Believe me, it's like a sage you're bearing your trials. <laughs> Not like some others I could mention. Well, isn't the milk ready, Nellie? It is, it is. There we are. Spoonful of sugar. Just the way Mrs. Baker likes it. Well, thank you, Nellie. And give Mrs. Baker my regards. Yes, I'll, I'll do that, Nellie. Now, it, it was just a matter of stepping into an alcove on the way to Louise's room. Dropping the white tablets into the warm milk. The sugar would mask the bitter taste. Oh, here. An ideal spot. Mr. Baker. Huh? Oh, oh, nurse. But did I startle you? I didn't mean to. No, no, of course not. Oh, I'll bring just... Mrs. Baker her milk, I see. Well, I'm going up there myself. May I keep you company? Yes, of course, of course. Nurse White walked beside me to Louise's room. The chance that the night was gone. Another night of pain for Louise. I felt the sudden anger of the nurse. And a moment later, I realized how unreasonable it was. It was hard to be angry with anyone so curt, so alive, so beautiful. Even in her severe uniform, she managed to remain feminine, provocative. It was always a flower at her shoulder. Today, it was a sprig of flowering dogwood. And her quiet, unprofessional perfume was an exciting tingle in my nostrils. And then, we were in front of Louise's door. Hello, Mrs. Baker. Look what I brought you. Albert, dear. Hello, darling. Oh, I'm so glad you're back, darling. I <laughs> missed you. I missed you, too. Here's your milk. You never forget, do you, Albert? How was your day? Just fine. Wasn't it, Miss White? Oh, yes, Mrs. Baker. A very good day, all things considered. Well, I'm glad. I brought you something else, Louise. Oh, the locket. Mm. Oh, thank you, Albert, for remembering. Look, nurse, isn't it beautiful? Oh. Oh, it is. It's an old piece, isn't it? It belonged to my mother. I had to hunt all over the house for it. Whatever gave you the sudden notion you wanted it anyway? I don't know. I've had a feeling I'll be joining Mother soon. Oh, Louise, please don't talk that way. Now, Mrs. Baker, you're going to be up on your feet before you know it. And uh, that's almost enough talking tonight, Mr. Baker. No. Mrs. Baker, do you want me to leave a tablet for you? Yes, thank you, dear. Here you are. I hope you don't need to take it. Well, good night. Good night, night Miss White. The, uh, tablet. You've been taking it every night? Well, I try not to. But lately, the 
pain. Yes, I know, I know. Oh, Albert, dear, you deserve something better than oh, this. please, please, dear. Now, your nose to the grindstone to pay for the doctors and nurses. Oh, don't worry. A little handball at the club and then this room. Yes, but you're going to get better, dear. You must believe the doctor. That's what Pauline says. Pauline? The nurse. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Oh, uh, is she looking out for you all right? She's a dear. She's very pretty, don't you think? Pretty? Yes, I suppose so. I had noticed. I used to be pretty. You used to embarrass me sometimes, the way you looked at me. But you're still beautiful, Louise. You'll always be. I'm sorry, dear. I won't talk like that again. You... You'd better go now, Albert. I'll try to sleep. Yeah. Well, good night, dear. I'll see you tomorrow. Mr. Baker. Oh. Miss White. I thought you'd gone. I wanted to talk to you, Mr. Baker. Yeah? It's about Mrs. Baker. She worries me. Her, her mental state is very low. You heard how she talked yes. about her mother, the locket. Yes, I heard. She needs something. I don't know what to snap her out of this mood. I just thought I'd mention it to you. Yes, thanks. Oh, uh, where are you going? To put the morphine away. You know, I don't see why Dr. Van Tua doesn't give her more of that stuff. She needs it. Yet you ration it out as though it were poison. Well, it is poison, Mr. Baker. That's why I'm particularly careful about Mrs. Baker. But you don't think she'd actually... Oh, well, usually the ones who talk about it don't do it, Mr. Baker, so I wouldn't worry. Hmm. Oh, good night. Uh, wait a minute. Yes? Miss White. Uh, Pauline, isn't it? Why, yes, I didn't think you knew. Well, would you mind, uh, when we were alone, if I called you Pauline? Well, I'd like it. Thanks, well. You know, this is a awful thing to ask, but, well, you know, it's been pretty lonely for me. Oh, yes, I know. That is, I can guess. Well, would you... Would you let me take you to dinner this evening? Why... Thank you, Mr. Baker. I'd love it. I'm off duty at eight. Well, I'll pick you up then. And, uh, Pauline... Yes, Mr. Baker? My name... My name is Albert. At eight, then. Albert. <laughs> My heart sang. She was perfect. Everything was perfect. I had my poison. I had my witnesses. Louise had said just the right things in their presence, talking about her locket, making her veiled hints at suicide. How beautifully everything fell into place. I started toward the lobby door when I heard my name. Oh, Baker. I say, Baker. Oh, Dr. Van Tour. How are you? Oh, fine, fine. Say, I want you to meet someone. This is Dr. Martin of Toledo. I looked at him. At the man who stepped forward to shake hands with me. And my mouth went dry. This was Dr. Martin of Toledo who had given me my murder prescription. The eager, bumptious young man who stood there now looking straight into my eyes and saying, Hello. How's that bad nerve of yours? I was caught flat footed. I couldn't answer. Couldn't even turn and hide. Dr. Martin stared at me a minute, unbelieving me, and then his jaw hardened. After a long time, he put out his hand. Because there was nothing else to do, I took it. Oh, this is Mr. Baker, Doctor. It's his wife who has this trigeminal condition. His wife, eh? Well, yes, of course. You didn't think I meant Mr. Baker, did you? <laughs> He's as strong as an ox. Yes, I can see that. No. I ran into Dr. Martin in the doctor's lounge, Baker. He was telling me about a case he just saw in Toledo. Was Toledo, wasn't it, Martin? Symptoms were remarkably similar to Mrs. Baker's. Remarkably. I thought he might like to look in on Mrs. Baker. Uh, you don't mind? Uh, she, she, she's sleeping, I think. Oh, it's too bad. Well, another time, perhaps, eh, Doctor? Oh, yes, certainly, Doctor. Well, I've got to run. Glad I ran into you, Martin. Have lunch sometime, eh? Yes, glad to. I'll see you later, Baker. Yes, yeah, sure, Doctor, sure. I'll have to be going myself now, oh, Mr. Baker. Oh, wait, uh, wait, Doctor. I want to talk to you. Don't see that there's anything to talk about. Yes, but there is. I want you to know that I, uh, uh... What happened in Toledo yesterday? You don't have to explain. I understand. You understand? 
hope you didn't say anything, Dr. Ventura. Well, why should I? It's none of my business. None of my... None of your business? Of course. I admit I didn't have you tagged as an addict. Addict? Yes. You don't look like one, and that trick of refusing an immediate shot. Well, I'm going to hand it to you. You fooled me completely. And using your wife's symptoms. Very clever. I don't doubt you can get a supply whenever you need it with that routine. Oh, no, 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 no. I assure oh, sure you. Please don't bother to lie to me. <laughs> I guess I ought to thank you for teaching me that trick. It won't work again on this baby, believe me. And now, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Baker or Mr. Wentworth, I'm heading for a spot of handball. Oh, wait. Uh, yes? No hard feelings? No, no, of course not. <laughs> Look, Doctor. If you really mean that about no hard feelings and if you haven't got a partner, well, I I play a pretty good game. Now, that's what I call a switch, anyway. All right, hop in. An addict. He took me for an addict. Working on any dodge I could to get a supply of dope. Yes, but later, when he heard of Louisa's death, he remembered. I had no idea what I was going to do. Only knew that I couldn't let him go. He drove me over to the athletic club. He wasn't a member, but he held a courtesy card from the Toledo club, and he signed me in as his guest, laughing as James Wentworth. He was a fast man on the court, younger, too. I'd have had a hard time keeping up with him in any circumstances, but as it was, he beat me easily. I could think of only one thing. That he was dangerous. Dangerous, and I had to get rid of him somehow. It's a nice backhand you've got there, Baker. Yeah. Wish I could handle those tough ones half as well. Oh, never mind the compliments, Doc. They just remember the final score and be satisfied. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, how about a sweat out? They've got a good steam room here. Yeah, sounds good to me. Here, this way, then. Oh, uh, take your towel. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy, this is hot. <laughs> oh. Sit on your towel. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> oh, that was lucky for me you came along. Mm. Place is dead today, not a soul here. Well, I enjoyed it. <clears throat> oh, hot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Say, Baker, you know, I misjudged you. Uh, sorry. Oh, that's all right. Forget it. You know, you really could do something for your third trouble. Yeah? We've got a sanitarium in Toledo that's been having pretty good luck with addiction lately. I scarcely heard him. I only realized that we were alone, clouded in steam, not even visible to any casually curious person looking through the glass flare in the door. This was my chance. I'd never get another like it. Take nerve, of course. I picked up my towel. What are you doing? I'm sorry, Martin, but there's no other way. Whipped my towel over his head and got behind him where his blading arms couldn't reach me. I didn't want to leave any marks on him. With my free hand, I covered his mouth and pinched his nostril shut through the towel. He fought hard. But in, in a few minutes, he, he hung limp in my arms. And after a few minutes more, I knew he was dead. I left him there, hidden in the steam. In the locker room, I dressed quickly, parted my hair on the wrong side, and plastered it down in a way I'd never normally wear it. The man at the reception desk barely glanced at me as I passed him. Later, when they found Martin, they'd look for a man named Wentworth. They'd never find him because he didn't exist. It wasn't even that close. The papers reporting Martin's death put the cause down to heart failure brought on by the shock of exercise in the steam room. I didn't mention a companion. It wasn't important. And I waited anyway. A week. Waited and watched carefully. Because now not only Louisa's future was at stake, but my own and Pauline's. There's the nurse's quarters, darling. Hmm. Better not come any nearer. Oh, Pauline, dearest. I know, darling, I know. <laughs> oh, you... You must let go now. No, I'm, no, I'm no. late already. No, no, no. no Albert. No, yes, dear. I, I, I'm leaving the hospital. I'm taking a job in Chicago. You know what? Yes. This is hopeless. I can't stand it. 
taking care of your wife, smiling at her, seeing the two of you but, together. But, but, but you can't do it. I couldn't live without you. Now that I found you, What do you I... think this is going to do to me? But I can't. When are you going? I'm giving notice tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, my darling. Goodbye. Pauline! <laughs> said goodbye. So I knew what you meant. When I saw her again, it would be in the hospital across Louise's bed. She'd be Miss White and I'd be Mr. Baker. No, no, I couldn't stand that now. Yes, but there was one sure way to hold her. The little white tablets were still in my pocket. Albert, dear. I brought you your milk. Oh, thank you, dear. Hold this, will you please? What's that? Oh, your locket. It's beautiful, isn't it? Who shall I leave it to, I wonder? Miss White. She's a sweet girl. Oh, Louise, now don't talk that way, Louise. You're not going to... I could have it. I'll take the milk now, Albert. She drank it. I had to clench my jaws to keep from crying out. She smiled and held out the empty glass to me. And it was over. I went home and talked sleeplessly, waiting, waiting for the inevitable. Hello! Yes. Yes. No. No, 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 I'll be right over. Dr. Van Tour was outside Louise's room and a white faced Pauline and Nellie from the kitchen as I hurried up the corridor. Oh, uh, Baker. Oh, Doctor. Doctor, can I go in? No. Baker, your wife is dead. What? Baker. Oh, but I don't understand. I thought she was improving, that you that you planned to operate. She died of an overdose of morphine. Oh. Oh, Mr. Baker, I'm terribly sorry. I am too, Mr. Baker. Yes, but how how could she get it? That's what I intend to find out. She took it in this glass of milk. There are traces left. Nellie here says you brought it up to her. I didn't want you, Mr. No, that's Baker. all right, Nellie. But well, of course I took it up. I did every night. Everybody in the hospital knows that. Yes, I knew it also. Was anybody in the room when you brought it? No, no, no. Just Louise. And you saw her drink the milk? No, no, Doctor. She she didn't drink it then, not until after I'd gone. She did that frequently. Well, that's right, Doctor. Yes, I know that, too. Only last night, before she drank it, she managed to dissolve in it a lethal dose of morphine. I've checked the hospital supply. Every tablet is accounted for. We keep a very strict count, you know. Yes, I know that. Have you anything to say, Baker? Well, I... I hardly know. I... I'm stunned. Doctor, what do you mean? Surely you're not accusing Mr. Baker. I'm not accusing anyone. That will be up to the police. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doctor. You're making a mistake. It seems perfectly clear. Yes, but I didn't kill her. Oh, no? Then how did she die? Well, she... She she, she took her own life. She'd hinted more than once. Miss White, you remember? Yes, Doctor. I spoke to Mr. Baker about it myself. You know she was very yeah. depressed. That's true, nurse, but the morphine, it must have come from the outside, or we'd have missed it. No, no wait a minute. The the tablet you left for her each night. Yes, I ordered that. But what if it instead of taking it, she saved it? Oh, I But she must have. It's the only way it could have happened. Well, that's it, Doctor. It must be. For the past week she's been exhausted and drawn in the morning, yet. The tablets were always gone. Well, if that's the case, nurse, how does it happen that you failed to find them? But she couldn't leave her bed. You bathed her and changed the linen every day. The locket. The locket? Yes. Yes, of course. You remember, Miss White? She made such a point of asking me to bring you to her. And then the way she talked about joining her mother. Yes, I do. I do remember. She wanted you to have the locket, Pauline. It was the last wish. Now, where is it? I, uh, I have it here. Clutched in her hand. Uh, let's. Hmm. Police headquarters, please. Do you, you have to notify them? Yes, I do. Police headquarters. 
Give me homicide. Homicide? Yes, I'll wait. Are you out of your mind? I just got through explaining everything. Yes, you explained everything, including what still puzzled me. You see, Baker, you were right about this locket. Your wife did have a reason for wanting it. Look, I'll open it. You see, it's full. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven quarter grain morphine tablets that she saved at the cost of seven nights of agony. And she would have taken them last night. Only you beat her to it. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Charles Boyer in the case of Henri Dibar, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Mr. Wilcox, Philbert's taking me to the junior prom tonight. Isn't that exciting? Why, Dora, my tempestuous teenage neighbor, it's almost as exciting as that exemplary exponent of extra starting dependability, the Autolite Stay-Full Battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Gee whiz, Mr. Wilcox, I want to talk about the dance. Well, so do I, Dora, the dance of delight you devotees of driving will do when you find out how much more you get with an Autolite Stay-Full Battery. You see, tests show this famous battery gives 70% longer average life than batteries without stay-full features. And those tests were based on SAE life cycle standards. Silver's kept every dance in reserve. Reserve? That reminds me, Dora. The Autolite stay-full battery has three times as much liquid reserve as batteries without the stay-full features. That's why it needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Mr. Wilcox, you ought to see. No, friends, see your neighborhood Autolite battery dealer tomorrow. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with the case of Henri Vibar and the performance of Charles Boyer, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. I watched the taxi cab enter the gate and roll slowly up the driveway toward the entrance. Gladstone Memorial Rest Home is a big, busy place. Dozens of cars come and go every day, and yet somehow this cab caught my attention and held it. It seemed to fascinate me. As it approached, yes, uh, I got a definite feeling of menace from it. These warnings, these premonitions, they come to me whenever I'm in danger. Danger? What danger? The cab stopped. Just below my window, and a man got out. Surgeon Jack Freeman of the London Bureau of Missing Persons. He came here often, checking on new arrivals. Nothing to fear from Freeman. <laughs> He's just a big, good-natured moron. But now he was assisting a, a woman from the tab. The sight of her made something snap inside my head. The woman was Mary, my wife. <laughs> Mary, the sudden sight of her made me furious. I would have enjoyed striking her dead then and there. But how was it possible? Mary, free, walking around like a decent woman? She'd been convicted of murder, sentenced to life in prison. Now, 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 was it possible she was out on parole? No, think this justice is harsh with killers. And Mary's crime had been cold-blooded murder. Suddenly I understood. Mary was being brought here to Gladstone Rest Home to identify me. <laughs> the simple people. Trap and Rivi Bar. <laughs> it was amusing. I might have a few unpleasant moments, but that would be all. I would make a fool of her. I'd always made a fool of her. I remained by the window for some time, planning just what to say and how to act. After a while, there was a knock on the door. Oh, this would be Dr. Sampson, the chap who runs this place. Nice fellow, Sampson. Not too smart, but... Come in! Hey, good afternoon, Monsieur Leclerc. Oh, Dr. Sampson, come in. You have a visitor. Sergeant Freeman again. 
He'd like another chat with you in my office. Oh, Freeman, the bloodhound. <laughs> Tell me truly, Doctor. Does he ever find any of the people he looks for? Oh, indeed he does. Hundreds of them every year. Well, he has failed utterly and mighty. With you, monsieur, he has a good excuse. Most victims of amnesia have people searching for them. Friends or relations who can identify them. I'm beginning to think you'll just have to recover your own memory. Recover my memory? I wish I could forget. A few minutes later, I was sitting across the desk from Sergeant Freeman. I had the other hand, of course, because I knew what was coming. As usual, he was humble, apologetic, and yet, for the first time since I'd known him, oh, uh, I got a definite feeling that he was deliberately trying to trap me, catching some trifling mistake. Yes, I have an instinct that warns me. Uh, just a, a few more questions, Monsieur Leclerc. Well, as many as you like, Sergeant. You're looking very well. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, uh, think hard, sir. Does the name Vibar mean anything to you? Henri Vibar? Vibar? Uh, Vibar. No, no, I can't say it does. Ah. Um, how about Falmouth? Ever spend a summer at Falmouth down in Cornwall? Uh, never heard of the place, Sergeant. Yeah, very well. Uh, how about the, the name Willard, an American, retired sea captain? Sickly old fellow in a wheelchair. Oh, tell me more about him, Sergeant. Well, sir, <laughs> unless we're wrong again, you married his daughter. Oh, a wife and a father-in-law. <laughs> You're very generous, Sergeant. Uh, did you bring them along? Captain Willard was an invalid. He committed suicide. Felt he stood in the way of his daughter's happiness. Left a bit of money, though, about uh, 10,000 pounds. <laughs> I could hardly keep from laughing at Freeman. He went on telling how Mary and her father came to England on a visit, how I met her at Falmouth, how her father objected to our romance. Freeman had most of the facts uh, straight, except that uh, Captain Willer did not commit suicide. No, I arranged that little matter. <laughs> was quite easy. He suffered from a bad heart condition. To take me in for it. So I managed to contrive an overdose for him. I put it in his pot of tea. <laughs> a rather bitter tea, I imagine, but then he liked it strong. When Mary and I returned from the beach, he was dead. But he didn't leave 10,000 pounds, more like 5,000. Freeman went on with the story, on oh, and on. I'm, well, completely wrong. You and Mary Willard were married. Settled up Captain Willard's estate, which is practically all cash, then went up to London to live. Now, Monsieur Leclerc, does none of that strike a familiar note? Uh, well, uh, you seem to think it should. Why, Sergeant Freeman? Because you've been identified from those pictures we took of you when you first came here. Really? Who? Oh, oh, oh the woman, of course. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mrs. Vibar says you are her husband. Well, she probably discovered that I have money, and... Uh... How? How could she possibly know that? Sir? Well, you could have told her, Sergeant Freeman. Innocently, of course. No secret. Oh, I don't mind, but... It makes me a perfect target for designing women. One moment, Mr. Leclerc. Uh, um, let's, uh, let's talk about your money for a while. Doesn't it strike you as strange that a man could walk into this rest home, as you did three years ago, carrying $200,000 in American money? Why, of course, it's strange. Suppose. Suppose you had committed a crime. Wouldn't it have been a perfect way to elude the police? Yes, but uh, if I were a criminal, you would have my fingerprints. You said so yourself three years ago. Remember? You came here carrying nothing but money. No extra clothing, no papers, nothing by which you could be identified. Now, Sergeant, what sort of crime are we discussing? <laughs> murder? <laughs> it would have to be murder. You detectives. And who did I kill? Well, to be honest about it, we don't know. Oh, just uh, anyone. To be this woman's husband, I must have murdered somebody. Well, that makes her very effective, I'm sure. Uh, tell me, did she help me with the job? She was tried for the murder, convicted and sentenced to spend the rest of her life in prison. Would you uh, care to hear about it? Well, not particularly, but it's part of your job, and we've rather taken over Dr. Sampson's office. Oh, oh, oh that, that's quite all right. I, I find this very interesting. Well, it's not interesting to me, because Freeman had the story all wrong. He just knew Mary's side of it, and there was so much she didn't know. We buried the old man, got married collected the old man's insurance, and went up to London to live. It was very nice for a few months, but the money didn't last long. Very soon I was broke. 
nasty feeling, being broke, a bit nervous, uncertain of myself. Fortunately, just as things were getting really bad, I met an American friend, a chap I had met in New York a few years before, named uh, Nick Blackburn. He had a lot of American bonds, hot bonds he called them, but he didn't know how to dispose of them. It was a simple matter for me with my connections on the continent. Blackburn stipulated one thing. He wanted to be paid in American dollars. That delayed matters for a few days. And finally, when I received the money, I decided not to share it with Blackburn. So, instead of keeping my appointment with him, I went to my hotel, sent Mary out on a fool's errand, and packed my grips for a quick disappearance. <laughs> I'm very clever at quick disappearances. I was all packed, ready to leave, when there was a knock on the door. That startled me. If Blackburn didn't know where I was living, and Mary couldn't get home for an hour. Who could it be? Again the knock. My nerves steady down. They never fail me in a tight spot. Hello? What is it? Sergeant Randall, Scotland Yard. Well, what do you want? Uh, some information, that's all, sir. Uh, did you attend the Palladium last night with a man named Nate Blackburn? Well, yes. Yes, I did. What uh, about it? We're trying to find Mr. Blackburn. Uh, do you have his address? Oh, now, look here. I'm trying to catch a train. I know very little about Nate Blackburn, except that he's a thoroughly respectable businessman. You've been misled, Mr. V. Barr. Nate Blackburn's a bad one. Uh, tell me, uh, did he talk to you about bonds? Bonds? What sort of bonds? Stolen bonds, Mr. V. Barr. They're part of an American post office robbery during which two policemen were killed. Well, only today we traced the bonds to Nate Blackburn. But he seems to have disappeared. Now, no, this we is too silly. Please, clear out. Give me some other day. Oh, too bad, sir. I can't. We must get Nate Blackburn's address. Well, suppose I say I don't know it. Oh, I can't accept that, Mr. Vibar. Perhaps you'd better come along with me to the yard. If you can convince Captain Nichols... Now, now, one moment, please. Uh, Blackburn did give me his address. Well, if I remember it and give it to you, will you go away and stop bothering me? Mr. Vibar, I ask you a simple question. All I want is an honest answer. All right. I'll give it to you. Blackburn lives at the Afton Hotel, Suite 618. You dirty, rotten, scurvy rat. No, 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 no. I mean it. He's probably there right now. Here, I'll get him on a telephone. Ah, never mind the phone. Of course he's there. Waiting for you to show up with our money. Where is it? What became of your English accent? Come up with that dough and quick. Well, uh, I don't have it. I, I have the money in the mail. I've been tailing you all day. I saw you sell the stuff an hour ago. Come on, V-Bar. I want the money. That gun doesn't frighten me. You wouldn't dare kill me. No, but I can put a couple of slugs in your legs. How about that? Want to be a cripple the rest of your life? No, 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 wait. Wait. I intended to deliver the money to Nate personally, but, uh, well, <laughs> he doesn't trust me. Now, nah, please, put that gun away. There, that's better. I have an aversion to fire. Where's the money? There, in that grape on the table. Huh? The small one. Uh, huh. Good. Old bills. Not in sequence. Can't see any marks. Drop that money. Huh? Hey, what's that thing? A gun? Put that money on the table. Let's see that gadget. And still, don't move. Don't tell me it shoots real bullets. Stop. Stay where you are. Stay away from me. Give me that thing. Stop, I said. I shoot. Come on, hand it over. No, no. Ah. Ah. You jerk. You silly shit. He fell dead right at my feet. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Charles Boyer in the case of Henri Vibar. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, Dora, what's the matter? You look blue. Gilbert just called. His car wouldn't start because the battery's dry, and now he can't go to the dance. <laughs> dry your eyes, my pretty neighbor. I'll lend Filbert my car. Oh, gee, thanks, Mr. Wilcox. You're wonderful. Oh, not half as wonderful as the Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. If Filbert knew that, he wouldn't be stuck. Oh, now, don't be hard on poor Filbert. He just hasn't heard that the Autolite Stay Full battery has a fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate to keep the power-producing material in place for longer battery life. Why, in recent tests, based on SAE life cycle standards, 
Autolite Stay Full batteries gave 70%. Longer average life than batteries without Stay Full features. I can hardly wait to get started. Well, you don't have to wait to get started with an Autolite Stay Full battery. It's a demon for starting stamina. And needs water only three times a year in normal car use. I'll tell Filbert to remember... You're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Charles Boyer, in the case of Henri Vibar, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It's a terrible thing to, to kill a man like that, to see him go limp and be forward on his face. Just the memory of it made me sick. I must have betrayed my feelings because Sergeant Freeman stopped whatever you were saying. Anything wrong, sir? Eh? Oh, pardon me, Sergeant Freeman. My mind strayed for a moment from what you were saying. But, uh, you look ill, monsieur. What? Are you sure you feel all oh, right? I'm quite all right, Dr. Sam. Sergeant Freeman, please continue with your story. I, I found it quite interesting. Oh, thank you. Well, when Madame Vibar returned, her husband had a, a fantastic story to tell her. Only a woman in love could have believed such an Fantastic tale. There you have an example of Sergeant Freeman's intelligence. Fantastic? It was a masterpiece. Far above anything his meager brain could understand. I think I told you how my mind was best in a crisis. Well, it works now like a well-oiled machine. I had nothing to fear from the police. I could explain this dead man as a, well, a thief or a burglar. But what about Nate Blackburn? After this, it never stopped looking for me. Nate is a killer. Human life means nothing to him. No, no, I'd have to disappear. Make it absolutely convincing. Well, I could do just that. No one, not even my adoring wife, would ever hear of me again. I would dissolve into thin air and take $200,000 with me. The sight of the dead man sickened me. So I dragged him into the bedroom and closed the door. Then I sat down and planned out every detail of the wonderful scheme. Of course, I wiped my fingerprints from the little gun I had used and left it on the table where my wife would be sure to handle it. Funny thing, Nate and I had talked about fingerprints. He had bragged that none of his men had ever been fingerprinted. Neither did I. Maybe that's what gave me the inspiration. By the time Mary came home, I had every detail of my plan. Hello, dear. Your man didn't show up, maybe. Honey, what's the matter? Mary, I'm in trouble. Trouble, dear? What? I... I killed a man. Henry, don't fool about such things. Uh, I'm not fooling, Mary. Look, here. Oh! No, don't go in. Henry, who is it? How did it happen? Good girl. I was afraid you, you'd go to pieces. Never mind me. What about you? Well, I'm in for it, I guess. No, it couldn't have been your fault. You wouldn't hurt anyone, please, Henry. How did it happen? Well, this man in there, he gave me some bonds. Asked me to sell them for him. I lost them. Don't ask me how. Oh. Some uh, thief must have picked my pocket. Anyway, this man came up here today and demanded the bonds or the money for them. I tried to explain, to reason with him, but he wouldn't listen. He got rough, and I, well, I managed to get that little gun of yours. We struggled for it, went off, and... Well, no, but it was self-defense. Oh, what English jury would believe that? The man did give me the bonds. If for witnesses, who would believe I didn't sell them and keep the money? And then kill that man to keep him from talking. We've got to be practical, Mary. Did you call the police? No. No. I waited for you. Why, Henry? Why? Because there is a possible way out if you'll stand by me. Stand by you? But I'll do anything you say. Mary, it will take nerve. If you weaken... Henry, you're my husband. I love you. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. <laughs> All life problems were as simple as women. I told her my plan. The dead man looked like me in a general way. My size, black hair, eyeglasses. And after he dropped 20 floors to the street, he wouldn't have any features. Mary would simply hurry downstairs, perhaps a bit hysterical, which would be difficult in the circumstances. Identify my broken body, 
and allow herself to be consoled. It could be suicide or an accident, whichever suited her. Only she forgot. She forgot about the bullet in the man's body. Yes, the bullet that would convict her of killing her own husband. My plan was a great inspiration, but it had one terrifying angle. To make identification complete, I had to, to change clothes with a dead man. That was a fearful ordeal, nightmare, but it had to be done. It was almost too much for me, but I think I told you, I'm equal to anything if I put my mind to it. But I'll take to my grave the horrible memory of dragging that body to the bedroom window and pushing it through. I walked down the back stairs, 20 flights of them. I saw a crowd in the street around the body. I took a bus, the first one I saw. I changed to another and another, destroying everything that might identify me, but keeping the little bag filled with money. It's quite a coincidence, Monsieur Leclerc. What? What? I, I didn't get that. I say it's quite a coincidence that you came to this rest home the day following the murder of Henri Vibar. Well, very well. Make the most of it. Mr. Sampson, do you consider that coincidence? I had to come here sometime. Yes, Sergeant Freeman, uh, since he's here, he had to come sometime. Well, apparently you've got this woman with you. Bring her in. Let's get through with this fog. Thank you. Thank you. That, that will be good. Madame Vibar, will you come in, please? The big moment. And I wasn't even excited. I'm like that. Little things may bother me, but big things, really important things, and my nerves are like steel. Mary walked into the room. I looked at her without a flicker of an eye. She was a changed girl now, so different from the girl I married. Prison does that, I suppose. She was looking at me. Our eyes met and held. For a moment, there seemed a shadow of doubt in her face. Then she took a step toward me. Hello, Henry. Now, now, young woman, please. Don't try to involve me in your trouble. I have plenty of my own. Henry, it won't do. You can't get away with it. Now, Dr. Sampson, this woman is either crooked or crazy. Let's take this calmly. Madame Vibar, you're positive this man is your husband? Oh, yes. This is Henry Vibar. He pronounces it Henri. Never mind the pronunciation. Is he the man? Yes, sir. He's changed a little. It's only three years. He looks older. His hair has turned grey and he isn't wearing his glasses, but he's the same Glasses? <laughs> One moment, please. I never wore glasses in my life. My vision is perfect. Monsieur Leclerc, if that is your name, suppose you try to read this newspaper without glasses. Oh, no, no, look. I'm in no mood to give demonstrations just to please... There, you see, he doesn't dare. Make him try, Henry, a word, I tell you, not a word. <coughs> Monsieur Leclerc, it might be expedient. It would certainly settle the issue once and for all. Oh, very well, Doctor, since you suggest it. Give me the paper. <laughs> I pretended to be nervous, just to give them a thrill. Then I opened the paper to the want ad. Read them off, glibly, the small print. Glasses? <laughs> I've got eyes like a hawk. <laughs> Mary didn't know that because the summer I met her, uh, I was avoiding the police and part of my disguise included glasses and touching up my prematurely gray hair. I never told Mary. I didn't know how far I could trust her. When I finished reading the paper, Mary just stared at me, unable to believe the evidence of her own eyes. Silence for a moment, then I'm... Sorry, sir. Well, perhaps this young woman can think up some other difficult trick she'd like me to perform. A trick? It was a trick. He can't read. Madame Vibar, we've had quite enough. No, this is my husband. He fooled you. That's all that paper. It's a trick. Of course, a trick. I did it with mirrors. Young woman, you're not clever. You've got plenty of nerve, all right, but you're not clever. Oh, Why didn't you say I have a mole on my right shoulder, a small scar on my hip, and very flat feet? Almost anyone could have told you these things. I use a swimming pool every day. Uh, Sergeant Freeman, I can't applaud your part in this. For three years, I've done my best to help you. 
Because I thought you were trying to help me regain my memory and take my, my rightful place in society. Well, I must tell you, sir, I no longer feel that way. Not after you tried to connect me with this jailbird. Jailbird. That's right, <clears throat> Henry. I'm a jailbird and I deserve to be. I helped you and that was wrong. But don't think you're safe. I'll rot and die in prison, but you won't know about it. You'll be dead. Oh, for heaven's sake, take this woman away. Yes, Sergeant. Come Davis. along, Madame Lieber. No, let me tell him something. Have you forgotten Nate Blackburn, Henry? Well, he hasn't forgotten you. Blackburn. Nate Blackburn came to me in prison, and I told him the whole thing. By tomorrow, he'll know right where to find you. He knows. Now. There, in the doorway, stood Nate Blackburn. He got in his hand. He was smiling. Dr. Sanson and Freeman started forward, but he waved them back with a gun. No one spoke as he walked across the room and stopped in front of me. Hello, Frenchy. <laughs> well, you had, had some mistake. Yeah, but you made it, Frenchy. I had a hunch you'd get together with your wife sooner or later. I spent a lot of time and money keeping an eye on her. Look here, my man. Put away that gun. That sort of thing doesn't go in this country. You're right, copper, I know. Only this is a special occasion. You won't get a mile away. I know that, too. Now, Blackburn, I'll give you the money. What money? Will that bring back Jack Randall? Will it put this girl back in circulation? Yes, yes, listen, listen to me. I, I can explain if you let me. It, it, it wasn't like you think at all. Nate, we used to be pals. Remember? New York, San Francisco, Paris. We are lots of fun. I bail you out in Rio. I'll make good, Nate. I swear I will. Only... No, don't. So, I lasted, after all. You didn't think I could, did you, Doctor? You don't know me? Any time I really try, I can I can't. Dr. Sampson, can you sign this confession? I doubt it, Sergeant. He's too badly off. Yes. Yes, I... I... I can... Uh, I didn't think he could. Is he gone? That's all. <laughs> Strange fellow. Not at all the criminal type. Hmm? What is the criminal type, Doctor? I've never found it. <laughs> Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Charles Boyer. Mr. Wilcox, why do you always say you're always right with Autolite? Because, little jitterbug, it's true. Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, voltage regulators, wire and cables, starting motors, electric windshield wipers. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. Don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Mr. Broderick Crawford. The play is called Deadline, and it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Luskin. The Case of Henri Vibar is an original play written for radio by Bradbury Foote. Charles Boyer may soon be seen in the Douglas Sirk production, The First Legion. You can buy Autolite staple batteries, Autolite standard or resistor spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you The One Millionth Joe, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear and starring Mr. Jack Carson. I'm Al Gersant. From A to Z in public relations is how I bill myself. And there was this stunt which I dreamed up for the Bureau of Better Business Promotion to pay off the 4th of July weekend. But I hadn't counted on the fireworks, which in this case was a big 45 jammed in the middle of my back. Yes, in a moment, Mr. Jack Carson and a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Say, uh, Wilcox, if the bases are loaded with two men out, who's the boy you'd like to see up there at bat? Why, the spark plug of the team, of course. The lad who's right there with that surefire never-miss power. Say, that reminds me of ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. You see, Autolite spark plugs are a vital part of the team, too. Well, how do you mean, uh, part of what team? Well, just this half. Autolite engineers engineer complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. So naturally, they engineer Autolite spark plugs to work as a perfect team with the coil, distributor, and all the other important parts of a car's ignition system. And that's mighty important. Yeah, I see. That's what you mean when you say auto light spark plugs are ignition engineered. Absolutely right, Hap. And that's why they can't be beat for quick starting, smooth performance, and gas mileage. So, friends, see your friendly auto light spark plug dealer tomorrow. Have worn out spark plugs replaced with world famous ignition engineered auto light spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the standard type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with auto light. And now, with the one millionth Joe and the performance of Jack Carson, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Yes, I'm Al Gersant, like I said. I, I started to tell you about this publicity stunt I dreamed up for the Bureau of Better Business Promotion. Well, me and some businessmen with a few reporters, cameramen, and such were out at the airport. Transworld Argus, flight 24 from Chicago. Argus, flight 24. Now, come on, come on, gang. This will be at gate five. Well, come on, Crowley, fellas, boys and girls. Hey, Tiny, you got that camera hot? You got your oranges, Mr. Wilder? Yeah. I still think a three-piece band looks paltry, sent. A paltry schmaltry, Mr. Wilder. What we care about is newspaper coverage. Now, now, stand back when they start coming also through the gate. arriving, gate five, passengers from the Bobcat line, flight 16 from Houston. Well, another plane. Is this a horse race or is this a horse race? Boy, oh, boy. I declare I'm all over goosebumps. That's the plane you chartered, Algie, for all these relatives you're ringing in? Oh, <laughs> lay off. This deal's on the level. Who oh, you uh, kidding? Uh, uh, he takes his cut coming and going. Lay off. Look. Hey, here they come, so stand back. You count, Wilder, and me and Mr. Allen will now. Now, the last number was uh, 999,990. Ten to go. Okay. 991, 992, 993. Well, if I have to say so myself, I'm a pretty smooth operator. At this moment, I had one client, the Bureau of BBP. And the stud I dreamed up for them was a honey. This was the setup. Nab the one millionth show through the airport, be he male, female, or what have you, and give this lucky character a 24-hour whirl in the house. Pictures, prizes, tickets to this and that. And all the businesses had chipped in, and it was a good fat kitty. And it worked out to be near the 4th of July, which was a great tie-in. So now, a herd of passengers were stampeding through gate five from two planes. The big Chicago plane, and the little one from Houston. And all unbeknownst to them, lightning was about to strike. Six. Hey, ain't this exciting, fellas, huh? Oh, yeah, really. Well, ain't it? 997. Hey, it's gonna be that good. 998. That guy in the gray hat's moving up there. 999. Hey, yeah, stand back, will you? Hey, hey, you watch it, mister. Yeah, oh, my goodness. Oh, stupid, hey, watch where you're going. Well, go on, go on, if you're in such a hurry. Hey, and the guy wins. He knocked the gal out of the running. One million. That's him. <laughs> 
One moment, sir. I, I, I want to... What do you want? Who are you? Uh, look over here, mister. Over here, look this way. Get what it is here, this, buddy. anyway? Hang the flowers around his neck. Oh, please. Let go. You've made a mistake. Let go. No, no, look. They, they, they can't get pictures when you jump around like that. I don't want my picture taken. Let go. How's this, Crowley? Mister, unbeknownst to you, you are the one millionth passenger to walk through these Let gates. Let me go, or I'll... As guest of the Bureau of DBP, from now on until the 4th of July, your hotel is paid for. Oh. You will visit the lion farm. And, uh, uh, mister, uh, hold still. Yeah, pick on someone else. I don't want anything. You will lunch with a motion picture star, eat at a world-famous restaurant, be the recipient of many free gifts gratis, a mink sling cape, two dozen sports shirts, 2,000 cans of dog food, a free airplane pass anywhere in the whole wide world. Huh? Aha! Uh -huh. Something strikes your fancy. An airplane pass to, uh, say, Brazil? Sure, sure, you name it. Yes, sir? Even to the romantic land of your dreams south of the border. Now, sir, what, uh, what is your name? I'm A.D. Thompson. Uh, where are you from, Mr. Thompson? Uh, Missouri. Businessman? Missouri. Yes, rugs. Retired. Uh, did you and Plain to hear from Chicago or from Houston, Mr. Thompson? Uh, Houston. Hold up one of these oranges, Mr. Thompson, and huh? tuck the crate under your arm. Oh. And smile. Smile. That's it. Uh, snap it, Tiny. Got it. On behalf of the Great Valley Citrus Company, it gives me pride and pleasure to present you. So how was I to know that the trouble was giving me the leer? He looked surefire. Mr. A.T. Thompson. Middle-aged, middle-sized, middle-ugly. Mr. John Q. Public himself. Well... In the meantime, that blonde, the one Mr. Thompson had rammed out of line on the other side of the gate, she, she'd been standing by listening. She was a tall, rangy, good-looking blonde, and, well, all of a sudden she moved in on me. You running this powwow, Buster? By rights, all those prizes belong to me. Oh, no. Honey, play fair. Mr. Thompson here sideswiped me, or I would have come through the gate ahead of him. Technically, miss, Mr. Thompson came through first. Look, my chin hurts, and I don't like being shoved around. Win or lose, I can make trouble, Buster. I can sue you cross-eyed and you know it. Uh, that, that you can. Uh, that, that she can, Mr. Wilder. I stand if the Bureau gets sued, you be... Hey, well, now, miss, now, the Bureau wants to be perfectly fair and square with you. Only I don't see hey, how... Hey, in most contests where there's a tie, they have to give duplicate prizes, Mr. Wilder. Yeah, thanks a lot. Hey, yes, if that's right, we'll give duplicate prizes. Uh, well, that's hey, more like... Okay, okay, music, boys! Ladies and gentlemen of the, of the press, we have a Miss One in a Million also. Tell the boys your name, honey, where you're from, and what you think of sunny California. Well, I'm Vera Valerie. I've lived all over. Just flew in from Chicago. Been singing in a place out there. A canary, boy. Oh, no. And I think California's just wonderful. Give us a big smile, Miss Valerie. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this way, Miss Valerie. Atta girl. Where's the guy with the great throat? <laughs> So the, the doll was declared in, which was okay by me. In fact, every time she said hello, it was plain old nuclear fission with me. Uh, but that's, that's not strictly a part of this story. Well, anyhow, from the airport, I carted Thompson and Vera Valerie to the hotel diplomat where I live myself, on a do bill. There was considerable yammer about that extra free room gratis for Vera, but finally the manager coughed up another single. Uh, there were some hours to kill before we could go out to the lion farm, so I took a cold shower, made a few calls, and then wended my way to the Whispering Palm. Well, high time, Buster. I'm three up on you. Well, I got problems now. Henry, Henry, bring me a Parsons pitfall. Hey, how they treating you, honey? What's the number of your room? Um, four-something. Four-twelve, four-twenty. Well, I know it's the fourth floor. Ah, uh, well, that I'll check. Yeah, I, I got headaches with this stunt, but <laughs> you're worth it, doll. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. When I barged into the act, you wanted to wring my neck. No, no, no. I was only figuring how I could swing the whole show for you without Thompson. Oh, sweet. <laughs> well, since we promised double prizes. Yeah, but I got to deliver on Big Mouth's promises, and the fur joint says one mink cape, period. Oh. Also, France World told me they aren't serving double passes to Brazil this season. But Thompson doesn't look like the mink coat type to me. We, we can give him the... Ah, oh, but doll, it was a trip that you wanted. Oh, forget it. Only why is Thompson so anxious to get the pass? Well, I don't know. Look, Buster, I bought the newspapers. Did you read this? Texas police hunt ruthless killer. Yeah, I noticed that line. Why? Read the story. Well, 
Sheriff's Office, Pikesville, Texas, reported discovery of two murdered men, Highway 26, 12 miles northeast of town. Dead men, members of the gang who held up Arcana Oil Company's offices in Pikesville. Well, I don't get this. Pikesville's near Houston, isn't it? Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Police believe they were double-crossed by a third member of gang who shot them, making off with entire loot from robbery. Notice how Thompson hung on to that briefcase? Nearly $100,000 in large denomination bills. Wow. The serial numbers are so and so and so and so, 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 so No description of killer available. Interesting. You've got something. He wouldn't want to spend any, any of those bills here, but in Brazil. Do we tip off the cops? One hundred grand. Huh? Yeah, no, no, not yet. Uh, let me handle this, doll. I'll stall him on that pass to Brazil till we know for sure. You, um, you wouldn't make a deal with him, would you, Buster? Who, me? Well, that wouldn't be ethical. <laughs> well, we got to have proof, honey. Now, admit it, we got to have proof. Which was the truth, but not quite the whole truth. That, that I now admit. You see, the thought of that 100 G's had sent me into a spin, and I wanted time to figure out how I could cut in on those sweet, crisp dineros. If I could prove that Thompson was my man. Well, that afternoon, Thompson kind of played right into my hands. We were out to the lion farm. The boys were snapping pictures of Vera cuddling the king of beasts when Thompson, clutching that briefcase, pulled me off to one side. No more pictures of me, Zant. And keep the ones they took at the airport out of the papers. Keep them? Say, that wouldn't be ethical. What do you mean? Well, no paper's going to print two pictures on this stunt, and... <laughs> no offense, Thompson, but whose puss would you choose if you was a desk man? Yours or Vera's? held him for the nuts. And I had one more angle on Mr. T. That he was afraid somebody somewhere would know him from his picture. Well, that evening, we were in from Mike Romanoff's and Ciro's and Slapsy Maxie's. And for such a world, I always dress up like a dog's dinner, so I went up to my room to change. Come in, Zan. Close the door. Well, Thompson, what are you doing here? Waiting for me? Hey, you're not going to Romanoff's dress like... I'm not going out this evening. Yeah? Okay. It's no skin off me if you buy your own dinner. How soon do I get that ticket? Ticket, chum? To Brazil. How soon can I leave? Well, I guess there are flights every day to Mexico and from there to Brazil. Get my ticket for tomorrow night. Well, now, that's one of the prizes that you and Vera got to toss for, you see. Get that ticket how... tomorrow. Give her the mink cape. Give her anything, everything. But I want that airplane pass. Oh, oh, oh. it's clear you want it, but... I want it, and I'm going to have it. Huh? Would, uh, would you have a little deal in mind? Deal? Or words to that effect. Maybe. Or maybe not. Get the ticket, and we'll talk. But deal or not, Zant, there's nothing I won't do to get that pass. Do you understand? Nothing! I understand. Nothing. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Jack Carson in The One Millionth Joe. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, Harlow, did you ever notice that if one ball player goes into a slump, the whole team seems to bog down? Well, that's natural, Hap. Each man is a vital part of the team. Just as spark plugs are a vital part of the team that makes up the ignition system of your car. And Autolite spark plugs are ignition engineered by the same Autolite engineers who design complete ignition systems used as original factory equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. They have team spirit, eh, Wilcox? Right, Hap. Autolite spark plugs are built to function as a perfect team with the coil, distributor, and all the other parts of the ignition system. Why, ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs are world famous for their quality and dependability. Honey cell for quick starting, smooth performance, and gas mileage. Right you are, Hap. So stop in at your friendly Autolite dealers tomorrow. Have worn out spark plugs replaced with ignition engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the standard type, you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Jack Carson, in The One Millionth Joe, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. So I showed Vera the town that night, along with some reporters, and without the truculent Mr. T. As I told Thompson, there was no skin off me if he bought his own dinner. Anyway, I was, I was real glad that Vera and I could finish that evening alone. 
It was a last night spot scheduled, and therefore, on the cut. The place was jumping, and the newsboys was having a high old time. Garson! Garson, another round of drinks, sir. That's the way to talk about you, boy. Nice to you, young. How about champagne? Yeah, you don't want the Bureau to look cheap, Algie, boy. What about my dance with Miss Valerie? Well, I'm willing and waiting. Now, now, wait wait up, boys. While you're still sober and able to listen. Speed, speed, speed. Now, look, I, I, I got an announcement to make. I ought to all be at the airport tomorrow night for... France World's part in this stunt. The free pass. Now, where to, Al? Who's going? The Al-Gan. free pass it is, but I want you boys to have a little suspense. Hmm? Just be at the airport from 10 p.m. on. One or another of our two winners will be taking off for parts unknown, but who or where to, you got to be there to see. Hey, Buster, you didn't tell me Yeah, well, yet. come on, Bear. Let's let you and me bunny hug. A drink up, you mugs, and don't be bashful about asking for more of the same. But Buster, you haven't... Come thought... on, Vera. Oh, Buster, tell me. Now, come on, doll. Just snuggle up and dance. Uh-huh. Smooth. Mm-hmm. I, um, I saw you and Thompson huddling at the lion farm. Yeah, well, he was telling me that he's camera shy. Oh, he is, is he? Uh-huh. But later in my room, Thompson showed his teeth. Said I should hand over that pass to Brazil or else. Oh, look, we got to tip off the cop. Oh, sure, honey, as soon as we got proof. Proof? Yeah. This phony blows in from Houston, clutching a briefcase to his breast, nearly blows his top when you pick him out of the crowd until you mention an airplane pass. Not enough. Not enough. Look, if I call in the cops and Thompson turns out to be only a gink with a screw loose, I'm in trouble. Capital T trouble. You got to see my side. Then what are you doing to get more proof? Ah, that's where you come in, dude. You think you could get Thompson to flash some of that dough if he has it? Come again? Well, I figure out some way to make him show his money. See if it comes out of the briefcase and if it's in big denomination bills. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Well, tackle him first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning, I'll get the ticket. Then the first chance we get, we compare notes. And if what I find out adds up... Then you be packed and ready to leave tomorrow night. To Brazil? Maybe I want to go later. And maybe I want to go to Honolulu. Maybe. After the spouting I just did to the reporters, somebody's got to be in that plane or bluey my stunt. Which, so far as this story goes, wound it up for that night. A doll girl. Was she ever the deluxe type? I freely admit, she rocked me. Yeah, well, come morning, I was up with the birds or thereabouts. I checked and found out that Vera had last sued Mr. Thompson for breakfast. Huh? So far, so good. So I hustled myself down to Transworld and got the ticket. A long green strip of confetti. Real and returned. Then the big day commenced, and Thompson came along. No doubt to keep an eye on me. So me and Vera weren't able to huddle until some hours later on a soundstage out at Colossus Pictures. Uh, when they've got this shot lined up, I'll introduce you folks to Vincent. He's the director. I'm producing this. Uh, Mr. Thompson, did you say you were in rug? Uh, yes, uh, retired. Uh, the rug we use in this set might interest you. Uh, That's a good officer. idea, Arthur. Give the rug a once-over, Mr. T. Uh, yeah. This way, Mr. Thompson. You see in a picture of the producer. Buster, I got him to show me his money. Yeah? Out of the briefcase? Yeah. He took the briefcase along to breakfast. How'd you work it? Well, I ordered everything I could see on the menu. Yeah, yeah. And when the waiter brought our check, it was almost 16 bucks. Oh, oh, oh. fish around in my purse and said, how perfectly awful. I've only got $1.75 to my name. You will have to pay the check, Mr. T, and let me pay you back. <laughs> well, the waiter was standing off giving us a cold eye. So Thompson unzips his briefcase a couple of inches and fishes out a $500 bill. Five cents? I could have died. Dared till I was bug-eyed trying to read the serial number. And Buster, you're going to be proud of me. Huh. The number was C1240653. What? You remember the whole number? Yeah. I got a mind for numbers. Never forget a phone number or an address. What are you looking at? Hmm? Oh, this is the list of serial numbers. Uh, uh, say that number again, doll. C1240653. That's, that's it. One of the bills from the Pikesville holdup. Get it. Yeah, but if the hotel got it, they may check. Now, they don't have it. All of a sudden, Thompson grabbed the bill back and said, we don't have to pay for breakfast. That's part of the prize. We're rolling. Quiet, quiet, please. So Mr. T thinks he can play rough with me, eh? One hundred grand. So now, will you call the quiet cops? Well, not so fast, honey. You said you'd let me handle this. Quiet, to figure rolling. out Help something. Me, Shut up before I have you thrown out. Which is how they sometimes treat us flax in Hollywood. And us the backbone of the industry. Yeah, well, that's pictures. But I let it ride this time since it got me out of a tight squeeze with Vera. You see, this is how I had it figured. I'd put it up to Thompson what I knew. Then if he didn't cut me in for a healthy slice of 100 G's, there was always the cops. 
from whom there was undoubtedly a big reward. That way I could play for the big money and still hedge my bet. But I, I put it this way to Vera. I said, look, look, dream girl, you'll be ready to leave, that's all. Uh, what time does the plane take off, did you say? Why, uh, 11.40. We ought to leave here by 11. And what happens to Thompson, Buster? Well, I'll, I'll get everything set for a quiet pinch just after we leave. It, it'll, it'll louse up the stunt, doll, if it gets out that the Bureau picked the hood for this world. I, I gotta protect my client, you understand? Oh, sure, Buster. I understand. So Vera was set up to take Mr. Thompson's place if it was no deal with him. If it was a deal, then Thompson would fly off to Brazil, leaving me unexpectedly wealthy. I was sure Vera was a sensible type doll, not adverse to knowing a Joe who was in the chips. Well, along about 9.30, I went knocking at Thompson's door. Come in. Well, sir, another day of California sunshine. Oh, you got it. You, uh, you said we'd have another talk. Oh, talk's cheap. All right, I'll level with you. I know your name isn't Thompson. I know why you didn't like being picked for this stunt. I know what's in that briefcase, and I know why you want to fly the coop. Huh? You uh, spoke yesterday about a deal. Yeah. How much? Fifty. Fifty dollars? Don't play footsie with me, Thompson. Fifty grand. Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand dollars? Hot money like that, I'll have to trade off at a discount. But you'll be in Brazil getting your money's worth. <laughs> dollar for dollar. <laughs> Just take your briefcase, Mr. T, and just, unzip... Just what do you think I have in this briefcase? I don't think. I know. Look, I'll tell you who I am and why. All about it. Time's a waste, Mr. Thompson. Ten minutes... Call the cops. My name's Kirkwood. I came on the Chicago plane, not the one from Houston. Ah, Vera was on the Chicago plane. She never saw you. I came to Los Angeles to kill myself, Mr. Zant. To kill myself in such a way that I could never be identified. I'm going blind. I'll be totally blind six months from now. Oh, come now, really. What are you giving me, Thompson? Five years. For five years, I went to eye specialists. New York, Philadelphia, Canada. Spent every cent I had trying to find a cure. Look, I got no time to brandish words with you. Then I heard of this one doctor, a Viennese refugee, lives in Rio. He's cured cases like mine, but my money was gone. Look, I'm going to fall. Oh, no, why don't you believe me? I have a daughter, Mr. Zant. All I can leave her is my insurance. I, I thought if I disappeared, if it could never be proved, I killed myself... That's why I didn't want to be recognized. That's why I grabbed for this wonderful chance, this free trip to Brazil. And the briefcase, Mr. T., what's in the briefcase? Dynamite. What? Dynamite? <laughs> I bet it's dynamite. You're some joker, Thompson. Were you going to kill yourself with dynamite? So I couldn't be identified, yes. Oh, oh, oh. Let me see the dynamite, Mr. T., the crisp green dynamite. Don't touch that briefcase, Anthony. Buster. Hey, Buster, I've been turning the place inside out to find you. Uh, Vera, uh, uh, leave us be. But I just remembered. It's daylight saving time here on the coast. That plane leaves an hour earlier. <gasps> Buster, watch out! <laughs> When I came to, there was Roman candles going off in my head, and Vera was tied to a chair with a towel stuffed in her mouth. I had the airplane ticket was going out of my wallet, of course, but I saw by my watch there was still time. Ten minutes later, we was in my car, Vera and me, and halfway to the airport. I took a shortcut up through the hills and kept the gas pedal flat on the floor. It was a while before Vera said anything. Buster, this will really blow up your stunt if you have Thompson pinched at the airport. No two-bit hood's going to push me around. Well, let's see if we can figure some way to, to get me on the plane quiet and... Then after I've left, I'll move the email, Tom. Forget it. Forget the stunt, doll. Now I'm out for blood. What time does that plane leave? I, I forgot. 11.40 daylight saving, 10.40 standard. Ah, that Thompson. Claimed he came in on the other plane, not the one from Houston. No kidding. I said right off. You were an owner if he was on the same plane as you. That's right, Buster. And then when I ask about the briefcase, he says it's dynamite. After you saw that $500 bill with a serial number. That's right, Buster. <laughs> Thompson didn't know the combination he was up against. Me and a sharp doll like you. That's right, Buster. You spotting that headline right off. And remembering that serial number, 100%, that's... Yeah, it's funny, though. What's funny? Well, but that you couldn't remember your room number or the, the time the plane leaves. You, if you got the memory you say you have. That's right, Buster. Hey, it's you. It isn't, Thompson. You're the Texas hoodlum. This gun's loaded, Buster. Turn off at the next side road. You came on the Houston plane. You played me for a sucker. I played you for what you are. Step on it. Every last lead I got on Thompson, I got from you. If I ever trust another doll... You won't live to worry about it, Buster. Turn. Turn right here. Well, I'm kind of ticklish, so with Vera's gun nudging my ribs, I turn. It's an old car, pre-war. It sounded like it was splitting at the seams. 
She jabbed my ribs again, and I pushed the gas down and gave her everything she'd taken and... End of the road, doll. It's the cop. I don't see any cop. Oh, oh. But you see, I got the gun, doll. You see that, don't you? <laughs> oh, Josephine here. She has a lovely habit. You give her too much gas, she resents it. She backfires. Bang, bang, bang. Which is tough on a doll's nerves if she's, she's as jumpy as you are. Foster, look. You, you couldn't make a deal, could you? Say, 50 grand? Say, that wouldn't be ethical. Which was the truth, but not quite the whole truth. It was worth kissing 50 grand goodbye to turn Vera in after she conned me the way I did, because one thing I can't stand, being taken over the hurdles by a doll. So that, that wound up the stunt. Hmm? Thompson? Oh, he took off, okay. And the doctor in Rio handled his case. <laughs> his eyes are 100% now, without cheaters. Me? Well... This 4th of July, I have nothing on the docket. But have I dreamed up one whale of a stunt for Thanksgiving? Let's see what you think. The moviegoer who arrives at Grauman's Chinese exactly at midnight gets a free Mandarin's uniform, all the chopped suey he can eat. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Jack Carson. Say, Wilcox, have you made the Autolite team? Well, you might say I'm a pitcher, Hap. I make the pitch for more than 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, voltage regulators, wire and cable starting motors, electric windshield wipers. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, if your Autolite-equipped car needs replacement parts, ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our stars will be Kathy and Elliot Lewis. The play is called Love, Honor, and Murder. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman Mac. Music for Suspense is composed by Rene Garagank and Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The One Millionth Joe is an original play written for radio by Sylvia Richards. Jack Carson may currently be seen in the Columbia picture The Good Humor Man. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Kathy and Elliot Lewis. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor or standard spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. The American economic system has brought greater material benefits to more people than any other system the world has ever known. Because we have been able to produce more per man and per machine, we have been able to live better and enjoy our individual freedom. Learn more about your part in the American way of life. Write to Suspense, Box 10, Times Square Station, New York City, for the free booklet, The Miracle of America. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.